The Pearl, printed for the Society of Vice. An apology for our title. Having decided to bring out a journal, the editor racks his brains for a suitable name with which to christen his periodical. Friends are generally useless in an emergency of this kind. They suggest all kinds of impossible names. The following were some of the titles proposed. In this instance, facts and fancies. The Cremorne. The All Round. The Monthly Courses. The Devil's Own, and Dugdale's Ghost the two first had certainly great attractions to our mind. But at last our own ideas have hit upon the modest little pearl, as more suitable, especially in the hope that when it comes under the snouts of the moral and hypocritical swine of the world, they may not trample it underfoot and feel disposed to rend the publisher, but that a few will become subscribers on the quiet. To such better disposed piggy-wiggies, I would say, for encouragement, that they have only to keep up appearances by regularly attending church, giving to charities, and always appearing deeply interested in moral philanthropy, to ensure a respectable and highly moral character, and that if they only are clever enough never to be found out, they may, sub rosa, study and enjoy the philosophy of life till the end of their days, and earn a glorious and saintly epitaph on their tombstone, when at last the devil pegs them out. Editor of the Pearl The merry month of May has always been famous for its propitious influence over the voluptuous senses of the fairer sex. I will tell you two or three little incidents which occurred to me in May, 1878, when I went to visit my cousins in Sussex, or as I familiarly call them, the Shen Noodles, for the sport they afforded me at various times. My uncle's is a nice country residence standing in large grounds of its own and surrounded by small fields of arable and pasture land, interspersed by numerous interesting copses, through which run footpaths and shady walks, where you are not likely to meet anyone in a month. I shall not trouble my readers with the name of the locality, or they may go pleasure hunting for themselves. Well, to go on... These cousins consisted of Annie, Sophie, and Polly, beside their brother Frank, who at nineteen was the eldest, the girls being, respectively, eighteen, sixteen, and fifteen. After dinner, the first day of my arrival, Paterfamilias and Mamma both indulged in a snooze in their armchair. Whilst us boys and girls, I was the same age as Frank took a stroll in the grounds. I attached myself more particularly to Cousin Annie, a finely developed blonde with deep blue eyes, pouting red lips, and a full heaving bosom, which to me looked like a perfect volcano of smothered desires. Frank was a very indolent fellow, who loved to smoke his cigar, and expected his sisters, who adored him, to sit by his side, reading some of the novels of the day, or tell him their love secrets, see? This was by far too tame an amusement for me, and as I had not been there for nearly three years, I requested Annie to show me the fell improvements in the grounds before we went into tea, saying to Frank, banteringly, I suppose, old fellow, you're too lazy and would prefer your sister taking me round? I'm too comfortable lazy is an ugly word, Walter, but the fact is Self is just reading a most interesting book, and I can't leave it. He replied, besides, Sissy is quite as well, or better qualified than I am to show off the grounds. I never notice anything. Come on, Annie, said I, taking her hand. Frank is in love. No. I'm sure he never thinks of a girl, except his sister's, was the reply. We were now out of earshot and a shady walk. So I went on a little more freely. But surely you, cause, are in love, if he is not. I can tell it by your liquid eye and heaving bosom. A scarlet flush shot over her features at my allusion to her finely molded bosom. But it was evidently pleasing, and far from offensive, to judge by her playfully spoken. Oh, Walter, for shame, sir. We were a good distance away by this time, and a convenient seat stood near. So throwing my arms around the blushing girl, I kissed her ruby lips, and drawing her with me, said, Now, Annie, dear, I'm your cousin and old playfellow, 
I couldn't help kissing those beautiful lips, which I might always make free with when we were little boy and girl together. Now you shall confess all before I let you go. But I've nothing to confess, sir. Do you never think of love, Annie? Look me in the face if you can say it's a stranger to your bosom. Putting my hand familiarly around her neck, till my right hand rested on one of the panting globes of her bosom. She turned her face to mine, suffused as it was by a deeper blush than ever, as her dark blue eyes met mine, in a fearless search of my meaning. But instead of speaking in response to this mute appeal, I kissed her rapturously, sucking in the fragrance of her sweet breath till she fairly trembled with emotion. It was just beginning to get dusk. My hands were caressing the white, firm flesh of her beautiful neck, slowly working their way to a ward zone. The heaving bubbies a little lower down at last, I whispered. What a fine, what a lovely bust you have developed since I saw you last. Dear Annie, you won't mind your cousin, will you? When everything used to be so free to each other besides, what harm can there be in it? She seemed on fire. A thrill of emotion seemed to shoot through both of us and for several moments she lay almost motionless in my arms, with one hand resting on my thigh. Priapus was awake and ready for business. But she suddenly aroused herself, saying, We must never stop here. Let us walk round, or they will suspect something. When shall we be alone again, darling? We must arrange that before we go in, I said quickly. It was impossible to keep her on the seat, but as we walked on, she said, Musingly, tomorrow morning, we might go for a stroll before lunch. Frank lies in bed and my sisters are keeping house this week. I shall have to mind the tarts and pies next week. I gave her another hug and a kiss, as I said. How delightful that will be. What a dear, thoughtful girl you are, Annie. Mind, sir, how you behave tomorrow. Not so much kissing, or I shan't take you for a second walk here. We are at the house. Next morning was gloriously warm and fine as soon as breakfast was over. We started for our stroll, being particularly minded by Papa to be back in good time for luncheon. I gradually drew out my beautiful cousin till our conversation got exceedingly warm, the hot blood rushing in waves of crimson over her shamefaced visage. What a rude boy you have grown, Walter. Since you were here last... I can't help blushing at the way you run on, sir, she exclaimed at last. Annie, my darling, I replied, what can be more pleasing than to talk of fun with pretty girls, the beauties of their legs and bosoms, and all about them? How I should love to see your lovely calf at this moment, especially after the glimpses I have already had of a divine ankle, saying which I threw myself under a shady tree, close by a gate in a meadow and drew the half-resisting girl down on the grass at my side, and kissed her passionately as I murmured, Oh, Annie, what is there worth living for like the sweets of love? Her lips met mine in a fiery embrace, but suddenly disengaging herself, her eyes cast down and looking awfully abashed, she stammered out, What is it? What do you mean, Walter? Ah, cause, dear. Can you be so innocent? Feel here the dart of love, all impatient to enter the mossy grotto between your thighs, I whispered, placing her hand upon my prick, which I had suddenly let out of the restraining trousers. How you sigh, grasp it in your hand, dear. Is it possible that you do not understand what it is for? Her face was crimson to the roots of her hair, as her hand grasped my tool, and her eyes seemed to start with terror, at the sudden apparition of Mr. John Thomas, so that taking advantage of her speechless confusion, my own hand, slipping under her clothes, soon had possession of her mount, and in spite of the nervous contraction of her thighs, the forefinger searched out the virgin clitoris. Ah! Oh! Oh! Walter Daunt, what are you about? It's all love, dear. Open your thighs a wee bit, and see what pleasure my finger will make you experience. I again whispered, smothering her with renewed and luscious kisses, thrusting the velvet tip of my tongue between her lips. Oh, oh, you will hurt. She seemed to sigh rather than speak, 
As her legs relaxed a little of their spasmodic contraction, my lips continued glued to hers. Our otherwise disengaged arms clasped each other closely round the waist, her hand holding my affair in a kind of convulsive grasp. Whilst my fingers were busy with Clint and Cunny, the only audible sound resembling a mixture of kisses and sighs, till all in a moment I felt her crack, deluged with a warm, creamy spend, whilst my own juice spurted over her hand and dress in loving sympathy. In a short while we recovered our composure a little, and I then explained to her that the melting ecstasy she had just felt was only a slight foretaste of the joy I could give her, by inserting my member in her cunny. My persuasive eloquence and the warmth of her desires soon overcame all maiden fears and scruples, then for fear of damaging her dress, or getting the green stain of the grass on the knees of my light trousers. I persuaded her to stand up by the gate and allow me to enter behind. She hid her face in her hands on the top rail of the gate. As I slowly raised her dress, what glories were unfolded to view. My prick's stiffness was renewed in an instant at the sight of her delicious buttocks. So beautifully relieved by the white of her pretty drawers as I opened them and exposed the flesh, I could see the lips of her plump, pouting cunny, deliciously feathered, with soft light down, her lovely legs, drawers, stockings, pretty boots, making a tout ensemble, which as I write and describe them, caused Mr. Pripus to swell in my breeches, it was a most delicious sight. I knelt and kissed her bottom. Slit. And everything my tongue could reach, it was all mine. I stood up and prepared to take possession of the seat of love when, alas, a sudden shriek from Annie. Her clothes dropped. All my arrangements were upset in a moment a bull had unexpectedly appeared. On the opposite side of the gate, and frightened of my love by the sudden application of his cold, damp nose to her forehead. It is too much to contemplate that scene, even now. To be continued, in a series of letters to a lady friend. Letter 1. My dear girl, I know I have long promised you an account of the reason of my penchant for the rod, which, in my estimation, is one of the most voluptuous and delicious institutions of private life especially to a supposed highly respectable old maid, like your esteemed friend. Treaties must be carried out, and promises kept, or how can I ever hope for the pleasure of making you taste my little green tickler again? Writing, then, especially a sort of confession of my voluptuous weakness, is a most unpleasant task, as I feel as shamefaced in it. Putting these things on paper as when my grandfather's housekeeper first bared my poor blushing little bottom to his ruthless attack. My only consolation at commencing is the hope that I shall warm to the subject as it progresses, in my endeavor to depict, for your gratification, some of the luscious episodes of my early days. My grandfather, as you well know, was the celebrated Indian general, Sir Eyre Coote, almost as well known for his eightpenny fiasco with the Blue Coat Boys as for his services to the Honorable. E. I. Company. He was a confirmed martinet, and nothing delighted him so much as a good opportunity for the use of the cat. But I cannot tell you anything about that, as that was before my time. My first recollection of Hint is after the aforesaid city scandal, when he had to retire from public life in comparative disgrace. My parents both died when I was just upon twelve years of age, and the old general, who had no other relatives to care for, took entire charge of me, and at his death I was left his sole heiress and mistress of nearly three thousand per annum. He resided in a quiet country house some twenty miles from London, where I spent the first few months of my orphaned life, with only his housekeeper, Mrs. Mansell, and the two servants, Jane and Jemima. R. The old general being away in Holland searching, so I afterwards heard, for original editions respecting thee. Practices of Cornelius Hadrian, a curious work on the flagellation of religious penitence by a father confessor. It was the middle of summer when he returned, and I soon found the liberty I had been enjoying considerably restricted. Orders not to pluck the flowers or the fruit in the garden, and a regular lesson set me every day by the old autocrat himself. At first they were tolerably simple, but gradually increased in difficulty, and now, in after years, 
I can plainly understand his wolf and lamb tactics, by which I must eventually fall under his assumed just displeasure. What gave me considerable pleasure at this time was his decided objection to mourning, or anything at all somber, in my dress. He said my parents had been shown every possible respect by wearing black for months, and I must now be dressed as became a young lady of my good expectations. Although we scarcely ever received company, and then only some old fogey of his military acquaintance, I was provided with a profusion of new and elegant dresses, as well as beautiful shoes, slippers, drawers, and underlinen, all trimmed with finest lacy, not even forgetting some very beautiful garters, a pair of which with gold buckles he would insist upon putting on for me, taking no notice of my blushing confusion, as he pretended to arrange my drawers and skirts afterwards, but merely to remark what a fine figure I should make if they ever had to strip me for punishment. Soon my lessons began to be harder than I could fairly manage. One day he expostulated, Oh, Rosa, Rosa, why don't you try to be a better girl? I don't want to punish you. But grandfather, I replied, how can I learn so much of that horrid French every day? Ensure no one else could do it. Hold your tongue, Miss Pert. I must be a better judge than a little girl like you. But, grandfather dear, you know I do love you, and I do try my best. Well, prove your love and diligence in future, or your posterior must feel a nice little birch. I shall get ready for you, said he sternly. Another week passed, during which I could not help observing an unusual fire sparkle in his eyes whenever I appeared in evening dress at the dinner table. We always dined in quiet state, and he also suggested that I ought to wear a choice little bouquet of fresh flowers in my bosom to set off my complexion. But the climax was approaching. I was not to escape long. He again found fault and gave me what he gravely called one last chance my eyes were filled with tears, and I trembled to look at his stern old face, and knew any remonstrance on my part would be useless. The prospect of punishment made me so nervous, it was with the greatest difficulty I could attend to my lessons, and the second day after, I broke down entirely. Oh! Ah! Uh, oh! It's come to this, has it, Rosie? said the old gentleman. Nothing will do. You must be punished. Ringing the bell for Mrs. Mansell, he told her to have the punishment room and the servants all ready, when he should want them. As he was sorry to say, Miss Rosa was so idle and getting worse and worse with her lessons every day, she must now be taken severely in hand, or she would be spoiled for life. Now, you bad girl, said he, as the housekeeper retired, go to your room and reflect upon what your idleness has brought to you. Full of indignation, confusion, and shame, I rushed to my chamber and bolted the door, determined they should break the door down first before I would submit to such a public exposure. Before the two servants throwing myself on the bed, I gave vent to my tears for at least a couple of hours, expecting every moment the dreadful summons to attend the old man's punishment drill, as he called it. But no one disturbing me, I at last came to the conclusion. It was only a plan of his to frighten me and so I fell into a soothing sleep. A voice at the door awakened me, and I recognized the voice of Jane. As she said, Miss Rosa, Miss Rosa, you will be late for dinner. No dinner for me, Jane. If I'm going to be punished, go away. Leave me alone, whispered I through the keyhole. Oh, Miss Rosie, the general's been in the garden all the afternoon, quite good-tempered perhaps has forgotten it all don't make him angry by not being ready for dinner. Let me in quick. So I cautiously drew the bolt and let her assist me to dress. Cheer up, Miss Rosie. Don't look dull. Go down as if nothing had happened. And most likely all will be forgotten his memory is so short. Especially if you put in your bosom the sweet little nosegay to please him, as you have never done it since he said it would set off your complexion. Thus encouraged, I met my grandfather with a good appetite, and as if the bitterness was past, like Agad before Samuel, little suspecting I should be almost hewed in pieces afterwards.
The dinner passed most pleasantly. For such a formal affair as my grandfather made it, he took several glasses of wine, and in the middle of the dessert seemed to contemplate me with unusual interest at last suddenly seeming to notice the little bouquet of damask and white roses, he said. That's right, Rosa. I see you have carried out my suggestion of a nosegay. At last it quite improves your appearance. But nothing to what my birch will affect on your naughty bottom, which will soon look like one of those fine peaches. And now's the time to do it, said he, ringing the bell. Almost distracted and ready to faint, I rushed for the door, but only in time to fall into the arms of strong Jemima. Now, for punishment drill, march on. Jimmy Mao, with the culprit. Yuve got her safe, Mrs. Mansell and Jane. Come on, said he to them, as they appeared in the background. Resistance was useless. I was soon carried into a spare room. I had never entered it contained very little furniture, except the carpet, and one comfortable easy chair but on the walls hung several bunches of twigs and in one corner stood a thing like a stepladder, but covered with red bays, and fitted with six rings, two halfway up, two at bottom, and two at the top. Tie hair to the horse, and get ready for business, said the general, as he seated himself in the chair, to look on at his ease. Come, Rosa, dear, don't be troublesome, and make your grandfather more angry, said Mrs. Mansell, unfastening my waistband. Slip off your dress, whilst the girls put the horse in the middle of the room. Oh, no, no, I won't be whipped, I screamed. Oh, Lit sir, oh, grandfather, do have mercy, said I, throwing myself on my knees before the old man. Come, come, it's no use showing the white feather, Rosa. It's for your own good. No more nonsense. Mrs. Manzel. Do your duty, and let us get the painful business over she isn't one of my stock if she doesn't show her pluck when it comes to the pinch. The three women all tried to lift me, but I kicked, scratched, and bit all round, and for a moment or two almost beat them off in my fury. But my strength was soon exhausted, and Jemima, smarting from a severe bite, carried me in vengeful triumph to the dreaded machine. Quick as thought, my hands and feet were secured to the upper and lower rings, the horse widening towards the ground, caused my legs to be well apart when drawn up closely to the rings at my ankles. I could hear Sir Eyre chuckle with delight as he exclaimed, By God, she's a vixen, and it must be taken out of her. She's a coot all over. Bravo, Rosie. Now get her ready quickly. I submitted in sullen despair whilst my torn dress and underskirts were turned up and pinned round my shoulders. But when they began to unloose my drawers, my rage burst out afresh, and turning my head, I saw the old man, his stern face beaming with pleased animation, whisking in his right hand a small bunch of fresh burshen twigs. My blood was in a boil, and my bottom tingled with anticipated strokes, especially when Jemima, pulling the drawers nearly down to my knees, gave me a smart little slap on the sly, to let me know what I might soon expect. And I fairly shouted, You must be a cruel old beast to let them treat me so. Old beast, indeed, said he, jumping up in a passion. Well, see about that. Miss, perhaps you will be glad to apologize before long. I saw him stepping forward. Oh, mercy. Mercy. Sir. I didn't mean it, they've hurt me, so I couldn't help what I said. This is a really serious case, said he, apparently addressing the others. She's idle, violently vicious, and even insulting to me, her only natural guardian. Instead of treating me with proper respect, there can be no alternative, the only remedy. However painful the scene may be to us who have to inflict the punishment, is to carry it out as a matter of duty or the girl will be ruined. She has never been under proper control all her life. Ah, oh, grandfather, punish me any way but this. I know I can't bear it, it's so dreadfully cruel. I sobbed out through my tears. My child, such crocodile tears have no effect on me, you must be made to feel the smart. 
If we let you off now, you would be laughing at it all, and go on worse than before. Stand aside, Jane. We can't waste any more time. So saying, he made a flourish with the rod, so as to make quite an audible whisk in the air. I suppose it was only to clear the way, as it did not touch me, in fact, up to this time. He had treated me like a cat which knows the poor mousy cannot escape, but may be pounced upon at any time. I could see the tears in Jane's eyes. But Jemima had a malicious smile on her face and Mrs. Mansell looked very grave. But no time was allowed for reflections the next instant I felt a smart but not heavy stroke right across my loins. Then another, and another, in rather quick succession, but not too fast for me to think that perhaps, after all, it would not be so dreadful as I feared, so setting my teeth firmly without uttering a word, I determined to give as little indication as possible of my feelings. All this and a great deal more flashed through my brain before six strokes had been administered. My bottom tingled all over, and the blood seemed to rush like lightning through my veins at every blow. And my face felt as my poor posteriors. Now, you idle puss, said the general, you begin to feel the fruits of your conduct. Will you, will you call me an old beast again? Giving a harder stroke at each of my courage still sustained my resolution not to cry out, but only seemed to make him more angry. Sulky, tempered, and obstinate by Jove. He continued, we must draw it out of you. Don't think, miss, him to be beaten by a little wench like you take that. And that, and that. Whisking me with still greater energy. Concluding with a tremendous whack which drew up the skin to bursting tension. And I felt another like it would make the blood spurt forth. But he suddenly paused in his fury, as if for one of breath. But as I now know too well, only to prolong his own exquisite pleasure. Thinking all was over, I entreated them to let me go. But to my sorrow, soon found my mistake. Not yet, not yet, you bad girl. You're not half punished for all your biting, scratching, and impudence, exclaimed Sir Eyre. Again the hateful birch hissed through the air and cut into my bruised flesh both buttocks and thighs, suffering and smarting in agony. But he seemed careful at first not to draw the blood, however. I was not to escape. It was only his deliberate plan of attack, so as not to exhaust the poor victim too soon. Bite and scratch and fight against my orders again, will you? Miss Rosie, you'll know next time what to expect. You deserve no mercy. The idleness was bad enough. But such murderous conduct is awful, I believe you would have killed anyone in your passion if you could. Bite, scratch, and fight, eh? Bite, will you? Thus lectured the old man, getting warmer and warmer in his attack, till the blood fairly trickled down my poor thighs. I was in dreadful agony at every cut, and must have fainted. But his lecturing seemed to sustain me like a cordial besides, with the pain I experienced, eh? most pleasurable warmth and excitability impossible to be described, but which doubtless you, my dear, have felt for yourself when under my discipline. But all my fortitude could not much longer suppress my sighs and moans, and at last I felt as if I must die under the torture, in spite of the exquisite sensation which mingled with it notwithstanding my ohs and ahs and stifled cries. I would not ask for mercy again, my sole thoughts ran upon the desire for vengeance, and how I should like to whip and cut them all in pieces, especially the general and Jemima, and even poor tearful Jane. Sir Eyre seemed to forget his age, and worked away in frightful excitement. Damn it! Won't you cry for mercy? Won't you apologize, you young hussy? He hissed between his teeth. She's tougher and more obstinate than any of the family. A real chip of the old block. But to be beaten by the young spitfire, Mrs. Mansell, is more than I can bear. There, 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 cried he, and at last the worn-out stump of the rod fell from his hand as he sank back quite exhausted in his chair. Mrs. Mansell, he gasped. Give her half a dozen good stripes with a new rod to finish her off, and let her know that although she may exhaust an old man, there are other strong arms that can dispense justice to her impudent rump. The housekeeper, 
in obedience to the command, takes up a fine, fresh birch and cuts deliberately, counting in clear voice. One, two, three, four, five, six. Her blows were heavy, but did not seem to sting so cruelly as those given by Sir Eyre. There, she says, Miss Rosa, I might have laid it on more heavily, but I pitied you this first time, nearly dead and frightfully cut up. Although victorious, I had to be carried to my room. But what a victory! All torn and bleeding as I was, besides the certainty that the old general would renew his attack the first favorable opportunity. Poor Jane laughed and cried over my lacerated posteriors, as she tenderly washed me with cold arnica and water, and she seemed so used to the business that when we retired to rest for I got her to sleep with me. I asked her if she had not often attended Bruise Bottoms before. Yes, Miss Rosie, she replied. But you must keep the secret and not pretend to know anything. I have been whipped myself, but not so bad as you were, although it's cruel. We all rather like it after the first time or two, especially if we are not cut up too much. Next time you should shout out well for mercy. See, as it pleases the old man, and he won't be so furious. He was so bad and exhausted with whipping you. Mrs. Mansell was going to send for the doctor. But Jemima said a good birching would do him more good and draw the blood away from his head. So they pickled him finely, till he quite came to himself and begged hard to be let off. Thus ended my first lesson. And in further letters, you shall hear how I got on with Jane. Continued the contest with the general. My adventures at Mrs. Flabum's school, and my own domestic discipline since left to myself. Believe me, dear Nelly, your affectionate friend Rosa Belinda Cuda, to be continued, giving an account of her luxurious adventures, both before and after her marriage with Lord Crimcon. Introduction to the reader. Very little apology will be needed for putting in print the following highly erotic and racy narrative of a young patrician lady whose adventures I feel assured every genuine lover of voluptuous reading will derive as much or more pleasure afforded your humble servant. The subject of these memoirs was one of the brightest and most charming of her sex, endued with such exquisite nervous sensitiveness, in addition to an unusual warmth of constitution that she was quite unable to resist the seductive influences of God's finest creation, for God made man in his own image. Male and female created he them, and this was the first commandment, be faithful and multiply, and replenish the earth sea, Genesis, chapter 1. The The natural instinct of the ancients instilled in their minds, the idea that copulation was the direct and most acceptable form of worship they could offer to their deities. And I know that those of my readers who are not bigoted Christians will agree with me that there cannot be any great sin in it. Giving way to natural desires, and enjoying, to the utmost, all those delicious sensations for which a beneficent creator has so amply fitted us. Poor girl, she did not live long, and in thoroughly enjoying her few brief years of butterfly life, who can think her wicked? The scraps from which my narrative is compiled were found in a packet she had entrusted to a devoted servitor, who after her sudden and premature death at the early age of twenty-three, entered my service. As author, I feel the crudeness of my style may be a little offensive to some, but help my desire to afford general pleasure will excuse my defect. The author, heart random, my dear Walter, how I love you, but alas, you will never know it till I am gone, little do you think, as you wheel me about in my invalid chair, how your delicate attentions have won the heart of a poor consumptive on the verge of the grave. How I long to suck the sweets of love from your lips to fondle and caress your lordly priapus, and feel its thrilling motions within me. But such joys cannot be. The least excitement would be my death, and I can but sigh as I look at your kind, loving face, and admire the fine proportions of my darling as evidenced by the large bunch of keys you always seem to have in your pocket, 
Indeed, you look to have a key of keys, whose burning thrusts would unlock any virgin cabinet. This is a strange fancy of mine, the riding for your perusal. A short account of some of my adventures. But one of the only pleasures left me is to indulge in reveries of the past, and seem to feel over again the thrilling emotions of voluptuous enjoyments, which are now denied to me, and I hope the recital of my escapades and follies may afford you some slight pleasure, and add to the lasting regard with which I hope you will remember me in years to come. One thing I ask of you, dear Walter, is to fancy you are enjoying Beatrice Pokingham when you are in the embraces of some future enamorata. It is a pleasure I have often indulged in myself when in the action of coition, and heightened my bliss by letting my fancy run riot and imagined I was in the arms of someone I particularly wished for, but could not come at. My income dies with me, so I have no cause to make a will, but you will find notes for a few hundred pounds, enclosed with this outline of my adventures, which is all I have been able to say. You will also find a fine lock of dark brown hair, which I have cut from the abundant chevelure of my Mons Veneris. Other friends and relatives may have the admired curls from my head. Your memento is cut from the sacred spot of love. I never remember my father, the Marquis of Pokingham, but have my doubts as to whether I am really entitled to the honor of claiming him as a parent, as he was a used-up old man. And from papers and letters which passed privately between him and my mother, I know that he more than suspected he was indebted to his good-looking footman for the pretty baby girl. My mother presented to him, as he says in one note, that he could have forgiven everything if the fruits of her intercourse with James had been a son and heir, so as to keep his hated nephew out of the estates and title, and wished her to let him cultivate her parsley bed for another crop, which might perhaps turn out more in accordance with his wishes. The poor old fellow died soon after writing that note, and my mother, from whom this dreadful consumption is transmitted to me, also left me an orphan at an early age leaving me her jointure of twenty thousand, and an aristocratic title, which that amount was quite inadequate to properly support. My guardians were very saving and careful, as they sent me to school at eight years of age, and only spent about one hundred and fifty a year for schooling and necessary, till they thought it was time for me to be brought out in the world, so that I benefited considerably by the accumulated interest of my money. The first four years of my school passed away uneventfully, and during that time I was only in one serious scrape, which I will relate, as it led to my first taste of a good birch rod. Miss Birch was rather an indulgent schoolmistress, and only had to resort to personal punishment for very serious offenses, which she considered might materially affect the future character of her pupils, unless thoroughly cut out of them from the first. I was nearly seven years old when I had a sudden fancy for making sketches on my slate in school. One of our governesses, Miss Pennington, was a rather crabbed and severe old girl of five and thirty, and particularly evoked my abilities as a caricaturist, and the sketches would be slyly passed from one to the other of us, causing considerable giggling and gross inattention to our lessons. I was infatuated and conceited with what I considered my clever drawings, and several admonitions and extra tasks, as punishment had no effect in checking my mischievous interruptions. Until one afternoon Miss Birch had fallen asleep at her desk, and old Penn was busy with a class, when the sudden inspiration seized me to make a couple of kai. Very rude sketches. One of the old girls sitting on a chamber utensil, but the other was a rural idea of her stooping down, with her clothes up to ease herself, in a field. The first girl I showed them to almost burst with laughter, and two others were so anxious to see the cause of her mirth that they were actually stooping over her shoulder to look at my slate, when before I could possibly get to it to rub them off, old Penn pounced upon it like an eagle and carried it in triumph to Miss Birch, who was awake and chagrined by the amused smile which our principal could not repress at first sight of the indecent caricatures. My young lady must smart for this, Miss Pennington, said Miss Birch. With suddenly assumed gravity, she has been very troublesome lately with these impudent drawings. But this is positively obscene. If she draws one thing, she will go to another. 
Then for Susan to bring my birch rod. I must punish her whilst my blood is warm, as I am too forgiving, and may let her off. I threw myself on my knees and implored for mercy, promising never, never to do anything of the kind again. Miss Birch, you should have thought of the consequences before you drew such filthy pictures the very idea of one of my young ladies being capable of. Such productions is horrible to me. These prurient ideas cannot be allowed to settle in your mind for an instant, if I can whip them out. Miss Pennington, with a grim look of satisfaction, now took me by the wrist, just as Susan, a stout, strom, strom, fair servant girl of about twenty, appeared with look to me, a fearful big bunch of birch twigs, neatly tied up with red velvet ribbon. Now, Lady Beatrice Pokingham, said Miss Birch, kneel down, confess your fault and kiss the rod. Taking the bunch from Susan's hands and extending it to me as a queen might her scepter to a supplicant subject, anxious to get over the inevitable and make my punishment as light as possible, I knelt down and with real tears of penitence begged her to be as lenient as her sense of justice would admit, as I knew I well deserved what she was going to inflict and would take care not to insult Miss Pennington again, whom I was very sorry to have so caricatured. Then I kissed the rod and resigned myself to my fate. Miss Pennington, maliciously. Ah, Miss Birch, how quickly the sight of the rod makes hypocritical repentance. Miss Birch, I quite understand all that, Miss Pennington, but must temper justice with mercy at the proper time now. You impudent artist, Lift your clothes behind and expose your own bottom to the justly merited punishment. With trembling hands I lifted my skirts, and was then ordered to open my drawers also, which done, they pinned up my dress and petticoats. As high as my shoulders then I was laid across a desk, and Susan stood in front of me, holding both hands, whilst old pen and the French governess who had just entered the schoolroom each held one of my legs, so that I was what you might call helplessly spread eagle. Miss Birch, looking seriously round as she flourished the rod. Now, all you young ladies, let this whipping be a caution to you, my lady. Beatrice richly deserves this degrading shame. For her indecent, I ought to call them obscure sketches. Will you? Will you? You troublesome, impudent little thing, ever do so again. There, there, there. I hope it will soon do you good. Ugh. You may scream there's a few more to come yet. The bunch of birch seemed to crash on my bare bottom with awful force. The tender skin smarted and seemed ready to burst at every fresh cut. Ah. Ah. Oh. Oh, heavens. Have mercy, madame. Oh. I will never do anything like it again. Are I can't bear it. I screamed, kicking and struggling under every blow, so that at first they could scarcely hold me, but I was soon exhausted by my own efforts. Miss Birch, you can feel it a little. May it do you good, you bad little girl, if I don't check you now. The whole establishment would soon be demoralized. <laughs> ha! That your bottom is getting finely wheeled, but I haven't done yet cutting away with increasing fury. Just then and I caught a glimpse of her face, which was usually pale, but now flushed with excitement, and her eyes sparkled with unwanted animation. <sighs> ah, she continued, young ladies beware of my rod when I do have to use it. How do you like it, Lady Beatrice? Let us all know how nice it is, cutting my bottom and thighs deliberately at each Lady Beatrice, ah, oh, Ari, it's awful. Oh, oh, I shall die. If you don't have mercy, Miss Birch. Oh, my God, I'm fearfully punished and cut to pieces. The Birch feels as if it was red hot. The blows burn so. Then I felt as if it was all over. And I must die soon. My cries were succeeded by low sobs, moans, and then hysterical crying, which gradually got lower and lower, till at last I must have fainted, as I remembered nothing more till I found myself in bed.
and awoke with my poor posteriors tremendously bruised and sore, and it was nearly a fortnight before I got rid of all the marks of that severe whipping. After I was twelve years of age, they reckoned me amongst the big girls, and I got a jolly bedfellow, whom I will call Alice Marchmont, a beautiful fair girl with a plump figure, large sensuous eyes, and flesh as firm and smooth as ivory. She seemed to take a great fancy to me, and the second night I slept with her we had a small room to ourselves. She kissed and hugged me so lovingly that I felt slightly confused at first, as she took such liberties with me. My heart was all in a flutter, and although the light was out, I felt my face covered with burning blushes as her hot kisses on my lips, and the searching gropings of her hands in the most private parts of my person made me all a-tremble. How you shake, dear Beatrice, she answered. What are you afraid of? You may feel me all over, too. It is so nice. Put your tongue in my mouth. It is a great inducement to love, and I do want to love you so, dear. Where's your hand? Here. Put it there. Can't you feel the hair just beginning to grow on my pussy? Yours will come soon. Rub your finger on my crack. Just there. So she initiated me into the art of frigging in the most tender, loving manner. As you may guess, I was an apt pupil, although so young. Her touches fired my blood, and the way she sucked my tongue seemed most delicious. Nav. Um. Rub harder, harder, quicker. She gasped as she stiffened her limbs out with a kind of spasmodic shudder and I felt my finger all wet with something warm and creamy. She covered me with kisses for a moment, and then lay quite still. What is it, Alice? How funny you are! And you have wetted my finger, you nasty girl! I whispered, laughing. Go on tickling me with your fingers. I begin rather to like it. So you will, dear, soon. And love me for teaching you such a nice game, she replied, renewing her frigging operations which gave me great pleasure so that I hardly knew what I was doing, and a most luscious longing sensation came over me. I begged her to shove her fingers right up. Oh. Oh. How nice. Further. Harder. And almost fainted with delight, as she at last brought down my first maiden spend. Next night, we repeated our lascivious amusements, and she produced a thing like a sausage, made of soft kid leather, and stuffed out as hard as possible, which she asked me to push into her, and work up and down whilst she frigged me as before, making me lay on the top of her, with my tongue in her mouth. It was delightful. I can't express her raptures. My movements with the instrument seemed to drive her into ecstasies of pleasure. She almost screamed as she clasped my body to hers, exclaiming, Ah! Oh! You dear boy! You kill me with pleasure, as she spent with extraordinary profusion all over my busy hand. As soon as we had recovered our serenity a little, I asked her what she meant by calling me her dear boy. Ah! <sighs> Cole. Beatrice, she replied. I'm so sleepy now, but tomorrow night I will tell you my story and explain how it is that my p is able to take in that thing. Whilst yours cannot at present, it will enlighten you a little more into the philosophy of life. My dear, now give me a kiss, and let us go to sleep tonight. Alice Marchmont's story. You may imagine I was anxious for the next morning to arrive. We were no sooner in our little sanctum than I exclaimed. Now, Alice, make haste into bed. I'm all impatient to hear your tale. You shall have it dear in my fingers, too, if you will but let me undress comfortably. I can't jump into bed anyhow. I must make the inspection of my little private curls first. What do you think of them, Beatrice? Off with your chemise, I want to compare our pussies, said she, throwing off everything and surveying her beautiful naked figure in the large cheval glass. I was soon beside her, equally denuded of covering. What a delightfully pouting little slit you have, Beatrice! she exclaimed, patting my mons veneris. We shall make a beautiful contrast. Mine is a light blonde, 
and yours will be brunette. See, my little curly parsley bed is already half an inch long. She indulged in no end of exciting tricks, till at last my patience was exhausted, so slipping on my chemise de nuit, I bounced into bed, saying I believed it was all fudge about her having a tale to tell, and that I would not let her love me again, till she had satisfied my curiosity. What bad manners to doubt my word! She cried, following me into bed, taking me by surprise, uncovered my bottom, and inflicted a smart little slapping, as she laughingly continued. There, let that be a lesson to you, not to doubt a young lady's word in future. Now you shall have my tale, although it would really serve you right to make you wait till tomorrow. After a short pause, having settled ourselves lovingly in bed, she began. Once upon a time there was a little girl about ten years old, of the name of Alice. Her parents were rich, and lived in a beautiful house. Surrounded by lovely gardens and a fine park, she had a brother about two years older than herself. But her mama was so fond of her being an only daughter, that she never would allow her little girl out of her sight, unless William, the butler, had charge of her in her rambles about the grounds and park. William was a handsome, good-looking man about thirty, and had been in the family ever since he was a boy. Now Alice, who was very fond of William, often sat on his knee as he was seated under a tree, or on a garden seat, when he would read to her fairy tales from her books. Their intimacy was so great that when they were alone, she would call him Dear Old Willie, and treat him quite as an equal. Alice was quite an inquisitive girl, and would often put Mr. William to the blush by her curious inquiries about natural history affairs, and how animals had little ones. Why the cook was so savage to the poor hens, jumping on their backs and biting their heads with his sharp beak. See, oh, my dear, he would say, I'm not a hen or a cow, how should I know? Don't ask such silly questions, but Miss Alice was not so easily put off. She would reply, Ah, really, you do know, and won't tell me. I insist upon knowing, see. But her efforts to obtain knowledge were quite fruitless. This went on for some time till the little girl was within three or four months of her twelfth birthday, when a circumstance she had never taken any notice of before aroused her curiosity. It was that Mr. William, under pretense of seeing to his duties, was in the habit of secluding himself in his pantry, or closet, from seven to eight o'clock in the morning, for about an hour before breakfast. If Alice ventured to tap at the door, it was fastened inside, and admittance refused the keyhole was so closed, it was useless to try and look through that way. But it occurred to my little girl that perhaps she might be able to get a peep into that place of mystery, if she could only get into a passage which passed behind Mr. William's pantry, and into which she knew it used to open by a half-glass door, now never used, as the passage was closed by a locked door at each end. This passage was lighted from the outside by a small window about four feet from the ground, fastened on the inside simply by a hook, which Alice, who mounted on a high stool, soon found she could open if she broke one of the small diamond panes of glass, which she did, and then waiting till the next morning felt sure she would be able to find out what Willie was always so busy about, and also that she could get in and out of the window unobserved by anyone, as it was quite screened from view by a thick shrubbery, seldom entered by anyone. Up the times next day she told her lady's maid she was going to enjoy the fresh air in the garden before breakfast, and then hurried off to her place of observation, and scrambled through the window regardless of dirt and dust, took off her boots as soon as she alighted in the disused passage, and silently crept up to the glass door, but to her chagrin found the pane so dirty as to be impervious to sight, however. She was so far lucky as to find a fine large keyhole quite clear, and two or three cracks in the woodwork, so that she could see nearly every part of the place, which was full of light from a skylight overhead. Mr. William was not there, but soon made his appearance, bringing a great basket of plate, which had been used the previous day, and for a few minutes was really busy looking in his pantry book, and counting spoons, forks, see, but was soon finished, and began to look at a little book, which he took from a drawer. Just then, Lucy, 
one of the prettiest housemaids, a dark beauty of about eighteen, entered the room without ceremony, saying, Here is some of your plate off the sideboard. Where's your eyes, Mr. William? Not to gather up all as you ought to do. William's eyes seemed to beam with delight as he caught her round the waist, and gave her a luscious kiss on her cheek. Same why I keep them for you, dear. I knew you would bring the plate then showing the book. What do you think of that position, dear? How would you like it so? Although pleased, the girl blushed up to the roots of her hair as she looked at the picture. The book dropped to the floor, and William pulled her onto his knee and tried to put his hand up her clothes. Ah! No! No! She cried in a low voice. You know I can't today, but perhaps I can tomorrow you must be good today, sir. Don't stick up your impudent head like that. There, there's a squeeze for you now, I must be off, she said, putting her hand down into his lap, where it could not be seen what she was after. In a second or two she jumped up, and in spite of his efforts to detain her, escaped from the pantry. William, evidently in a great state of excitement, subsided onto a sofa, muttering, The little witch, what a devil she is, I can't help myself. But she will be all right tomorrow. Alice, who was intently observing everything, was shocked and surprised to see his trousers all unbuttoned in front, and a great long fleshy-looking thing sticking out, seemingly hard and stiff, with a ruby-colored head. Mr. William took hold of it with one hand, apparently for the purpose of placing it in his breeches, but he seemed to hesitate, and closing his right hand upon the shaft, rubbed it up and down. Ah! What a fool I am to let her excite me so. Oh, oh, I can't help it, I must. He seemed to sigh as his hand increased its rapid motion. His face flushed, and his eyes seemed ready to start from his head, and in a few moments something spurted from his instrument, the drops falling over his hands and legs, some even a yard or two over the floor. This seemed to finish his ecstasy. He sank back quite listless for a few minutes, and then rousing himself, wiped his hands on a towel, cleared up every drop of the mess, and left the pantry. Alice was all over in a burning heat from what she had seen, but instinctively felt that the mystery was only half unraveled, and promised herself to be there and see what William and Lucy would do next day. Mr. William took her for a walk as usual, and read to her. Whilst she sat on his knee, and Alice wondered what could have become of that great stiff thing which she had seen in the morning. With the utmost apparent innocence, her hands touched him casually, where she hoped to feel the monster, but only resulted in feeling a rather soft kind of bunch in his pocket. Another morning arrived to find Alice at her post behind the disused glass door, and she soon saw Mr. William bring in his plate, but he put it aside, and seemed all impatient for Lucy's arrival. Ah, he murmurs. I'm as stiff as a rolling pin at the very thought of the saucy darling. But his ideas were cut short by the appearance of Lucy herself, who carefully bolted the door inside. Then, rushing into his arms, she covered him with kisses, exclaiming, in a low voice, Ah! How I have longed for him these three or four days! What a shame women should be stopped in that way from enjoying themselves once a month! How is he this morning? as her hands nervously unbuttoned Mr. William's trousers and grasped his ready truncheon. What a hurry you are in, Lucy, gasped her lover, as she almost stifled him with her kisses. Don't spoil it all by your impatience. I must have my kiss first. With a gentle effort he reclined her backwards on a sofa and raised her clothes till Alice had a full view of a splendid pair of plump white legs. But what riveted her gaze most was the luscious-looking, pouting lips of Lucy's cunny, quite vermilion in color, and slightly gaping open, in a most inviting manner, as her legs were wide apart, Hermann's venerous being covered with a profusion of beautiful curly black hair. The butler was down on his knees in a moment, and glued his lips to her crack, sucking and kissing furiously, to the infinite delight of the girl who sighed and wriggled with pleasure, till at last Mr. William could no longer restrain himself, but getting up upon his knees between Lucy's legs, he brought his shaft to the charge, and to Alice's astonishment, 
fairly ran it right into the gaping crack, till it was all lost in her belly, they laid still for a few moments. Enjoying the conjunction of their persons till Lucy heaved up her bottom, and the butler responded to it by a shove, then they commenced a most exciting struggle. Alice could see the manly shaft as it worked in and out of her sheath, glistening with lubricity, whilst the lips of her cunny seemed to cling to it each time of withdrawal, as if afraid of losing such a delightful sugar stick. But this did not last long. Their movements got more and more furious, till at last both seemed to meet in a spasmodic embrace, as they almost fainted in each other's arms, and Alice could see a profusion of creamy moisture oozing from the crack of Lucy, as they both lay in a kind of lethargy of enjoyment after their battle of love. Mr. William was the first to break the silence, Lucy. Will you look in tomorrow? Dear, you know that old spy, Mary, will be back from her holiday in a day or two, and then we shan't often have a chance. Lucy, ah, you rogue, I mean to have a little more now. I don't care for caught, I must have it, she said, squeezing him with her arms and gluing her lips to his as she threw her beautiful legs right over his buttocks and commenced the engagement once more by rapidly heaving her bottom, in fact, although he was a fine man. The weight of his body seemed as nothing in her amorous excitement. The butler's excuses and pleading of fear in case he was missed. See? were all of no avail, she fairly drove him on. And he was soon as furiously excited as herself. And with a profusion of sighs, expressions of pleasure, endearment, see, they soon died away again, into a state of short, voluptuous oblivion. However, Mr. William was too nervous, and afraid to let her lay long, he withdrew his instrument from her foaming cunny, just as it was all slimy and glistening with the mingled juices of their love. But what a contrast to its former state, as Alice now beheld it much reduced in size, and already drooping its fiery head. Lucy jumped up and let down her clothes, but kneeling on the floor before her lover, she took hold of his limp affair, and gave it a most luscious sucking, to the great delight of Mr. William, whose face flushed again with pleasure. And as soon as Lucy had done with her sucking kiss— Alice saw that his instrument was again stiff and ready for a renewal of their joys. Lucy, laughing in a low tone, There, my boy, it'll leave you like that think of me. Till tomorrow, I couldn't help giving the darling. Could suck after the exquisite pleasure it afforded me. It's like being in heaven for a little while. With a last kiss on the lips as they parted, and Mr. William again locked his door, whilst Alice made good her retreat to prepare herself for breakfast. It was a fine, warm morning in May. And soon after breakfast, Alice, with William for her guardian, set off for a ramble in the park. Her blood was in a boil, and she longed to experience the joys she was sure Lucy had been surfeited with. They sauntered down to the lake, and she asked William to give a her a row in the boat. He unlocked the boathouse and handed her into a nice, broad, comfortable skiff, well furnished with soft seats and cushions. How nice to be here, in the shade, said Alice. Come into the boat. Willie, we will sit in it a little while, and you shall read to me before we have a row. Just as you please, Miss Alice, he replied, with unwanted deference, stepping into the boat and sitting down in the stern sheets. Ah, my head aches a little. Let me recline it in your lap, said Alice, throwing off her hat and stretching herself along on a cushion. Why are you so precise this morning, Willie? You know I don't like to be called Miss. You can keep that for Lucy. Then noticing his confusion, you may blush, sir. I could make you sink into your shoes if you only knew all I have seen between you and Miss Lucy. Alice reclined her head in a languid manner on his lap, looking up and enjoying the confusion she had thrown him into, then designedly resting one hand on the lump which he seemed to have in his pocket, as if to support herself a little. She continued, Do you think, Willie, I shall ever have as fine legs as Lucy? Don't you think I ought soon to have long dresses, sir? In getting quite bashful about showing my calves so much, the butler had hard work to recover his composure. The vivid recollection of the luscious episode with Lucy before breakfasty 
but so fresh in his mind that Alice's allusions to her, and the soft girlish hand resting on his privates, even although he thought her as innocent as a lamb, raised an udder of desire in his feverish blood, which he tried to allay as much as possible. But little by little the unruly member began to swell, till he was sure she must feel it throb under her hand. With an effort he slightly shifted himself, so as to remove her hand lower down onto the thigh. As he answered as gravely as possible, feeling assured, Alice could know nothing, you're making game of me this morning. Don't you wish me to read, Alice? Alice, excitedly, with an unusual flush on her face. You naughty man, you shall tell me what I want to know this time. How do babies come? What is the parsley bed? The nurses and doctors say they come out of. Is it not a curly lot of hair at the bottom of the woman's belly? I know that's what Lucy's got, and I've seen you kiss it, sir. To be continued. Spoke by Miss Bella Delancey, on her retiring from the stage to open a fashionable body house. Written by S. Johnson, L.D., when Cunt first triumphed as the learned suppose. Or failing pricks, immortal dildo rose. From Fox, unnumbered, still erect he drew exhausted cunts, and then demanded new. Damn nature saw him spurn her bounded reign, and panting pricks toiled after him in vain. The laxest folds, the deepest depths he filled, the juiciest drained the toughest hymens drilled, the fair lay gasping with distended limbs, and unremitting cockstands stormed their quims. Then frigging came, instructed from the school, and scorned the aid of indire rubber tool. With restless finger, fired the dormant blood, till clitoris rose, sly, peeping through her hood. Gently was worked this titillating art. It broke no hymen, and scarce stretched the part, yet lured its votaries to a sudden doom, and stamped consumption's flush on beauty's bloom. Sweet gamahoosh found softer ways to fame, it asked not dildo's art, nor frigging's flame. Tongue, not prick, now proves the central hole. And mouth, not cunt, becomes prick's destined goal. It always found a sympathetic friend, and pleased limp pricks, and those who could not spend. No tedious wait, for labored stand, delays. The hot and pouting cunt, which tongue allays. The taste was luscious. Though the smell was strong, the f was easy, and would last so long, till wearied tongues found gamahooching cloy, and pricks, and cunts, grew callous to the joy, then dulled by frigging, by mock pricks enlarged, her noble duties cunt, but ill discharged, her nymphi drooped, her devil's bite grew weak, and twice two pricks might flounder in her creek, till all the edge was taken off the bliss, and Kant's sole occupation was to piss. Forced from her former joys, with scoffed and brunt, she saw a great arsehole, lay the ghost cunt. Exulting buggers hailed the joyful day, and piles and homerids confirmed his sway. But who lusts, future fancies can explore, and mark the whimsies that remain in store? Perhaps it shall be deemed a lover's treat, to suck the flowering quims of mares in heat. Perhaps where beauty held unequaled sway, a cochin fowl shall rival Mabel Gray. Nobles be reigned by the hyena smile, and seals get short engagements from the argyle. Hard is her lot, that here by fortune placed, must watch the wild vicissitudes of taste. Catch every whim, learn every body trick, and chase the newborn bubbles of the prick. Ah, let not censure term our fate. Our choice. The bawd but echoes back the public voice. The brothers' laws, the brothels' patrons give. And those that live to please, must please to live. Then purge these growing follies from your hearts. And turn to female arms, and female arts. Tis yours this night, to bid the rain begin. Of all the good old-fashioned ways to sin. Clean, wholesome girls. With lip tongue, cunt, and hand, shall raise, keep up, put in, take down a stand.
your bottoms shall by lily hands be bled, and birches blossom under every bed. Air dwell. Derry down. When Adam and Eve were first put into Eden, they never once thought of that pleasant thing breeding. Though they had not a rag to cover their front, Adam sported his prick, and Eve sported her cunt. Derry down. Adam's prick was so thick and so long such a teaser. Eve's cunt was so hairy and fat such a breezer. Adam's thing was just formed any maiden to please. And his bollocks hummed down very near to his knees. Derry down. Eve played with his balls and thought it no harm. He fingered her quim and near, felt alarm. He tickled her bubbies, she rubbed up his yard, and yet for a fu- Why they felt no regard. Derry down. But when Mrs. Eve did taste of the fruit, it was then that her eyes first beheld Adam's root. Then he ate an apple, and after he had done it, why then he first found out the value of cunt. Derry down. Then they say they made fig leaves. That's fiddle-dee-dee. -dee. He wanted a quim, and quite ready was she. They gazed on their privates with mutual delight, and she soon found a hole to put Jock out of sight. Derry down. Then, Adam soon laid Mrs. Eve on the grass. He popped in his prick, she heaved up her arse. He wriggled. She wiggled, they both stuck to one tether. And she tickled his balls, till they both came together. Derry down. Duh. Since then, all her children are filled with desire. And the women a stiff-standing prick all require. And no son of Adam will ear take affront. For where is the man that can live without cunt? Derry down. Air. Tau. Derry down. There was a lass they called Bonnie Beth. With a jolly fat arse and a cut black as jet. Her quim had long itched, and she wanted, I vow, a jolly good fu- but couldn't tell how. Derry down. She thought of a plan that might serve as the same, that herself she might shag without any shame. So a carrot she got, with a point rather blunt, and she rammed it and jammed it three parts up her cunt. Derry down. She liked it so well that she oft used to do it, till at length the poor girl had occasion to rue a tea. For one day, when amusing herself with this whim, the carrot it snapped, and part stuck in her quim. Derry down. She went almost mad with vexation at this. Indeed it was time. The poor girl couldn't piss. The lass was in torture. No rest had poor Beth. So at last an old doctor she was forced to get. Derry down. The doctor he came, and she told him the case. Then with spectacles on, and a very long face, he bid her turn up, though she scarcely was able, and pull up her petticoats over her navel. Derry down. Her clouts she held up, round her belly so plump, and he gave her fat arse such a hell of a thump, that he made her cry out, though he did it so neat, and away flew the carrot bang into the street. Nary down. Now a sweep passing by, he saw it come down, picked it up and he ate it, and said with a frown, I God, it's not right, it's a damn shame, I say, that people should throw buttered carrots away. Derry down, a parody on Moore's melody. There is not in this wide world a valley so sweet as that vale where the thighs of a pretty girl meet. Oh, the last ray of feeling and life must depart, ere the bloom of that valley shall fade from my heart. Yet it is not that nature has shed o'er the scene, the purest of red, the most delicate skin. Tis not the sweet smell of the genial hill. Ah, no! It is something more exquisite still. Tis because the last favors of woman are there, which make every part of her body more dear. We feel how the charms of nature improve when we bathe in the spendings of her whom we love. Nature, everywhere the same, imparts to man a lustful flame. In Russian snow or Indian fire, all men alike indulge desire. All alike feel passion's heat. All alike, enjoyment brief, so that wheresoe'er you go, still, the same voluptuous glow, throbs through every purple vein, thirsts enjoyment to obtain, 
Mouse the dark. Or with the fair. Woman is empress everywhere. Pressed in the arms of him I so adored. The keeper of my charms, my pride, my lord. By day experiencing each sweet delight. And meeting endless transports every night. When on our downy bed we fondly lay. Heating each other by our amorous play. Till nature, yielding to the luscious game. Would fierce desire and quenchless lust inflame. Oh, then we joined in love's most warm embrace, and pressed soft kisses on our every grace. Around my form, his pliant limbs entwined. Love's seat of bliss to him I then resigned. We pant, we throb, we both convulsive start. Heavens, then what passions throw our fibers dart? We heave, we wriggle, bite, laugh, tremble, sigh. We taste Elysian bliss, we fondle die. An English and an American vessel of war being in port together, Captain Balls of the former invited the officers of the Yankee frigate to dine and board of his ship, but stipulated, in order to avoid any unpleasantness, that no offensive or personal toasts should be proposed, to which the Americans cheerfully assented. However, after dinner, during dessert, when the conversation happened to turn warmly upon the respective merits of the two nations. A Yankee officer suddenly stood up and said he wished to propose a toast, which he should take as a personal offense if anyone refused to drink it. Captain B mildly expressed a hope that it was nothing offensive, but consented to drink to whatever it might be, with the proviso that, if he thought fit to do so, he should propose another afterward. Then shouted the American, Exultingly here is to the glorious American flag stars to enlighten all nations, and stripes to flog them. Captain B drained a bumper to the American's toast. Then turning to the old ship's steward, standing behind his chair, said quietly, You can beat that, can't you, Jack? Aye. Aye. Sir, if you fill me a stiffen, the captain mixed him a good swig of hot and strong. Then handing the steward the glass, he thundered out silence for Jack's toast, and any gentleman here present. Refusing to drink to it, I shall not take it as a personal offense, but at once order, the gunner's mate to give him three dozen. Now then, Jack. Jack, with a grim smile and bowing to the Yankee officer, said then here's to the ramping, roaring British lion, who pisses on the stars and wipes his arse on the stripes. There was a young man of Bombay, who fashioned a cloud of clay, but the heat of his prick, turned it into a brick, and chafed all his foreskin away. There was a young man of Peru, who had nothing whatever to do, so he took out his carrot, and buggered his parrot, and sent the result to the zoo. There was a young girl of Ostend, who her maiden had tried to defend, but a chasseur de free inserted his prick and taught that eggs made how to spend. There was a young man of Calcutta, who tried to write on a shutter. When he got to Q, a pious Hindu, knocked him arse overhead in the gutter. There was a young man of Ostend, whose wife caught him for a friend. It's no use, my duck, interrupting our f for him damned if I draw till I spend. There was a young man of wood green, who tried to fart God save the queen. When he reached the soprano, he shot his guano, and his breeches went fit to be seen. There was a young man of Dundee, who one night went out on the spree. He wound up his clock with the tip of his cock and buggered himself with the key. There was a young lady of Troy, who invented a new kind of joy. She sugared her thing, both outside and in, and then had it sucked by a boy. There was a young man of Santander who tried hard to bugger a gander, but the virtuous bird plugged his arse for the turd and refused to such low tastes to pander. There was a young lady of Hitchin who was scratching her cut in the kitchen. Her father said Rose, it's the crabs, I suppose. You're right, Pa. The buggers are itching. There was an old person of Sark who buggered a pig in the dark. The swine in surprise, murmured God, blast your eyes. 
Do you take me for Bolton or Parr? Oh, cause a kingdom, and Prick is its lord. A whore is a slave, and her mistress a bog. Her quim is her freehold which brings in her rent. Where you pay when you enter, and leave when you vay spend. Subumbra, or sport among the shenoodles. Continued. Annie was ready to faint as she screamed. Walter! Walter! Save me from the horrid beast. I comforted and reassured her as well as I was able. And seeing that we were on the safe side of the gate, a few loving kisses soon set her all right. We continued our walk, and soon spying out a favorable shady spot. I said, come Annie, dear. Let us sit down and recover from the startling interruption, I'm sure. Dear, you must still feel very agitated. Besides, I must get you now to compensate me for the rude disappointment. She seemed to know that her hour had come the hot blushes swept in crimson waves across her lovely face as she cast down her eyes and permitted me to draw her down by my side on a mossy knoll. And we lay side by side, my lips glued to hers in a most ardent embrace. Annie! Oh. <laughs> Annie! I gasped. Give me the tip of your tongue, love. She tipped me the velvet without the slightest hesitation, drawing at the same time what seemed a deep sigh of delightful anticipation as she yielded to my slightest wish. I had one arm under her head, and with the other, I gently removed her hat and threw aside my own Golgotha, kissing and sucking at her delicious tongue all the while. Then I placed one of her hands on my ready cock, which was in a bursting state, saying, as I released her tongue for a moment, they, Annie, take the dart of love in your hand. She grasped it nervously, as she softly murmured, Oh, Walter, I'm so afraid, and yet, oh, yet, dearest, I feel I die. I must taste the sweets of love, this forbidden fruit, her voice sinking almost to a whisper, as she pressed and passed her hand up and down my shaft. My hand was also busy finding its way under her clothes as I again glued my mouth to hers and sucked at her tongue till I could feel her vibrate all over with the excess of her emotion. My hand, which had taken possession of the seat of bliss, being fairly deluged with her warm, glutinous spendings. My love, my life, I must kiss you there and taste the nectar of love, I exclaimed as I snatched my lips from hers and reversing my position, buried my face between her unresisting thighs. I licked up the luscious spendings with rapturous delight from the lips of her tight lime cunny. Then my tongue found its way further, till it tickled her sensitive clitoris, and put her into a frenzy of mad desire for still further enjoyment. She twisted her legs over my head, squeezing my head between her firm, plump thighs in an ecstasy of delight. Wetting my finger in her luscious crack, I easily inserted it in her beautifully wrinkled brown bumhole, and keeping my tongue busy in titillating the stiff little clitoris. I worked her up into such a furious state of desire that she clutched my cup and brought it to her mouth. As I lay over her to give her the chance of doing so, she rolled her tongue round the purple head, and I could also feel the loving, playful bite of her pearly teeth. It was the acme of erotic enjoyment. She came again, in another luscious flood of spendings, whilst she eagerly sucked every drop of my sperm as it burst from my excited prick. We both nearly fainted from the excess of our emotions, and lay quite exhausted for a few moments, till I felt her dear lips again pressing and sucking my engine of love. The effect was electric, I was as stiff as ever. Now, darling, for the real stroke of love, I exclaimed, shifting my position and parting her quivering thighs so that I could kneel between them. My knees were placed upon her skirts so as to preserve them from the grass stain. She lay before me in a delightful state of anticipation, her beautiful face all blushes of shame and the closed eyelids. Fringed with their long, dark lashes, her lips slightly open, and the finely developed, firm, plump globes of her bosom heaving in a state of tumultuous excitement. It was ravishing. I felt mad with lust, and could no longer put off the actual consummation. 
I could not contain myself. Alas, poor maidenhead. Alas, for your virginity. I brought my cock to the charge, presented the head just slightly between the lips of her vagina. A shudder of delight seemed to pass through her frame at the touch of my weapon, as her eyes opened, and she whispered, with a soft, loving smile, I know it will hurt, but Walter, dear Walter, be both firm and kind. I must have it if it kills me. Throwing her arms around my neck, she drew my lips to hers. As she thrust her tongue into my mouth with all the abandon of love, and shoved up her bottom to meet my charge. I placed one hand under her buttocks, whilst with the other I kept my affairs straight to the mark, then pushing vigorously, the head entered about an inch, till it was chalk up to the opposing hymen. She gave a start of pain, but her eyes gazed into mine with a most encouraging look. Throw your legs over my back, dear, I gasped, scarcely relinquishing her tongue for a moment. Her lovely thighs turned round me, in a spasmodic frenzy of determination, to bear the worst. I gave a ruthless push, just as her bottom heaved up to meet me, and the deed was done. King Priapus had burst through all obstacles to our enjoyment. She gave a subdued shriek of agonized pain, and I felt myself throbbing in possession of her inmost charms. You darling! You love me! My brave Annie! How well you stood the pain! Let us lay still for a moment or two, and then for the joys of love, I exclaimed, as I kissed her face, forehead, eyes, and mouth, in a transport of delight at feeling the victory so soon accomplished. Presently I could feel the tight sheath of her va contracting on my cut in the most delicious manner. This challenge was too much for my impetuous steed. He gave it a gentle thrust. I could see by the spasm of pain which passed over her beautiful face, that it was still painful to her, but restraining my ardor. I worked very gently, although my lust was so maddening that I could not restrain a copious spend, so I sank on her bosom in love's delicious lethargy. It was only for a few moments I could feel her tremble beneath me with voluptuous ardor. And the sheath being now well lubricated, we commenced a delightful bout of ecstatic f All her pain was forgotten. The wounded part, soothed by the flow of my semen, now only reveled in the delightful friction of love she seemed to boil over in spendings. My delighted c reveled in it, as he thrust in and out with all my manly vigor we spent three or four times in a delirium of voluptuousness, till I was fairly vanquished by her impetuosity, and begged her to be moderate, and not to injure herself by excessive enjoyment. Oh! Can it be possible to hurt one's self by such a delightful pleasure? She sighed, then seeing me withdraw my limp tool from her still longing cunt. She smiled archly, as she said with a blush. Pardon my rudeness, dear Walter, but I fear it is you who are most injured after all look at your blood-stained affair. You lovely little simpleton, I said, kissing her rapturously. That's your own virgin blood. Let me wipe you. Darling as I gently applied my handkerchief to her pouting slit, and afterwards to my own caw. This, dearest Annie, I shall treasure up as the proofs of your virgin love, so delightfully surrendered to me this day, exhibiting the ensanguined mouchoir to her gaze. We now arose from our soft, mossy bed, and mutually assisted each other to remove all traces of our love engagement. Then we walked on, and I enlightened the dear girl into all the arts and practices of love. Do you think, I remarked, that your sisters or Frank have any idea of what the joys of love are like? I believe they would enter into it as ardently as I do, if they were but once initiated, she replied. I have often heard Frank say when kissing us, that we made him burn all over, and then blushing deeply as her eyes met mine. Dear Walter, I'm afraid you will think we are awfully rude girls. But when we go to bed at night, myself and sisters often compare our budding charms and crack little jokes about the growing curls of mine and Sophie's slits and the hairless little p of Polly we have such games of slapping. 
and romps too. Sometimes it has often made me feel a kind of a loverishness of feverish excitement I could not understand. But thanks to you, love, I can make it all out now. I wish you could only get a peep at us, dear. Perhaps it might be managed, you know, my room is next to yours. I could hear you laughing and having a game last night. I know we did. We had such fun, she replied. It was Polly trying to put my put in curl papers. But how can you manage it, dear? Seeing she fully entered into my plans for enjoyment, we consulted together. And at last I hit upon an idea which I thought might work very well. It was that I should first sound frank and enlighten him a little into the ways of love. And then, as soon as he was ripe for our purpose, we would surprise the three sisters whilst naked bathing and slap their naked bottoms all round, that Annie should encourage her sisters to help her in tearing off all our clothes. And then we could indulge in a general rump of love. Annie was delighted at the idea, and I promised the very next day to begin with Frank, or perhaps that very afternoon if I got a chance. We returned to the house, Annie's cheeks blushing and carrying the beautiful flush of health, and her mama remarked that our walk had evidently done her very great good, Little guessing that her daughter, like our first mother Eve, had that morning tasted of the forbidden fruit and was greatly enlightened and enlivened thereby. After luncheon I asked Frank to smoke a cigarette in my room, which he had once complied with. As soon as I had closed the door I said, Old fellow, did you ever see Fanny Hill, a beautiful book of love and pleasure? What a smutty book, I suppose you mean. No, Walter. But if you have got it, I should wonderfully like to look at it, he said, his eyes sparkling with animation. Here it is, my boy. Only I hope it won't excite you too much. You can look it over by yourself. As I read the times, said I, taking it out of my dressing case and handing it to his eager grasp. He sat close to me in an easy lounging chair, and I watched him narrowly as he turned over the pages and gloated over the beautiful plates, his prick hardened in his breeches, till it was quite stiff and rampant. Ha! Huh. And, ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Old fellow, I thought it would fetch you out. I said, laying my hand upon his cock. By Jove, Frank! What a tosser yours has grown since we used to play in bed together a long time ago. Ill lock the door. We must compare our parts. I think mine is nearly as big as yours. He made no remark, but I could see he was greatly excited by the book. Having locked the door, I leant over his shoulder and made my remarks upon the plates as he turned them over. At length he book dropped from his hands, and his excited gaze was riveted on my bursting breeches. Why, Walter, you are as bad as I am, he said with a laugh. Let's see which is the biggest pulling out his hard, stiff prick, and then laying his hands on me pulled my affair out to look at. We handled each other in an ecstasy of delight, which ended in our throwing off all our clothes, and having a mutual f between our thighs on the bed we spent in rapture. And after a long dalliance he entered into my plans, and we determined to have a lark with the girls as soon as we could get a chance. Of course I was mum as to what had passed between Annie and myself. To be continued, Miss Coote's Confession, or the Voluptuous Experiences of an Old Maid, in a series of letters to a lady friend. Letter to Tato and My dear Nelly, to continue my tale where I left off, Jane and I had some further conversation next morning, which, to the best of my recollection, was as follows. Rosa Tonchain, you have been whipped, have you? What was it for? Jane, dot all. The first time was for being seen walking with a young man coming from church. The general said I had never been, and only pretended to be religious for the chance of gadding about with young fellows, which must be checked, or I should be ruined. Rosa, well, didn't you feel revengeful at being whipped for that? Jane Donzo. I did, but forgot all about it in the delight I had in seeing Jemima well cut up. Oh, she did just catch it, I can tell you, but she's as strong and hard as leather. Rosa Tazo. I could forget, and forgive too, if I could but cut you all up well. I've got a good mind to begin with you, Jane, when I don't feel quite so sore. Jane. Ah, but I know you hate Jemima, and would rather see her triced up to the horse. 
Perhaps we shall be able to get her into a scrape between us, if we put our heads together. Rosa. Dot. Tau. Oh. Ay, you sly girl. Don't you think ill let you off, much as I long to repay the others? Just wait till I feel well enough, and ill settle you first. There will be plenty of opportunities, as you are to sleep with me in my room every night. I haven't forgotten how you persuaded me to dress for dinner, when you knew, all the time, what was coming. Jane D. Tile. Dear Miss Rosie, I couldn't help it. Mrs. Mansell sent me up to dress you. The old general put it off till after dinner, as he likes to see the culprits dressed as nicely as possible. If he punished any of us, we have to attend punishment drill in our very best clothes. And if they get damaged, Mrs. Mansell soon fits us out again. So we don't lose much by a good birching. I have known Jemima to get into trouble so as to damage her things, but Sir Eyre made her smart well for them. I was very sore for several days, but managed to make and secrete a fine bunch of twigs, ready for Miss Jane when she would little expect it. In fact, she did not know I had been into the garden or out of the house. Of course, she was a much stronger and bigger girl than myself, so I should have to secure her by some stratagem. I let her think I had quite forgotten my threat. But one evening, just as we were both undressed for bed, I said, Jane, did Mrs. Mansell or Jemima ever birch you, without Grandfather knowing it? Yes. Dear Miss Rosie, they've served me out shamefully more than once. Rosa, how did they manage that? Jane, why, I was tied by my hands to the foot of the bedstead. Rosa, oh, do show me, and let me tie you up to see how it all looked. Jane. Very well, if it's any pleasure to you, miss. Rosa, what shall I tie you up with? You're as strong as Samson. Jane, a couple of handkerchiefs will do, and there's a small comforter to tie my legs. By her directions, I soon had her hands tied to the two knobs at the foot of the bed, and her feet stretched out a little behind were secured to the legs of the table. Oh, my, said Jane. You have fixed me tight. What did you tie so hard for? I can't get away till you release me. Stay. Stay. I cried. I must see you quite prepared now you are properly fixed up, and I quickly turned up her nightdress and secured it well above her waist, so as to expose her plump bottom and delicately moss front to my astonished gaze. Oh, what a beauty you are, Jane, said I, kissing her. And you know I love you, but your naughty little bum dee must be punished. It is a painful duty, but ill let you see it's no joke, miss. Look, what a fine swish tail I've got, producing my rod. Mercy! Mercy! cried Jane. Dear Miss Rosie, you won't beat me. I've always been so kind to you. It won't do, Jane. I must do my duty. You were one of the lot against me and the first I can catch. It may be years before I can pay off the others. The sight of her beautiful posteriors filled me with a gloating desire to exercise my skill upon them, and see a little of what I had to feel myself. Nervously grasping my birch, without further delay, I commenced the assault by some sharp strokes, each blow deepening the rosy tints to a deeper red. Ah! Beany! Ah! If what a shame! You're as bad as the old general, you little witch, to take me so by surprise. You don't seem at all sorry, miss, I cried. But he'll try, and bring down your impudence, in fact. I begin to think you are one of the worst of them. And only acted the hypocrite with your pretended compassion when you were, in reality, it all the time. But it's my turn now. Of course, you were too strong for me, unless I had trapped you so nicely. How do you like it, Miss Jane? All this time I kept on. Whisk, 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 in quick succession, till her bottom began to look quite interesting. You little wretch! You vixen! gasped Jane. Your grandfather shall hear of this. That's your game, is it, Miss Telltale? At any rate, you will be well paid first, I replied. The sight of her buttocks only seemed to add to my energy. 
and it was quite a thrill of pleasure when I first saw the blood come. She writhed and wriggled with suppressed sighs and ahs. But each time she gave utterance to any expression, it seemed only for the purpose of irritating me more and more. My excitement became intense. The cruel havoc seemed to be an immense satisfaction to me, and her bottom really was in deplorable state through my inconsiderate fury. At last, quite worn put and fatigued, I could hold the rod no longer, and my passion melted into love and pity. As I saw her in an apparently listless and fainting condition, with drooping head, eyes closed, and hands clenched, the worn-out birch was dropped, and kissing her tenderly, I sobbed out, Jane, dear Jane, I both love and forgive you now, and you will find me as tender to you as you were to me. After my flogging, her hands and feet were soon released, when, to my astonishment, she threw her arms round my neck, as with sparkling eyes, and a luscious kiss, she said softly, And forgive you too, Miss Rosie, for you don't know what pleasure you have given me. The last few moments have been bliss, indeed. This was all a puzzle to me at the time, but I understood it well enough afterwards. She made quite light of her bruised bottom, saying, What was awful to you was nothing to me, Miss Rosie. I am so much older and tougher besides. The first time is always the worst it was too bad of Sir Eyre to cut you up as he did, but your obstinacy made him forget himself you'll grow to like it as I do. This and much more in the same strain passed as we bathed and soothed the irritated parts, and we finally fell asleep with a promise from me to let her give me a pleasant lesson in a day or two. Things went on smoothly for a few days. My punishment had been too severe for me to lightly dare a second engagement. With the general still, I burned for a chance to avenge myself on anyone but Jane, who was now my bosom friend. We discussed all sorts of schemes for getting anyone but ourselves into trouble, but to no purpose. The old gentleman often cautioned me to take care, as the next time he should not fail to make me cry, Picavi. One fine afternoon, however, being in the garden with the housekeeper, I remarked to her, what a pity it was, Grandfather let the nectarines hang and spoil, and no one allowed to taste them. My dear, said Mrs. Mansell, if you take two or three hell, never miss them. Only you must not tell that I said so. It's a shame to let them rot. But, Mrs. Mansell, that would be stealing, I replied. When nothing's lost, nothing can have been stolen. It's only a false sense of honesty. And you— the little mistress of the house, she urged. Well, you are the serpent, and in me you've... I suppose they really do look delicious. And you won't tell, will you? I asked in my simplicity so the fruit was plucked, and Mrs. Mansell helped to eat it, which put me quite at my ease. Just before dinner next day, we were surprised by the general calling us all into his sitting room. How's this, Mrs. Mansell? He said looking fearfully angry. I unleave leave my keys in the lock of that cabinet, without someone tasting my rum. I've long known there was a sly, sipping thief about, so I have been sly, too. Finding it was the rum that was most approved, the last time the decanter was filled I put a little scratch with my diamond ring, to mark the height of the liquor in the bottle, and have only used the brandy for myself. Luck! Whoever it is has got through nearly a pint in three or four days. Come here, Rosa. Now Mrs. Mansell, and now Jemima, said he sternly, smelling the breath of each in turn. Woman, he said as she faltered and hesitated to undergo this ordeal. I don't think you were a sneaking thief. If you really wanted a little spirit, Mrs. Mansell would have let you have it, I dare say as you have been with us some years, and we don't like change, but you shall be cured of thieving. Tomorrow you should have been well thrashed at once, but we have a friend to dinner this evening. It will do you good to wait and think of what's coming. Be off now, and mind the dinner served up properly, or you will catch it in Indian style tomorrow, and be a curried chicken if ever you were. Our visitor was an old fox-hunting colonel, our nearest neighbor, and my spirits were so elated at the prospect of Jemima's punishment that it seemed to me the pleasantest evening I had ever spent in that house. On next day, 
grandfather spent looking over the garden, and a presentiment came over me that the nectarines would be missed if he had been so cunning in one thing. He might be in another. My fears were only too well founded, for catching sight of me with the housekeeper, cutting a nosegay for the criminals where, he said, Mrs. Mansell, you had better make another bouquet whilst you are about it. Someone has been at the nectarines. Do you know anything about it, Rosa? Oh, grandfather, you know I was strictly forbidden to touch the fruit, said I, as innocently as possible. Mrs. Mansell, do you know anything of it, as she want, give a direct answer, said he, eyeing me sternly. I was covered with confusion, and to make it worse, Mrs. Mansell, with affected reluctance to tell of an untruth, confessed the whole affair. Upon my word, a nice honest lot you all are, as I dare say Jane is like the rest Mrs. Mansell. I'm astonished at you, and I think your punishment will be enough, when you consider how seriously I look upon such things. But as to that girl, Rosa, prevarication is worse than a lie. Such cunning in one so young is frightful, but well settled. Jemima first, and then think of what's to be done. Left in this state of uncertainty, I fled to Jane for consolation, who assured me it was a good thing Jemima stood first, as the old man would get exhausted, and perhaps let me off lightly if I screamed and begged for mercy. Thus encouraged, I managed to eat a good dinner, and took an extra glass of wine on the sly I was only supposed to take one. Thus fortified, I marched to the punishment drill with great confidence, especially as I so wished to see Jemima well thrashed. When first I set eyes upon her as she curtsied to the general, who was seated in the chair, rod in hand, her appearance struck me with admiration rather above medium height. Dark auburn hair, fresh color, and sparkling blue eyes, low-cut dark blue silk dress, almost revealing the splendors of her full rounded bosom, the large nose get fixed rather on one side under her dimpled chin. Pink satin high-heeled shoes, with silver buckles she had short sleeves, but fawn-colored gloves of kid, and a delicate net, covering her arms to the elbows, took off all coarseness of her red skin or hands. Prepare her at once, said the general. She knows too well all I would say. Here, Rosie, hand me down that big bunch of birch. This little one is no use for her fat rump. <laughs> ha! This is better said he, whisking it about. Jane and the housekeeper had already stripped off the blue silk and were proceeding to remove the underskirts of white linen. Trimmed with broad lace, the bouquet had fallen to the floor, and presently the submissive victim stood with only chemise and drawers. What a glimpse I had of her splendid white neck and bosom! What deliciously full! And rounded legs with pink silk stockings and handsome garters, for the general was very strict as to the costume of his penitence. I assisted to tie her up, and unfastening her drawers, Jane drew them well down, whilst Mrs. Mansell pinned up her chemise, fully exposing the broad expanse of her glorious buttocks, the brilliant whiteness of her skin showing to perfection by the dazzling glare of the well-lighted room. I gave her two or three smart pats of approval just to let her know. I hadn't forgotten the slap she gave me then drew aside to make way for Sir Eyre. My thoughts were so entirely absorbed by the fascinating spectacle that I lost all remembrance of my own impending turn. Wax! came the big birch, with a force to have made her jump out of her skin, if possible, but only a stifled aha, and a broad red mark were the results the blood mounted to her face, and she seemed to hold her breath for each blow as it came, but the rod was so heavy and the old general so vigorous that in less than a dozen strokes her fair bottom was smeared with blood, and bits of birch were lying in all directions. Ah! Ah! Ow! She screamed. Do have mercy, sir! I can't stand it! Oh! Nanjan me. Oh! Indeed, I can't. You sly thief! Don't think ill let you off before you're dead, if I don't cure you now. I shall lose a good servant, exclaimed Sir Eyre, cutting away. 
My blood boiled with excitement of a most pleasurable kind, young as I was, and cruel as I knew it to be. No pity for the victim entered my breast. It is a sensation only to be experienced by real lovers of the rod. You like rum, do you, miss? said the general. Did you take it raw or mixed? It'll make your bottom raw. The poor old man was obliged now to sit down for want of breath, Mrs. Mansell. Understanding his wishes, at once took his place with a fresh birch, without giving the victim any respite. She must indeed be well punished, sir. I'm sure they're never denied anything so long as they behave themselves, said she, with a stern, relentless face, in fact, after a stroke or two. Her light brown hair was all in disorder from the exertion, and her dashing hazel eyes and well-turned figure made me think her a goddess of vengeance. Will you? Will you do so again, you ungrateful thief? She kept on saying, with a blow to each question. Poor Jimmy Ma moaned, sobbed, and sometimes cried out for mercy, whilst the blood fairly trickled down her thighs. But the housekeeper seemed to hear nothing, and Sir Eyre was in an ecstasy of gloating delight. This could not last long, however strong the victim might be. Becoming exhausted with her accumulated sensations, she at last fairly fainted, and we had to dash cold water. Over her face to recover her, then covered with a cloak, she was led off to her room and left to herself. Now, Rosa, said the general, holding out a light green bunch of fresh birch, kiss the rod and get ready for your turn. Hardly knowing what I was about, I inclined my head and gave the required kiss. Mrs. Mansell and Jane had me prepared in no time. As I was quite passive, and as soon as I was fairly exposed and spread eagled on the horse, the old general rose to his task. You have seen how severe I can be by Jemima's punishment, said he, but perhaps you did not think your answer to me yesterday was any offense, and I am almost inclined to forgive you. But remember in future, if you get off lightly this time, a plain lie is better than prevarication. I think the last flogging must have done you great good. Your conduct is quite different tonight. But now, remember, Nenemba, he cried again, giving sharp, cutting strokes at each word. My poor bottom tingled with agony, and I cried loudly for mercy, promising to be strictly truthful in future. So, after about twenty strokes, he said you may go this time finishing me off with a tremendous remembrance, which made me fairly shake with the concussion, and was the only blow which actually drew the blood, although I had some fine tender wheels. This must finish my second letter. Believe me, my true bum child of the rod, your loving friend, Rosa Belinda Cootie, to be continued. Lay Pokingham, or they all do it, giving an account of her luxurious adventures, both before and after her marriage with Lord Crimcon. Continued. Part. Wayne. Continued. William felt ready to drop the perspiration, stood on his brow, in great drops, but his lips refused to speak. And Alice continued in a soft whisper, I saw it all this morning, Willie dear. And what joy that great red-head thing of yours seemed to give her. You must let me into the secret and I will never tell. This is the monster you shoved into her so furiously. I must look at it and feel it how hard it has got under my touch. La! What a funny thing. I can get it out as Lucy did, pulling open his trousers and letting out the rampant engine of love. She kissed its red velvety head, saying what a sweet, soft thing to touch. Ow! Oh, I must caress it a little. Her touches were like fire to his senses, speechless with rapture and surprise. He silently submitted to the freak of the willful girl. But his novel position was so exciting, he could not restrain himself. But the sperm boiled up from his pee all over her hands and face. Ah! she exclaimed. That's just what I saw it do yesterday morning. Does it do that inside of Lucy? Here William recovered himself a little, and wiping her face and hands with his handkerchief, put away the rude plaything, saying, Oh, my God, I'm lost. What have you done, Alice? It's awful. 
Never mention it again. I mustn't walk out with you anymore. Alice burst into sobs. Oh. Oh. Willie. How unkind. Do you think I will tell? Only I must share the pleasure with Lucy. Oh. I kiss me as you did her. And we won't say any more about it today. William loved the little girl too well to refuse such a delightful task, but he contented himself with it. A very short sock at her virgin cunny, lest his erotic passion should urge him to outrage her at once. How nice to feel your lovely tongue there. How beautifully it tickled and warmed me all over, but you were so quick. And left off just as it seemed nicer than ever, dear Willie, said Alice, embracing and kissing him with ardor. Gently, darling, you mustn't be so impulsive. It's a very dangerous game for one so young. You must be careful how you look at me, or notice me, before others, said Mr. William, returning her kisses, and feeling himself already quite unable to withstand the temptation of such a delicious liaison. Ah, said Alice, with extraordinary perception for one so young. You fear Lucy. Our best plan is to take her into our confidence. I will get rid of my lady's maid. I never did like her. And we'll ask Mama to give Lucy the place. Won't that be fine, dear? We shall be quite safe in all our little games, then. The butler, now more collected in his ideas, and with a cooler brain, could not but admire the wisdom of this arrangement. So he assented to the plan, and he took the boat put for a row to cool their heated blood and quiet the impulsive throbbings of a pair of fluttering hearts. The next two or three days were wet and unfavorable for outdoor excursions, and Alice took advantage of this interval to induce her mother to change her lady's maid and install Lucy in the situation. Alice's attendant slept in a little chamber, which had two doors, one opening into the corridor, whilst the other allowed free and direct access to her little mistress' apartment, which it adjoined. The very first night Lucy retired to rest in her new room, she had scarcely been half an hour in bed where she lay, reflecting on the change, and wondering how she would now be able to enjoy the butler's company occasionally, before Alice called out for her. In a moment she was at the young lady's bedside, saying, What can I do, Miss Alice? Are you not warm enough? These damp nights are so chilly. Yes, Lucy, said Alice. That must be what it is. I feel cold and restless. Would you mind getting in bed with me? You will soon make me warm. Lucy jumped in, and Alice nestled close up to her bosom, as if for warmth, but in reality to feel the outlines of her beautiful face. Kiss me, Lucy, she said. I know I shall like you so much better than Mary. I couldn't bear her. This was lovingly responded to, and Alice continued, as she pressed her hand on the bosom of her bedfellow. What large titties you have, Lucy. Let me feel them. Open your nightdress so I can lay my face against them. The new femme de chambre was naturally of a warm and loving disposition. She admitted all the familiarities of her young mistress, whose hands began to wander in a most searching manner about her person, feeling the soft, firm skin of her bosom, belly, and bottom the touches of out. Alice seemed to fire the blood and rouse every voluptuous emotion within her. She sighed and kissed her little mistress again and again. Alice, what a fine rump. How hard and plump your flesh is, Lucy. Oh, mine. What's all this hair at the bottom of your belly? My dear, when did it come? Lucy, oh, pray don't miss. It's so rude you will be the same in two or three years' time. It frightened me when it first began to grow. It seems so unnatural. Alice, we're only girls. There is no harm in touching each other. Is there just feel how different I am? Lucy, oh, Miss Alice, pressing the young girl's naked belly to her own. You don't know how you make me feel when you touch me there. Alice, with a slight laugh. Does it make you feel better when Mr. William the butler touches you, dear? Tickling the hairy crack with her finger. Lucy, taught for shame, miss. I hope you don't think I would let him touch me, evidently in some confusion. Alice, don't be frightened, Lucy. I won't tell. But I've seen it all through the old glass door in his pantry. 
Ah. You see, I know the secret. And must be let in to share the fun. Lucy. Oh. My God. Miss Alice. What have you seen? I shall have to leave the house at once. Alice. Come, come. Don't be frightened, you know I'm fond of Mr. William. And would never do him any harm. But you can't have him all to yourself. I got you for my maid to prevent your jealous suspicions and keep our secret between us. Lucy was in a frightful state of agitation. What? Has he been such a brute as to ruin you, Miss Alice? He'll murder him if he has, she cried. Alice. Softly, Lucy. Not so loud. Someone will hear you has done nothing yet. But I saw your pleasure when he put that thing into your crap, and am determined to share your joys. So don't be jealous, and we can all three be happy together. Lucy Tao. It would kill you, dare. That big thing of his would split you right up. Alice. Never mind, kissing her lovingly. You keep the secret and I'm not afraid of being seriously hurt. Lucy sealed the compact with a kiss, and they spent a most loving night together, indulging in every variety of kissing and tickling. And Alice had learned from her bedfellow merely all the mysterious particulars in connection with the battles of Venus before they fell asleep in each other's arms. Fine weather soon returned and Alice, escorted by the butler, went for one of her usual rambles, and they soon penetrated into a, a thick copse at the further end of the park and sat down in a little grassy spot where they were secure from observation. William had thoughtfully brought with him an umbrella, as well as a great coat and cloak, which he spread upon the grass for fear Miss Alice might take cold. There! You dear old fellow, said Alice, seating herself, and taking his hand pulled him down beside her. I understand everything now, and you are to make me happy by making a woman of me. As you did, Lucy, you must do it, Willie, dear. I shall soon make you so you can't help yourself. Unbuttoning his trousers and handling his already stiff pago, what a lovely dear it is how I long to feel its juice spouting into my bowels. I know it's painful, but it won't kill me. And then, ah, the heavenly bliss I know you will make me feel. As you do, Lucy, when you have her, how will you do it? Will you lay over me? William, unable to resist her caresses and already almost at spending point, makes her kneel over his face as he lay on his back so that he may first lubricate her maiden cunny with his tongue. This operation titillates and excites the little girl so that she amorously presses herself on his mouth as she faces towards his cock, which she never leaves hold of all the while he spends in ecstasy, whilst she also feels the pleasure of a first virgin emission. Now's the time, Alice, dear. My affair is so well greased, and your is also ready if I get over you. I might be too violent and injure you. The best way is for you to try and do it yourself by straddling over me, and directing its speed to your cunny, and then keep pressing down upon it, as well as the first painful sensations will allow. It will all depend on your own courage for the success of the experiment, said William. Alice. Ah! You shall see my determination, as she began to act upon his suggestion, and fitting the bead of his pego into her slit. Soon pressed down so as to take in and quite cover the first inch of it. Here the pain of stretching and dissension seemed almost too much for her. But she gave a sudden downward plunge of her body, which, although she almost fainted with the dreadful pain, got in at least three inches. What a plucky girl you are, my dear Alice said William in delight. As soon as you can bear it, raise yourself up a little and come down with all your force. It is so well planted, the next good thrust will complete my possession of your lovely charms. I don't care if I die in the effort, she whispered softly. Never mind how it hurts me. Help all you can, Willie dear. This time, as she raised herself off him again, and he took hold of her buttocks to lend his assistance to the grave girl. Clenching her teeth firmly, and shutting her eyes, she gave another desperate plunge upon William's spear of love. The hymen was broken, and she was fairly impaled to the roots of his affair. But it cost her dear. She fell forward in a dead faint, 
whilst the trickling blood proved the sanguinary nature of love's victory. The butler withdrew himself, all smeared with her virgin blood, but he had come prepared for such an emergency, and at once set about using restoratives to bring her round, and presently succeeded in his efforts. Her eyes opened with a smile, and whispering softly, Alice said, Ah! That last thrust was awful, but it's over now. Why did you take him away? Oh, put it back at once, dear, and let me have the soothing injection, Lucy said, would soon heal all my bruised parts. He glued his lips to hers, and gently applied the head of his pigo to her blood-stained crack. Gradually inserted it till it was three-fourths in then, without pressing further, he commenced to move slowly and carefully. The lubricity soon increased, and he could feel the tight, loving contractions of her vagina, which speedily brought him to a crisis once more. And with a sudden thrust, he plunged up to the hilt and shot his very essence into her bowels, as he almost fainted with the excess of his emotions. They laid motionless, enjoying each other's mutual pressures, till Mr. William withdrew, and taking a fine cambric handkerchief, wiped the virgin blood first from the lips of her cunny, then off his own weapon, declaring, as he put the red-stained mouchoir in his pocket, that he would keep it forever, in remembrance of the charms she had so lovingly surrendered to him. The butler prudently refrained from the further indulgence in voluptuous pleasure for the day, and after a good rest, Alice returned to the house, feeling very little the worse for her sacrifice, and very happy in having secured part of the love of dear and faithful William. How suddenly unforeseen accidents prevent the realization of the best plans for happiness. The very same day her father was ordered by his medical adviser to the south of Europe and started next morning for town to make the necessary arrangements, taking the butler with him, leaving Alice's mama to follow as soon as the two children were suitably located at school. Lucy and her young mistress consoled each other as well as possible, under the circumstances. But in a few days, an aunt took charge of the house, and Alice was sent to this school, and is now in your arms, dear Beatrice, whilst my brother is now at college, and we only meet during the holidays. Will you, dear, ask your guardians to allow you to spend the next vacation with me, and I will introduce you to Frederick, who, if I make no mistake, is quite as voluptuously inclined as his sister. Heart. Tutanin. I will pass over the exciting practices myself, and Bedfellow used to indulge in almost every night, and nearly remark that two more Finnish young tribades it would have been impossible to have found anywhere. I had to wait till the Christmas vacation before I could be introduced to Frederick, who, between ourselves, we had already devoted to the task of taking my virginity which we did not think would prove a very difficult operation, as with so much finger-frigging, and also the use of Elise's leather sausage, which, as I learned, she had improvised for her own gratification. My mount and cunny were wonderfully developed, and already slight signs of the future growth of curly brown hair could be detected. I was nearly thirteen, as one fine crisp morning in December, we drove up to the hall on our return from school. There stood the aunt to welcome us, but my eyes were fixed upon the youthful, yet manly figure of Frederick, who stood by her side, almost a counterpart of his sister, in features and complexion, but really a very fine young fellow, between seventeen and eighteen. Since hearing the story of Alice's intrigue with William, I always looked at every man and boy to see what sort of fa. A bunch they had got in their pockets, and was delighted to perceive Mr. Frederick was apparently well furnished. Alice introduced me to her relatives, but Frederick evidently looked upon me as a little girl, and not at all yet, up to the serious business of love and flirtation. So our first private consultation between Alice and myself was how best to open his eyes and draw him to take a little more notice of his sister's friend, Lucy who I now saw for the first time, slept in the little room adjoining Alice's chamber, which I shared with her young mistress. Frederick had a room on the other side of ours, so that we were next-door neighbors, and could rap and give signals to each other on the wall, as well as to try to look through. 
the keyhole of a disused door, which opened direct from one room to the other, but had long since been locked and bolted to prevent any communication between the occupants. A little observation soon convinced us that Lucy was upon most intimate terms with her young master, which Alice determined to turn to account in our favor. She quickly convinced her femme de chambre that she could not enjoy and monopolize the whole of her brother, and finding that Lucy expected he would visit her room that very night, she insisted upon ringing the changes by taking Lucy to sleep with herself and putting me in the place of Monsieur Frederick's lady love. I was only too willing to be a party of this arrangement, and at 10 p.m., when we all retired to rest, I took the place of the femme de chambre and pretended to be fast asleep in her snug little bed. The lock of the door had been oiled by Lucy, so as to open quite noiselessly, but the room was purposely left in utter darkness, and secured even from the intrusion of a dim starlight by well-closed window curtains. About eleven o'clock, as nearly as I could guess, the door silently opened, and by the light of the corridor lamp I saw a figure, in nothing but a shirt, cautiously glide in and approach the bed. The door closed, and Dale was dark, putting my heart in a dreadful flutter at the approach of the long-wished-for but dreaded ravisher of my virginity. Lucy! 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 He whispered in a low voice, almost in my ear. No response. Only the apparent deep breathing of a person in sound sleep. She hasn't thought much about me, but I guess something between her legs will soon wake her up. I heard him mutter then the bedclothes were pulled open, and he slid into bed by my side. My hair was all loose, the same as Lucy's generally was at night, and I felt a warm lass on my cheek, also an arm stealing round my waist and clutching my nightdress as if to pull it up. Of course I was the fox asleep, but could not help being all a-tremble at the approach of my fate. How you shake, Lucy, what's the matter? Oh, now, who's this? It can't be you, he said rapidly, as with a sigh and a murmur. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Alice. I turned round just as he pulled up my chemise, clasping my arm firmly round him, but still apparently lost in sleep. My God! I heard him say, It's that little devil of a Beatrice in Lucy's bed I won't go. I'll have a lark. She can't know me in the dark. His hands seemed to explore every part of my body. I could feel his rampant pressed between our naked bellies. But although in a burning heat of excitement, I determined to let him do just as he liked and pretend still to be asleep, his fingers explored my crack and rubbed the little first his leg got between mine. And then presently I could feel him gently placing the head of his instrument in the crack, and I was so excited that a sudden emission wetted it and his fingers all over with a creamy spend. The little devils spending in her sleep. These girls must be in the habit of freaking each other, I believe, he said to himself again. Then his lips met mine for the first time, and he was quite free from fear on that account, as his face was as beardless as a girl's. Ah, Alice, I murmured. Give me your sausage thing. That's it, dear. Shove it in. As I pushed myself forward on his slowly progressing cock, he met me with a sudden thrust, making me almost scream with pain. Yet my arms nervously clung round his body and kept him close to the mark. Gently, he whispered. Beatrice, dear, I'm Frederick. I won't hurt you much. How in heaven's name did you come in? Lucy's bed. Pretending now to awaken for the first time with a little scream, and trying to push his body away from me, I exclaimed, Oh, oh, how you hurt. Um, for shame, dumb, um, let me go, Mr. Frederick, how can you? And then my effort seemed exhausted, and I lay almost at his mercy as he ruthlessly pushed his advantage and tried to stop my mouth with kisses. I was lost, although very painful, thanks to our frequent fingerings. See? The way had been so cleared that he was soon in complete possession, although as I afterwards found by the stains on my chemise, it was not quite a bloodless victory. Taking every possible advantage, he continued his motions with thrilling energy, 
till I could not help responding to his delicious thrusts. Moving my bottom a little to meet each returning insertion of his exciting weapon, we were lying on our sides, and in a few moments we both swam in a mutual flood of bliss. And after a spasmodic storm of sighs, kisses, and tender hugging pressure of each other's body, we lay in a listless state of enjoyment. When suddenly the bedclothes were thrown, or pulled six, then slap, 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 came smarting smacks on our bottoms, and Alice's light, merry laugh sounded through the darkness. Ha! Ha! Dianen! Ha! And Ha! It! Mr. Frederick, is this what you learned at college, sir? Here, Lucy. Help we must secure and punish the wretch. Bring a light. Lucy appeared with a candle and locked the door inside at once, before he could have a chance of escaping, and I could see she was quite delighted at the spectacle. Presented by our bodies in conjunction, for as I had been previously instructed, I clung to him in apparent fright, and tried to hide my blushing face in his bosom. Frederick was in the utmost confusion, and at first was afraid his sister would expose him. But he was a little reassured as she went on. What shall I do? I can't tell an old maid like Aunt only to think that my dear little Beatrice should be outraged under my very eyes. The second night of her visit. If Papa and Mama were at home, they would know what to do now, I must decide for myself. Now, Frederick, will you submit to a good whipping for this, or shall I write to your father and send Beatrice home disgraced in the morning? And you will have to promise to marry her, sir? Now you've a spoiled her for anyone else who do you think would take a cruche cassé if they knew it, or not repudiate her when it was found out, as it must be the first night of her marriage. No, you bad boy. I'm determined both to punish you and make you offer her all the reparation in your power. I began to cry and begged her not to be too hard, as he had not hurt me much, and in fact had at the finish quite delighted my ravished senses. Upon my word, said Alice, assuming the airs of a woman. The girl is as bad as the boy this could not have happened, Beatrice. If you had not been too complacent and given way to his rudeness, Frederick, disengaging himself from my embrace, and quite unmindful of his condition, started up, and clasping his sister round her neck, kissed her most lovingly. And the impudent fellow even raised her nightdress, and stroked her belly, exclaiming, as he passed his hand over her mossy mount. What a pity, Alice. You are my sister, or I would give you the same pleasure as I have, Beatrice, but I will submit to your chastisement, however hard it may be, and promise also that my little love here shall be my future wife. Alice, you scandalous fellow, to insult my modesty so, and expose your blood-stained manhood to my sight, but I will punish you, and avenge both myself and Beatrice, you are my prisoner? So just march into the other room. I've got a tickler there that I brought home from school, as a curiosity. Little thinking I should so soon have a use for it. Arrived in Alice's own room, she and Lucy first tied his hands to the bedpost, then they secured his ankles to the handle of a heavy box, which stood handy, so as to have him tolerably well stretched out. Alice, getting her rod out of a drawer, now, pin up his shirt to his shoulders, and I will see if I can't at least draw a few drops of his impudent blood out of his posteriors, which Beatrice may wipe off with her handkerchief as a memento of the outrage she has so easily forgiven. The hall was a large house, and our apartments were the only ones occupied in that corridor, the rooms abutting on which were all in reserve for visitors expected to arrive in a few days. To spend Christmas with us, so that there was not much fear of being heard by any of the other inmates of the house, and Alice was under no necessity of thinking what might be the result of her blows. With a flourish she brought down the bunch of twigs with a thundering whack on his plump, white bottom. The effect was startling to the culprit, who was evidently only anticipating some playful fun. Ah! Ah! My God! Alice! You will cut the skin, mind, what you're about, I didn't bargain for that. Alice, with a smile of satisfaction. How? How? 
Did you think I was going to play with you? But you very soon found your mistake, sir, will you? Will you again take such outrageous liberties with a young lady friend of mine? She cut him quite half a dozen times in rapid succession, as she thus lectured him, each blow leaving long red lines to mark its visitation and suffusing his fair bottom all over with a peach-like bloom. The victim, finding himself quite helpless, bit his lips and ground his teeth in fruitless rage. At last he burst forth, Ah! 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 You should devil! Do you mean to skin my bum? Be careful, or I will take a rare revenge some day before long. Alice, with great calmness and determination, but with a most excited twinkle in her eyes. Oh! You show temper, do you? So you mean to be revenged on me for doing a simple act of justice, sir? I will keep you there, and cut away at your impudent bottom, till you fairly beg my pardon, and promise to forgo all such wicked revengefulness. The victim writhed in agony and rage, but her blows only increased in force, beginning to raise great fire-looking wheels all over his buttock. Ah! Ha! Huh. That, she continued. How do you like it, Fred? Shall I put a little more steam in my blows? Frederick struggles desperately to get loose, but they've secured him too well for that. The tears of shame and mortification stand in his eyes, but he's still obstinate. And I could also observe a very perceptible rising in his manly instrument, which soon stood out from his belly in a rampant state of erection. Alice, with assumed fury, look at the fellow, how he is insulting me by the exhibition of his lustful weapon. I wish I could cut it off with a blow of the rod, giving him a fearful cut across his belly and on the penis. Frederick fairly howled with pain, and big tears rolled down his cheeks as he gasped out, Oh! Oh! Ah! Have mercy, Alice. I know I deserve it. Oh! Pity me now, dear. Alice, without relaxing her blows. Oh! You are beginning to feel properly, are you? Are you sincerely penitent? Beg my pardon at once, sir, for the way you insulted me in the other room. Frederick Tau, dear Alice, stop, stop. You don't let me get any breath. I will. I will beg your pardon. Oh, I can't help my affair sticking up as it does. Alice, down, sir, down, sir. Your master is ashamed of you as she playfully whisks his pago with her rod. Frederick is in agony. His writhing and contortions seemed excruciating in the extreme. He fairly groaned out. Oh! Oh! Alice! Let me down. On my word, I will do anything you order. Oh! Ah! Oh. Ah! Nip! You make me do it as he shuts his eyes, and we saw quite a jet of sperm shoot from his virile member. Alice dropped her rod, and we let down the culprit who was terribly crestfallen. Now, sir, she said, down on your knees and kiss the rod. Without a word, he dropped down and kissed the worn-out stump, saying, Oh, Alice, the last few moments have been so heavenly. It has blotted out all sense of pain. My dear sister... I thank you for punishing me, and will keep my promise to Beatrice. I wiped the drops of blood from his slightly bleeding rump, and then we gave him a couple of glasses of wine, and allowed him to sleep with Lucy, in her room for the rest of the night, where they had a most luscious time of it, whilst Alice and myself indulged in our favorite touches. You may be sure Frederick was not long before he renewed his pleasures with me, whilst his sister took pleasure in our happiness, but she seemed to have contracted a penchant for the use of the rod, and once or twice a week would have us all in her room, for a birch seance, as she called it, when Lucio myself had to submit to be victims, but the heating of our bottoms only seemed to add to our enjoyment when we were afterwards allowed to soothe our raging passions in the arms of our mutual lover. To be continued, a gentleman who was blessed with a beautiful and lewdly disposed wife has long been very unhappy 
and disappointed at the results of his endeavors to become a parent. But returning home from the city, very unexpectedly, the other morning, he caught the vicar of the parish gamahoching his spouse. I'm home, he exclaimed in a fury. So you're the bugger who swallows all my children. Part of a letter from Harriet Key. It'll tell you a funny dream I had the night before last. I thought I was sitting on a green bank and a man was sitting by the side of me he fell to kissing and talking but did nothing else. Well, after a while, he got up and went away then. At the side of me, as I sat there, lay the largest prick I ever saw. It was at least half a yard long, and as thick as the calf of my leg it had four bollocks, but it tapered towards the end. I thought I took it up and felt it. It was warm flesh and blood, and I said to myself, Why the man has left his prick behind him, what a pity. And it is such a fine one, Tool. What will he do without it? So I thought to myself, I wonder if it will spend if I suck it. So I kept sucking it. But it was so big and thick that it made my mouth ache, and I said to myself, Never mind. It will do to freak myself with. So I got up and put it under my cloak and cuddled it so close to me that I felt as lewd as could be. As I was going along, I met the man coming back, and when he came up to me, he said, Have you seen my trumpet? Your trumpet, said I. Why, you mean your prick, says he, you nasty, lying woman. It's my best trumpet. Well said I. If this is a trumpet, why a trumpet's a prick? And a prick is a trumpet. And I held it up to look at. He snatched it out of my hand. Now then, he'll show you if it's a prick or a trumpet. And he began to blow away on it so loud that I awoke and lost my prick and trumpet too. What woke me up was the sound of a trumpet in the street, so I suppose that was the cause of my funny dream. The wise lover. Woman and man when ear inclined. In mutual goodness, pleasure find. The lawful spouse tis sweet to embrace. In hopes to see a lengthened race. But let who will the truth contest. Another's wife is still the best. When I was young and slightly skilled. In blisses womankind can yield. I love the maid. I love the peace. But as my wit and years increase. I own the sweetest sport in life is to enjoy your neighbor's wife, a virgin coy with sidelong eye. Your near approach at once will fly, abhors your nasty hot desires, not less than marriage she requires. Such maidenheads the wise detest, the adultery maidenheads the best, the vagrant nymph who sells her charms and fills in turn a thousand arms. Besides the loss of gold and fame, may set Priapus in a flame. Such fire-tailed comets God confound. A wife is always safe and sound. The genial flame I've oft allayed. With buxom Kate, my chambermaid, and dozens such as her, but found. Such sport with ills beset around. He who at liberty would feast will find another's wife the best. A mistress kept at first is sweet and joys to do the merry feet. But bastards come and hundreds gone. You'll wish you'd left her charms alone. Such breeding hussies are a pest. A neighbor's wife is far the best. If you are rash, a wife at first, may into horrid fury burst. Sir, you shall rue throughout your life. The day you vey kissed another's wife, reply, my dear. This gives the zest. I always like my neighbor's best. Jove, I remember when inclined to feast himself on womankind, though maids enough to him were free, always preferred adultery. He took the shape of bird and beast, to prove adultery the best. But while this naughty sport we sing, who can forget our gracious king, Gio, I vool, him many a lady pleasures gives, for which her husband pay receives. God bless King George, his majesty is patron of adultery. I own the dangers of the suit. The sweetest is forbidden fruit, and laws as thick as hairs are set. Around the center of delight, this peril gives the highest zest, and guarded hoard is sure the best. The wandering nymph your purse desires. The 
Chambermaid to rank, aspires. Your wife content with marriage dues. All further license will refuse. He who has put them to the test must own his neighbor's wife's the best. Queen Bathsheba, Pat, a temperance ballad. Attributed to Sir Wilfrid Lawson. Grass widows and princes. A warning I seen of the sad wicked doing of David the king with Bathsheba, wife of poor Major Uriah, who was bathing one day when the king chanced to spy her. He was drinking upstairs and the weather was hot and her window was open a thing she forgot and the stark naked beauty had not an idea that while she was washing, a creature could see her. She and her little sister were sporting together, enjoying the heat of the bright summer weather. They bathed in the fountain, and while they were washing, were romping all naked, and leaping and splashing. What man could resist such an awful temptation? He forgot he was king of the sanctified nation. He was filled with delight and lewd admiration, and was mad for the raptures of fierce fornication. Beware of the devil, who seldom lies sleeping. So while she was washing, and while he was peeping, the king's living scepter grew stiff as a rod. Nice mutton, cried David. Ill f her by G. So calling a page, he desert him to go, and inquire all about her. He answered, I know, the lady your majesty's pleased to admire, is the wife of the valorous Major Uriah. His majesty answered, go, fetch her, be quick. Much conscience indeed has a stiff-standing prick. The page ran to call her she put on her smock and hurried to wait on his majesty's cock. One touch to her hand and one word in her ear, and she fell on her back like a sweet willing deer. He was frantic with lust, but she sized his arrow and put it at once in the proper direction. She was girlish and lively, a heavenly figure, with the cut of an angel, and fun with vigory. He got her at once with child of a son, and he said a long grace when the swiving was done. So the lady went home, and she very soon found her belly was growing unluckily round. This an honor, said she, I could hardly expect. Your majesty now must your handmaid protect. Never fear, cried the king. Ill be your adviser. Ill send for the major and no one's the wiser. So he sent for Uriah, who speedily came, but unluckily never laid hands on the dame. King David was puzzled. He made the man tipsy. But still he avoided the lewd little gypsy. David laid a new plot, and his wish was fulfilled. In the front of the battle, Uriah was killed. The horrible fright. Poor Sally. I hear from your loving mamma that you're in a horrible fright of papa. Take courage, dear girl, for the sweetest delight is closely akin to a horrible fright. In your dreams did you near see a horrible man who crushes and conquers you. Do all you can. He treats your poor innocent mouse like a rat that's toozled and clawed and devoured by a cat. He produces a horrible fright of a thing that fits like a finger in conjugal ring. He thrusts and he pokes and he enters your belly, till the horrible monster is melted to jelly. When you draw a new glove on your finger so tight, the glove is, you know, in a horrible fright. But soon it is taught your dear finger to love. The man and the woman are finger and glove. Away with your horrible fright, and away. With the wretch of a father who hinders the play, if he dares interfere, when you kiss on the sly. Just pull up your petticoat, piss in his eye. Ah, Sally, my darling, I wish that this night I might put you, my love, in a horrible fright. You might lie down a maiden in five minutes more. I would open a secret, near opened before. You then would behold, long, ruddy, and sick, that horrible monster, a stiff-standing prick. You'd cry out, oh, softly. Oh, gently, ah, Janin.
Ah. Oh, lardy. Oh, naughty. Oh, harder la la la. At last, dearest Sally, your horrible fright would end in a shudder of tipsy delight. You'll open your buttocks as wide as you can to admit every inch of the dear cruel man. You'll devour every inch of his horrible yard till the tit hit on your bottom so hard. Your terrible fright, my dear girl, will be over. You'll breathe out your soul on the lips of your lover. There's an end of this horrible fright of a song. Your mother shall read it and say if it's wrong. No, she will approve either greatest delight. Is the prick which you fancy such a horrible fright? Haynes Hill, Mons Veneris. In Middlesex a hill we meet, for beauty known to fade, where wealthy pain has built his seat. Haynes Hill, they call its name. Pray, Mr. Burke, said Lady Payne. What Latin word is this? I've searched the dictionary in vain. Pray, what's Mons Veneris? He looked into her beauteous eyes. So, innocent of ill, and gave the happiest of replies. It signifies Payne's Hill, instance of self denial. Mohammed Zadik, a gentleman at Hyderabad, received a female slave belonging to his brother at Kurnool, who was going to Bengal, and requested Zadig to keep his property for a year. Her beauty excited his passions greatly. He told the story to my friend. Captain Keeley, and ended thus to lie with her carnally would have been wrong, as my brother had not permitted it. So I governed my love by the holy rules of moderation and virtue, and contented myself with merely f her in the arse. George Stokes, the cheesemonger in Snow Hill, had Dr. Cullen one night as a guest. Cullen did not fancy the cheese on the table and said, You do not know how to select cheese, let me go into the warehouse and pick one out. He did this and the cheese he selected was delicious. Everyone declared it most excellent. How did you pitch upon it, and in the dark, too? Said Stokes. Ill tell you, said the doctor. I tried several, till I came to one which made my prick stand. This is it, a prime cheese smells exactly like a blooming, ripe girl's cunt. Nursery rhymes. There was a young lady of Gaza, who shaved her cunt clean with a razor. The crabs in a lump made tracks to her rump, which proceeding did greatly amaze her. There was a young lass of suret, the cheeks of whose arse were so fat that they had to be parted whenever she farted, and also whenever she shat. There was an old priest of Siberia who of f grew wearier and wearier. So one night after prayers, he bolted upstairs and buggered the lady superior. There was an old man of Nattle, who was lazily fagal, says she. You're a, a sluggard, said he. You be buggered. I like to f slowly, and shall. There was a young farmer of Nant, whose conduct was gay and gallant, for he f all his dozens of nieces and cousins, in addition, of course, to his aunt. There was an old man of Tantivy, who followed his son to the privy. He lifted the lead, to see what he did, and found that it smelt of Capivi. There was a young man of this nation, who didn't much like fornication. When asked, do you fuck? He said, no, I suck. Women's quins and I use ma- There was a young parson of Eltham, who seldom f whores, but oft felt an. In the lanes he would linger and play Ed stick finger. Twas on the way home that he smelt him. There was a young lady of rhymes, who was terribly plagued with wet dreams. She saved up a dozen, and sent to her cousin, who ate them and thought they were creams. There was a gay parson of tooting, whose row he was frequently shooting, till he married a lass, with a face like my arse, and a cut you could put a top boot in. A learned divine down at Buckingham, wrote a treatise on cousin on fun. A learned Parsi taught him Gamahuchi, so he added a chapter on sucking em. Not the same, said Lady McNeil, to Sir John, eating ling. I'm afraid. Sir, that fish ain't exactly the thing. Why really, he answered, 
I do not dislike it. It's not the thing, but it's mightily like it. Subumbra, or sport among the Shanoodles, continued. In the course of the evening, Frank and myself were delighted by the arrival of a beautiful young lady of sixteen. On a visit to his sisters, in fact, a schoolfellow of Sophie and Polly come to stop a week at the house. Miss Rosa Redquim was indeed a sprightly beauty of the Venus height, well-proportioned in leg and limb, full-swelling bosom, with a graceful Grecian type of face. Rosy cheeks, large gray eyes, and golden auburn hair, lips as red as cherries, and teeth like pearls, frequently exhibited by a succession of winning smiles, which never seemed to leave her face. Such was the acquisition to the feminine department of the house, and we congratulated ourselves on the increased prospect of sport. As Frank had expressed to me considerable compunctions as to taking liberties with one's own sisters. The next morning, being gloriously fine and warm, myself and friend strolled in the grounds, smoking our cigarettes, for about an hour, till near the time when we guessed the girls would be coming, for a bath in the small lake in the park, which we at once proceeded to, then we secreted ourselves secure from observation, and awaited in deep silence the arrival of sisters and friend. This lake, as I call it, was a pond of about four or five acres in extent, every side thickly wooded to the very margin, so that even anglers could not get access to the bank, except at the little sloping green sward of about twenty or thirty square yards in extent, which had a large hut or summer house under the trees where the bathers could undress and then trip across the lawn to the water. The bottom of the pond being gradually shelving and covered with fine sand at this spot, and a circular space, enclosed with rails, to prevent them getting out of their deck. The back door of this hut opened upon a very narrow footpath, leading to the house through the dense thicket, so that any party would feel quite secure from observation. The interior was comfortably furnished with seats and lounges besides a buffet, generally holding a stock of wine, biscuits, and cakes during the bathing season. Frank, having a key to the hut, took me through onto the lawn, and then climbing up into a thick sycamore, we relighted our cigarettes, awaiting the adventure with some justifiable impatience. Some ten minutes of suspense, and then we were rewarded by hearing the ringing laughter of the approaching girls. We heard the key turned in the lock, then the sounds of their bolting themselves in, and Annie's voice, saying, Ah! Wouldn't the boys like the fun of seeing us undress and bathing? This lovely warm day, to which we heard Rosa laughingly reply, I don't mind if they do see me, if I don't know it, dears. There's something delightful in the thought of the excitement it would put the dear fellows in. I know I should like Frank to take a fancy to me. I'm nearly in love with him already and have read that the best way a girl can madly excite the man she wishes to win is to let him see all her charms, when he thinks she is unconscious of his being near. Well, there's no fear of our being seen here, so I am one for a good romp. Off with your clothes, quick it will be delicious in the water, exclaims Sophie. The undressing was soon accomplished, excepting chemises, boots, and stockings, as they were evidently in no hurry to enter the water. Now, said Sophie with a gay laugh, we must make Rosa a free woman and examine all she's got. Come on, girls, lay her down and turn up her smock. The beautiful girl only made a slight feint of resisting as she playfully pulled up their chemises, exclaiming, you shan't look at my fanny for nothing. La, Holly has got no hair on her fly trap yet. What a pretty pouting slit yours is, Annie. I think you have been using the finger of a glove made into a little cuff for Sophie, and told her to bring home from school for you. She was soon stretched on her back on the soft mossy grass, her face covered with burning blushes as her pretty cuff was exposed to view, ornamented with its chevelure of soft red hair, her beautiful white belly, and thighs shining like marble in the bright sunlight. The three sisters were blushing as well as their friend, and delighted at the sight of so much loveliness. One after another, they kissed the vermilion lips of their friend's delightful slit, and then turning her on her face, 
proceeded to smack the lily-white bottom of their laughing, screaming victim with their open hands. Smacks and laughter echoed through the grove, and we almost fancied ourselves witnesses to the games of real nymphs. At last she was allowed to rise on her knees, and then the three sisters in turn presented their cups to their friend to kiss. Polly was the last, and Rosa, clasping her arms firmly round my youngest cousin's buttocks, exclaimed, Ah! Nah. You have made me feel so rude. I must suck this little hairless jewel. As she glued her lips to it, and hid her face almost from sight, as if she would devour Polly's charms there and then. The young girl, flushed with excitement, placed her hands on Rosa's head as if to keep her there, whilst both Annie and Sophie, kneeling down by the side of their friend, began to caress her cunt, bosom, and every charm they could tickle or handle. This exciting scene lasted for five or six minutes, till at last they all sank down in a confused heap on the grass, kissing and fingering in mad excitement. Now was our time. We had each provided ourselves with little switches of twigs, and thus aimed we seemed to drop from the van. Clouds upon the surprised girls who screamed in fright and hid their blushing faces in their hands. They were too astonished and alarmed to jump up, but we soon commenced to bring them to their senses and convince them of the reality of the situation. What rude, what lascivious ideas, slash away, Frank, I cried, making my swish leave its marks on their bottoms at every cut. Who would have thought of it, Walter? We must whip such indecent ideas out of their tails. He answered, seconding my assault with his sharp, rapid strokes. They screamed both from pain and shame, and springing to their feet, chased round the lawn, there was no escape. We caught them by the tails of their chemises, which we lifted up to enable us to cut at their bums with more effect. At last we were getting quite out of breath, and beginning fairly to pant from exhaustion, when Annie suddenly turned upon me, saying, Come, come, girls, let's tear their clothes off, so they shall be quite as ashamed as we are, and agree to keep our secret. The others helped her, and we made such a feeble resistance that we were soon reduced to the same state in which we had surprised them, making them blush and look very shamefaced at the sight of our rampant engines of love. Frank sized Miss Redquim round the waist and led the way to the summer house myself and his sisters following. The gentleman then producing the wine, see, from the buffet, sat down with a young lady on each knee, my friend having Rosa, and Polly, whilst Annie and Sophie sat with me, we plied the girls with several glasses of champagne each, which they seemed to swallow in order to drown their sense of shame. We could feel their bodies quiver with emotion as they reclined upon our necks, their hands and ours groping under shirts and chemises, in every forbidden spot each of us had. Two delicate hands caressing our cocks, two delicious arms around our necks, two faces laid cheek to cheek on either side, two sets of lips to kiss, two pairs of bright and humid eyes to return our ardent glances. What wonder, then, that we flooded their hands with our spurting seed, and felt their delicious spendings trickle over our busy fingers, excited by the wine, and madly lustful to enjoy the dear girls to the utmost, I stretched Sophie's legs wide apart, and sinking on my knees, Gamma hooched her virgin cunt, till she spent again in ecstasy, whilst dear Annie was doing the same to me. Sucking the last drop of spend from my gushing prick meanwhile, Frank was following my example, Rosa surrendered to his lascivious tongue all the recesses of her virginity, as she screamed with awe, delight, and pressed his head towards her mound, when the frenzy of love brought her to the spending point Polly, all the while kissing her brother's belly, and frigging him to a delicious emission. When we recovered a little from this exciting pas de trois, all bashfulness was vanished between us. We promised to renew our pleasures on the morrow and for the present contented ourselves by bathing all together, and then returned to the house for fear the girls might be suspected of something wrong for staying out too long. To be continued. Sporting Life, 6th August, 1879, Tercerum. Mr. F. Jacobs, we are pleased to hear that this gentleman, although severely crushed and bruised by his fall while riding Mrs. Jones at Tate, 
Southport in the Consolation Stakes, is going on as well as his friends could wish, and it is hoped he is quite out of danger. Query. Was he riding a St. George? Or was it a genuine toss-off with its neck nearly broken? Ed Dahl. Miss Coote's confession. Or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. In a series of letters to a lady friend. Letter 3. My dear Nelly. I told you in my last how easily for me the affair of the nectarines passed over. But I was not long to go free with a whole skin. The general had evidently booked me in his mind for a good dressing the first time I should give him a pretext for punishment. Strange to say, my first terrible punishment, and dreadful cutting up of poor Jemima, related in my last letter, had very little effect, except, if possible, to render me rather more of a daredevil. I longed to pay off both Sir Eyre and Mrs. Mansell, but could think of no possible plan of effecting my revenge at all satisfactorily if I could but do it properly. I was quite indifferent to what they might wreak upon me. Jane could offer no suggestion, so I resolved to act entirely alone and pretended to let it all drop. But sundry little annoyances were continually happening to different members of the family, even to myself. The general was very angry and particularly furious, when one day he found some of his flagellation books seriously torn and damaged, but could fix the blame on no one indeed. I rather fancy he strongly suspected Jemima had done it out of revenge. Next, Mrs. Mansell got her feet well stung one night by nettles. Placed in her bed, she and Sir Eyre always were the principal sufferers, and, as a climax, two or three days afterwards, the general got his flesh considerably scratched and pricked by some pieces of bramble, cleverly hid in his bed, under the sheet, so as to be felt before they could be seen, it being his practice to throw back the upper bed clothes, and then, laying himself full length, pull them over him again. His backside first felt the pricks, which made him suddenly start from the spot, but only to get his hands, feet, legs, and all parts of his body well lacerated before he could get off the bed. I saw the sheet next day all spotted with the blood, for he was fearfully scratched and pieces of the thorns stuck in his flesh. Mrs. Mansell had to get out of bed in a hurry to attend the poor old fellow, and was occupied a long time in putting him to rights, returning in about an hour's time and making haste into bed, quite unsuspicious of any lurking danger she had already been in it, when prick, prick, Prick. Ah, my God. The devil's been here whilst I was away, she screamed. Yeah, Mama, Jane, and myself ran to her room and found her terribly scratched. Especially on her knees, there were suppressed smiles on all our faces, and Jemima looked really pleased. Mrs. Mansell. Ah, what a shame to serve me so. It's one of you three, and I believe it's Jemima. Jemima died town. I couldn't help smiling. My ma'am, you did scream so, and I thought you had no feeling. Mrs. Mansell, you impudent hussy. Sir Eyre shall know of this. Jemima, Jane, and myself all declared our innocence. But in vain there evidently would soon be a grand punishment drill for her, if not for all three. The housekeeper and the general were both too sore for nearly a week, and in fact many of the thorns remained in their flesh. And one in Mrs. Mansell's knee kept her very lame. Sir Eyre had to wait ten days before he could enter into any kind of an investigation. At last the awful day arrived, we were all mustered in the punishment room. The general seated in his chair, it was after dinner, as usual, and we were all in evening costume. Sir Eyre, you all know why I have called you together. Such an outrage as Mrs. Mansell and myself suffered from cannot be passed over, in fact, if neither Miss Rosa, Yemima, nor Jane will confess the crime I have resolved to punish all three severely, so as to be sure the real culprit gets her deserts. Now, Rosa, was it you? For if not you, it was one of the others. Answer, Hangzera. No grandfather besides, you know all sorts of tricks have been played upon me. Sir Eyre. Well, Jemima, what do you say, yes or no? Yemima. Dot Good lord, sir. 
I never touched such thorns in my life. Sir Eyre? Jane, are you guilty or not, or do you know anything of it? Jane dot ein. Oh. I mean, dear. No, sir. Indeed, I don't. Sir Eyre. Er, one of you must be a confounded storyteller. Rosa, as a young lady, I shall punish you first. Perhaps we may get a confession from one of you before we have done. Then turning to Mrs. Mansell, prepare the young lady she didn't get such a birching as she ought to have had the other day. But if it takes all night, the three of them shall be well trounced. Jane and Jemima lend a hand. My thoughts were not so much upon what I should feel myself, as the anticipation of the fine sight the others would present and hoping to again realize the pleasant sensations I had experienced when Jemima was so severely punished. They soon removed my blue silk dress and fixed me to the horse, but the general interposed he had a different idea. Stop! Stop! he cried. Let Jemima horse her. So I was released, and having my petticoats well fastened over my back, I was at once mounted on her strong stout back, my arms round her neck, being firmly held by the wrists in front, and my legs also tied together under her waist, leaving me beautifully exposed and bent so as to tighten the skin. Mrs. Mansell was about to open my drawers when Sir Eyre says no, no. I'm going to use this driving whip. Dot dot. Yeah, mima. Just trot around the room. I can reach her now. Then giving a sharp flick with the whip, which quite convinced me of its efficacy. Now, miss, what have you to say for yourself? I believe you know all about it. Slash! Slash! Slashing with the whip as Jemima, evidently enjoying it, capered round the room each cut made my poor bottom smart with agony. Oh! 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 Cramed father! I cried. It's a shame to punish me, when you know I'm innocent. Oh! Ara, as he slashed me without mercy. I could feel I was getting wheeled all over, but my drawers prevented the flesh from being cut. Presently he ordered a halt, saying, Now, Mrs. Mansell, let's have a look at her naughty bottom, to see if the whip has done any good. Mrs. Mansell, carefully opening my drawers behind, exclaims, Look, look, sir! Juve touched her up nicely. What beautiful wheels, and how rosy her bottom looks. Sir, air, ay, ay, it's a beautiful sight, but not half pretty enough yet. Mrs. Mansell, do you finish her off with the birch? I felt assured of catching it in good earnest now. The general lit a cigar and composed himself in his easy chair to enjoy the scene. Mrs. Mansell selected a fine birch of long, thin green twigs and leaving my drawers open behind, ordered Jemima to stand in front of her. Mrs. Mansell, whisking her birch, said, I feel sure this young lady is in the secret, but we shall get nothing out of her. She is so obstinate, but I will try my best. Sir Eyre. Now, Miss Rosa, tell the truth if you want to save your bottom. Are you quite as sure as ever of your own innocence? Whisking and slashing me smartly and with great deliberation, making the blows fall with a whacking sound. Now I am considerably adding to the previous warmth of my posteriors, which smart and tingle terrifically at each cut. Oh. Ah. How unjust, I screamed, to relieve myself as much as possible. Oh, ah. If I do know I can't tell, it's a secret. Um. Have mercy. Thus trying to serve a double purpose to be let off lightly myself, by making them think someone else did it, and so transfer their fury to Jane and Jemima, whose whipping I hope to enjoy. Mrs. Mansell. Ha. Huh. Ha. Ha. Nee. Tis wonderful how the birch has improved you, my dear Miss Rosa. You're not nearly so obstinate as you were. But if you won't tell, you must be punished as an accessory. I'm sorry to do it. But it doesn't hurt you quite so awfully, does it? Thrashing away without a moment's respite, my poor bottom is beginning to be finely pickled, and I can feel the blood trickling down my legs inside my drawers. Hold! Hold! cries the general. Excitedly, it's that devil Jemima Juve punished Rosa enough. Try Jane next, 
If she knows anything well, make her confess. And then the impudent red-headed Jemima shall catch it finally. We're getting at the truth, Mrs. Mansell. I'm let down. And the general orders Jane to take my place on the stout. Back I let my clothes down with a thrill of excitement. And thanking Sir Eyre for his kindness. Make myself busy in helping to arrange poor Jane's posteriors for slaughter, and pin up her skirts to her shoulders, exposing her fine plump bottom and beautiful thighs and legs, the latter encased in pink silk stockings, set off by red satin slippers and blue garters with silver buckles. Sir Eyre, how now, Jane, you hussy? Do you dare to come into my presence without drawers? How indecent! It's like telling me to axe my oss. You impudent girl. How do you like that giving her a tremendous undercut, so that the birch fairly well welled the flesh right up to her mossy crack? It's all very well, in the heat of a birching, but to expose your nakedness like that so impudently is quite another, continuing to cut away in apparently great indignation. Jane. Da. Ah. Ah, I'll hire. My God, sir, have pity. Mrs. Mansell didn't allow us time to dress. And in the hurry, I couldn't find my drawers to put on. And she was angrily calling me to come and not keep her waiting. So I thought duty must be considered before decency. Oh, 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 sir, you are cruel. Oh, have mercy. I'm as innocent as a babe, as she is in terrible agony from the undercuts, which have already drawn the blood she writhes and struggles so. Jemima can hardly stand under her plunging figure. Sir, eh. Yeah. Well, well. I'm inclined to forgive you about the drawers, as I always like everybody to consider duty before everything. But how about putting the thorns in the bed? You must know about that. And it's your duty to confess. Jane, dot owl. Oh, e oh, Ara, I can't tell him innocent. How can I split upon another? Oh, you will kill me, sir. I shall be confined to my bed for weeks if you cut me up so. Sir, air, fiddlesticks. Bottoms get well quicker than that, Jane. Don't be alarmed. But I shall punish you a good deal more if you don't confess it was Jemima did it. Now, wasn't it Jemima? Wasn't it Jemima? Wasn't it Jemima? Thundering at her both with voice and rod, and drawing the blood finely. The victim is almost ready to faint. Still, I could see the usual indications of voluptuous excitement, notwithstanding the agony she must be in. But at last she seems quite exhausted, and ceasing to writhe and wriggle as if she no longer felt the cruel blows, whilst her shrieks sink to a sobbing. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, Sir Eyre, huh, 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 laughing in anticipation of getting the real culprit. Yes, yes, she's confessed at last. Let her down now, poor thing. Throwing away the stump of the worn-out rod, she took a lot before she would give way. But it's bound to come out. Poor Jane is let down in a pitiable condition, and Gemma hisses something about lying chit between her teeth. As I assist Mrs. Mansell to tie her to the horse, and having pinned up her skirts, I opened her drawers so as fully to expose the snow-white beauties of her fine rump. Sir, air, open them as wide as possible, Rosa the mean creature, to let others suffer for her own crime, and even take delight in helping to punish them. Gemma, dot dot, it's all a lie. Sir Eyre, I never had anything to do with it. And they have turned round on me so they may enjoy the sight of my flogging. Ow! Ow! Oh, this is a cruel house. Pay me my wages and let me go. Sir Eyre, chuckling, you'll get your wages, or at least your deserts, you sneaking wretch. Jemima is crimson with shame and fury exclaiming I'm not so much a sneak as somebody else who's done it ill die before I own what I never did. Sir, air, don't let us waste any more time on the obstinate hussy. Let's try what a good birch will do, slashing her two or three times severely on her bottom, 
and bringing out the rosy flush all over the surface of its firm, broad cheeks. See how her bottom blushes for her, laughed the general, but it will soon have to weep blood, increasing the force of his blows, and drawing wheels at every stroke. Yimmy ma. Dot. Oh. Oh. Sir Eyre, how can you believe a lying girl like Jane want I box her ears for her when I get over this? The spiteful thing, to say it's me. Sir Eyre, you are uh, the spiteful one. Will you box her ears? Do you really mean that, you strong, impudent donkey? I shall soon have to try something better than a birch on you. It's not severe enough. You shall beg Jane's. Pardon before I've done with you. You may be strong and tough. But well, master, that somehow. How do you like it? I hope you don't feel it, Jemima. I don't think you do, or you would be more penitent, said he in a fury. I wish I had a good bramble here to tear your bottom with. Perhaps you might feel that. Yimima, dot dot -ti. Oh, n no, pray don't. I didn't do it, and wouldn't have done such a thing to my worst enemy. Oh, um, oh, Sarah, have mercy in being murdered. You'll bleed me to death, as she feels the blood trickling down her thighs. Sir Eyre. You're too bad to be easily killed. Why don't you confess, you wicked creature? Then turning to Mrs. Mansell, don't you think, ma'am? She's got too many things on. I am not given to cruelty, but this is a case requiring greater severity than usual. Mrs. Mansell, shall we reduce her to her chemise and drawers, so you can administer the extreme penalty? Sir, eh, uh, yes, yes. It will give a little time to recover my breath. And she's taken all the strength out of me. We now strip all her petticoats off and undo her stays, fully displaying the large, fine, plump globes of her splendid bosom. With their pretty pink nipples, then she is fastened up again and stands with her wrists fastened well above her head. She has her fawn-colored kid gloves and the net, as usual, up to her elbows, so as to set off her arms and hands to the best advantage. She has nothing but chemise and drawers to hide her fine figure. But before commencing again, the general orders the latter to be entirely removed and her chemise to be pinned up to the shoulders, then turning to me. He said, Rosa, my dear, it's all through that wicked young woman you have been punished. I don't wish to teach anyone to revenge themselves, but as Mrs. Mansell is hardly well enough and I am in want of a little more rest. I think you could take this whip, handing me a fine lady's switch, with a little piece of knotted cord at the end. There, you know how to use it, don't spare any part of her bottom or thighs. This was just what I had been longing for, but did not like to volunteer, with a glance of triumph towards poor Jane, who was gradually getting over her own punishment. And beginning to take interest in what was going forward, I took the whip and placed myself in position to commence. What a beautiful sight my victim presented. Her splendid, plump back, loins and buttocks fully exposed to view, whilst the red-wheeled flesh of her bottom, smeared with blood, contrasted so nicely with her snow-white belly in front, ornamented on the Mons Vendivi with a profusion of soft curly hair of a light sandy color, and her legs being fixed widely apart, I could see her pink bottom hole, and the pouting lips of her cunny just underneath further down stretched, the splendid expanse of her well-developed thighs. As white as her belly then, she was also dressed in crimson silk stockings, pretty garters and fawn-colored slippers to match her gloves. My blood seemed to boil at the sight of so much loveliness, which I longed to cut into ribbons of wheeled flesh and blood. Sarah, air. Go on, Rosie. What makes you so slow to begin? You can't do too much to such an obstinate theme. Try and make her beg Jane's pardon. Rosa Dot. She looks very nice. But I'm afraid the whip will cut her up so, Grandfather. Now, Jemima, I'm going to begin. Does that hurt you? Giving her a light cut on her tender thighs, where the tip of the whip left a very plain red mark. Jemima Dot Ein. Oh. Oh. Miss Rosa. Be merciful. 
I've never been unkind to you. How nicely I rode you on my back when you were punished. Rosa. Khan. Yes. And enjoyed the fun all the time. You cruel thing. You knew what I was getting. But I could tell you were delighted to horse me. Giving three or four smart cuts across her loins. And registering every blow with a fine, angry-looking wheel. There. 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 Ask my pardon, and Jane's pardon for your threats. Will you box her ears, will you? Cutting sharply at every question in some unexpected part. No two strokes follow each other in the same place. Victim. Da. Ara. Have mercy. I was sorry for you, Miss Rosie. Oh. You're as hard as Sir Eyre. You'll cut me to pieces with that whip. She sobs out her face crimson with the conflicting emotions of fear, rage, and obstinacy. Rosa, dot toll. Now, Jemima, your only chance is to beg our pardon and confess your crime. You know you did it. You know you did it. You obstinate wench, cutting the flesh in every direction and making the blood flow freely all down the thighs onto her stockings. The victim writhes and shrieks with pain at every blow, but refuses to admit her fault or beg pardon. The sight of her suffering seemed to nerve my arm and add to my excitement. The blood seemed delicious in my eyes, and I gradually worked myself up so that I felt such gushing, thrilling sensations as to quite overcome me. The whip was dropped in exhaustion, and I sank back on a seat in a kind of lethargic stupor, yet quite conscious of all that was going on. Sir Eyre, yeah. why Rosie? I thought you were stronger than that. Poor thing. Your punishment was too much for you. Ill. Finish. The culprit. If she won't confess, she must be executed, that's all. Snatching up another whip, much heavier than the one I had used, and with three tips of cord on the end. You won't confess, won't you, you obstinate wicked creature? My blood boils when I think how I punished the other two innocent girls he exclaimed, cutting her fearfully on the calves of her legs, knocking the delicate silk of the stockings to pieces, and wheeling and bruising her legs all over. The victim cannot plunge about as her ankles are fastened, but she moans with agony and shrieks and sobs hysterically in turns at this terrible attack. The general seems beside himself with rage, for he next turns to her beautiful white shoulders and slashes them about fearfully cutting through the skin and deluging poor Jemima with her own blood. Sir Eyre, I shall murder her. I can't help it, she's made me quite mad. His cuts wind round her ribs and even wheel the beauties of her splendid bosom and stains the snowy belly with their blood. Yemama, in low broken sobs. Oh, and, ow, oh, mercy, let me die. Don't torture an innocent thing like me any longer. She seems going to faint when Mrs. Mansell interposes, saying it is enough more may do serious injury. Sir Eyre gasping for breath. Oh, oh, Taidiaia, I know you are right to take me away, or I shall really murder her. The bleeding victim is a pitiable and terrible sight. As we release her from the ladder, she is scarcely able to stand her boots, covered with blood and little pools of thief. Zanguinius fluids stand on the floor, and we had to administer a cordial before she was able to be supported to her room, where she was confined to her bed for several days. I had now had all the revenge I was so anxious to inflict, but the great avenger of all, to my great grief, soon removed poor old grandfather from this world, and left me indeed an orphan. Being still very young, my guardians under Sir Ayres were placed me at Miss Flabum's academy to finish my education, and the old home was broken up, and inmates scattered. I shall send you some of my school experiences in my next, and remain. Dear Nelly, yours affectionately, Rosa Belinda Coote. To be continued. Pray, Mama said Sally. What's the meaning of hush? My dear, said Mama, what makes you ask such a question? Because I asked Fanny what made her belly stick out so, and she answered, 
Hush, Charlie Collingwood's Flogging, by Antoniensis. Seventeen years of age, with round limbs and broad shoulders, tall, rosy, and fair. And all over his forehead and temples, a forest of curly red hair. Good in the playing fields, good on the water, or in it, this lad. But at sums, or at themes, or at verses, oh, Ain't Charlie Collingwood back? Six days out of seven, or five at the least, has sent up to be stripped. But it's nuts for the lower boys always to see Charlie Collingwood whipped. For the marks of the birch on his bottom are more than the leaves on a tree. And a bum that has worn so much birch out as Charlie's is jolly to see. When his shirt is turned up and his breeches unbuttoned hang down to his heels, from the small of his back, to the thick of his thighs is one mass of red wheels. Ted Beauchamp last year began keeping a list of his floggings, and he says, They come in a year and a half, to a hundred and sixty, and three. And you see how this morning, in front of the flogging block, silent he stands, and hitches his waistband up slightly, and feels his backside with his hands. Then he lifts his blue eyes to the face of the master nor shrinks at his frown, nor at sight of the birch, nor at sound of the sentence of judgment, go down. Not a word, Charlie Collingwood says, not a syllable, piteous or pert, but goes down with his breeches unbuttoned. And Arrington takes up his shirt. And again, we can see his great naked red bottom, round, fleshy, and plump. And the bystanders look from the master's red rod to the schoolboy's, Red rump. There are wheels over wheels. There are stripes upon stripes. There are cuts after cuts. All across Ch Charlie Collingwood's bottom, and isn't the sight of it nuts? There, that cut on the fleshiest part of the buttocks, high up on the right. He got that before supper last evening. Oh, isn't his bottom a sight? And that scar that's just healed. Don't you see where the birch cut the flesh? That's a token of Charlie's last flogging. The rod will soon stamp it afresh. And this morning, you saw he could hardly sit down or be quiet in church. S. A pleasure to see Charlie's bottom. It looks just cut out for the birch. Now look out, Master Charlie. It's coming you won't get off this time, by God. For your master's in oh such a wax. And has picked you out. Oh, such a rod. Such a jolly good rod, with the buds on so stout, and so supple and lithe. You've a been flogged till you're hardened to flogging, but won't the first cut make you writhe? You've a been birched till you say you don't care as you used for a birching. Indeed. Wait a bit, Master Charlie. I'll bet the third cut, or the fourth, makes you bleed. Though they say a boy's bottom grows harder with whipping, and times make it tough. Yet the sturdiest boy's bottom will wince if the schoolmaster whips it enough. Aye, the stoutest posteriors will redden and flinch from the cuts as they come. If they're flogged half as hard as the master will flog Charlie Collingwood's bum, we shall see a real jolly good swishing, as good as a fellow could wish. Here's a stunning good rod and a jolly big bottom just under its swish. Oh, by Jove, he's drawn blood at the very first cut. In two places by God. Aye. And Charlie's red bottom grows redder all over with marks of the rod. And the pain of the cut makes his burning posteriors quiver and he. And has hiding his face eyes by Jove. And is wiping his eyes on his sleeve. Now give it him well, sir. Lay into him well. Till the pain makes him roar. Flog him then till he stops. And then flog him again. Till he bellows once more. Ah, Charlie, my boy, you don't mind it, eh, do you? It's nothing to bear. Though a small boy may cry for a flogging, that's natural. But Charlie don't care. That's right, sir, don't spare him. That cut was a stinger. But Charlie don't mind. All the rods in the kingdom would only be wasted on Charlie's behind. At each cut, how the red flesh rises. The red wheels tingle and swell. How he blushes! 
I told you the master would flog Charlie Collingwood well. There are long red ridges and furrows across his great broad nether cheeks, and on both his plump, rosy, round buttocks, the blood stands in drops and in streaks. Well hit, sir. Well caught. How he drew in his bottom and flinched from the cut. At each touch of the birch on his bum. How the smart makes it open and shut. Well struck, sir, again how it made the blood spin. There's a drop on the floor. Each long, fleshy furrow grows ruddy. And Charlie can bear it no more. Blood runs from each wheel on his bottom. And all Charlie's bottom is wheeled. Twill be many a day ere the scars of this flogging are thoroughly healed. Now just under the hollow of Charlie's bare back, where the flanks are aslope, the rod catches and stings him, and now at the point where the downward ways open, round his flanks now like serpents, the burshen twigs twining bend round as they bite, and you see on his naked white belly red ridges, where all was so white, where between his white thighs something hairy the body's division reveals. Folds the next cut, and now Charlie Collingwood's bottom is all over wheels. Not a twig on the rod, but has raised a red ridge on his flesh, not a bud, but has drawn from his naked and writhing posteriors a fresh drop of blood. And the schoolmaster warms to his work now, as harder and harder he hits, and picks out the most sensitive places, as though he'd cut Charlie to bits. So yo, fidget and whisper in school time and make a disturbance in church? Can't sit still, Master Charlie. Eh, can't you? Well, what do you think of the birch? Oh, it hurts you so, does it, my boy? To sit down. Since I flogged you last night, it was that made you fidget all church time. Indeed, you can't help it, please God. By the help of the birch, Master Charlie, it'll teach you to help it, please God. If you don't mend your manners in future, it shan't be for want of a rod. You're a big boy, no doubt, to be flogged the more shame for you, sir, at your age. But as long as you're here, I, I shall flog you. He lays on the cuts in a rage. I, and if you were older and bigger, you'd come to the flogging block still. Boys are never too big to be beaten. He lays on the birch with a will. If a boy's not too old to go wrong, sir, he can't be too old to be whipped. So take that, and he lays on the rod, till the twigs all with crimson are tipped. There are drops of the boy's blood visible now, on each tender young bud. Blood has dropped on his trousers, and Charlie's bare bottom is covered with blood. But I'd rather be shut up for days, in a hole you would scarce put a dog in, and brought out once a day to be birched than have missed Charlie Collingwood's flogging. How each cut brings the blood to his forehead and makes him bite half through his lips. How the birch cuts his bottom right over and makes the blood spin from his hips. How his brawny bare haunches, all bloody and wheeled with red furrows like ruts, shrink quivering with pain at each stroke that revives all the smart of past cuts how the schoolmaster seems to hit harder, the birch to sting more at each blow, till at last Charlie Collingwood, writhing with agony, bellows out, oh! That was all not a word of petition, a single short cry, and no more. And the younger boys laugh, that the birch should have made such a big fellow roar. For a moment, the master too pauses, but not for a truce or a parley. Then the birch falls afresh, on the bloody wheeled flesh with take that, Master Charlie. All the small boys are breathless and hushed, but they hear not a syllable come. They hear only the swish of the birch, as it meets Charlie Collingwood's bum. And the master's face flushes with anger. He signs to Fred Fame with a nod, and Freddy reluctantly hands him another stout, supple birch rod. And again, as he flogs Charlie Collingwood's bottom, his face seems aflame. At each cut he reminds him of this thing or that, and rebukes him by name. Each cut makes the boy's haunches quiver, and scores them all over afresh. You can trace where each separate birch twig has marked Charlie Collingwood's flesh, till the master, tired out with hard work, 
and quite satiate with flogging for once. With one last cut, that stings to the quick, bids him rise for an obstinate dunce. From the block Charlie Collingwood rises, red-faced, and with tumbled red hair, and with crimson-hued bottom, and tearful blue eyes, and a look of don't care. Then he draws up his breeches, and walks out of school with a crowd of boys dogging. The heels of their hero, all proud to have seen Charlie Collingwood's flogging. Denise Tor. Jack, my boy, what a devil of an appetite you have this morning, said one friend to another as they were breakfasting at their hotel. And so would you, replied Jack. If you had only had a whore's tongue and a toothbrush in your mouth since yesterday. Madame Rowland had three monkeys, of which one was a she and the lady used to amuse herself with watching their tricks. It is curious, said she, to observe them, for while one of them is caressing the other, the third comforts himself. Her expression was suffices for himself. Meaning, ma of course, Lady Polkingham, or they all do it. Giving an account of her luxurious adventures, both before and after her marriage with Lord Crimconaw. Part 2. Tao, Dayand. Continued. Christmas came, and with it arrived several visitors, all young ladies and gentlemen of about our own ages, to spend the festive season with us, our entire party consisted of five gentlemen and seven ladies. Leaving out the aunt who was too old to enter into youthful fun and contented herself with being a faithful housekeeper and keeping good house, so that after supper every evening, we could do almost as we liked myself, and Alice soon converted our five young lady friends into tribe aides like ourselves, ready for anything, whilst Frederick prepared his young male friends. New Year's Day was his eighteenth birthday, and we determined to hold a regular orgy that night in our corridor, with Lucy's help. Plenty of refreshments were laid in stock, ices, sandwiches, and champagne. The aunt strictly ordered us all to retire at 1 a.m., at latest, so we kept her commands. After spending a delicious evening in dancing and games, which only served to flush us with excitement for what all instinctively felt would be a most voluptuous entertainment upstairs. The aunt was a heavy sleeper, and rather deaf, besides which Frederick, under the excuse of making them drink his health, plied the servants first with beer, then with wine, and afterwards with just a glass of brandy for a nightcap, so that we were assured they would also be sound enough. In fact, Two or three never got to bed at all. Frederick was master of the ceremonies with Alice as a most useful assistant. As I said before, all were flushed with excitement and ready for anything they were all of the most aristocratic families, and our blue blood seemed fairly to course through our veins. When all had assembled in Alice's apartment, they found her attired in a simple long chemise de nuit. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, I believe we are all agreed for an out-and-out, -out, romp you see my costume. How do you like it? And a most wicked smile. I hope it does not display the contour of my figure too much, drawing it tightly about her so, as to show the outline of her beautiful buttocks, and also displaying a pair of ravishing legs in pink silk stockings. Bravo! Bravo! Bravo, Alice! We will follow your example burst from all sides. Each one skipped back to his or her room, and reappeared in mufti. But the tails of the young gentleman's shirts caused a deal of laughter by being too short. Alice. Well, I'm sure. Gentlemen, I did not think your undergarments were so indecently short. Frederick, with a laugh, caught hold of his sister's chemise, and tore a great piece off all around, so that she was in quite a short smock, which only half covered her fair bottom. Alice was crimson with blushes, and half inclined to be angry. But recovering herself, she laughed. Ah! Fred, what a shame to serve me so. But I don't mind if you make us all alike. The girls screamed, and the gentlemen made a rush. It was a most exciting scene. The young ladies retaliated by tearing the shirts of their tormentors. And this first skirmish only ended when the whole company were reduced to a complete state of nudity, 
All were in blushes as they gazed upon the variety of male and female charms exposed to view. Frederick advancing with a bumper of champagne. We've all heard of Nuda Veritas. Now let's drink to her health the first time we are in her company. I'm sure she will be most charming and agreeable. All joined in this toast. The wine inflamed our desires. There was not a male organ present, but what was in a glorious state of erection. Alice. Look, ladies, what a lot of impudent fellows. They need not think we are going to surrender anyhow to their youthful lust. They shall be all blindfolded. And then we will arm ourselves with good birch rods. Then let it be everyone for themselves and Cupid's dart for us all. Here, here, responded on all sides, and handkerchiefs were soon tied over their eyes, and seven good birch rods handed round to the ladies. Now, gentlemen, catch who you can, laughed Alice, slashing right and left into the manly group, her example being followed by the other girls the room. Was quite large enough and a fine romp ensued. The girls were as lithe and active as young fawns, and for a long time sorely tried the patience of their male friends, who tumbled about in all directions, only to get an extra dose of birch on their plump posteriors before they could regain their feet. At last, the humble Miss Vavazor stumbled over a prostrate gentleman, who happened to be the young Marquis of Bucktown, who grasped her firmly round the waist, and clung to his prize as a shower of cuts greeted the riding pair. Hold, hold, cried Alice. She's fairly caught and must submit to be offered as a victim on the altar of love. Lucy quickly wheeled a small soft couch into the center of the room. The gentlemen pulled off their bandages and all laughingly assisted to place the pair in position the lady. Underneath with a pillow under her buttocks and the young Marquis on his knees, fairly planted between her thighs. Both were novices. But a more beautiful couple it would be impossible to conceive he was a fine young fellow of seventeen, with dark hair and eyes, whilst her brunette style of complexion was almost a counterpart of his their eyes were similar also, and his instrument, as well as her cunny, were finely ornamented with soft curly black hair with the skin drawn back. The fiery purple head of his cup looked like a large ruby, as, by Frederick's suggestion, he presented it to her luscious-looking vermilion gap the lips of which were just slightly open, as she lay with her legs apart. The touch seemed to electrify her. The blushing face turned to a still deeper crimson, as the dart of love slowly entered the outworks of her virginity. Fred continued to act as mentor, by whispering in the young gallant's ear, who also was covered with blushes, but feeling his steed fairly in contact with the throbbing matrix of the lovely girl beneath him. He at once plunged forward to the attack, pushing, shoving, and clasping her round the body with all his strength, whilst he tried to stifle her cries of pain by gluing his lips to hers. It was a case of veni, vidi, vici. His onset was too impetuous to be withstood, and she lay in such a passive, favorable position that the network of her hymen was broken at the first charge, and he was soon in full possession up to the roots of his hair. He rested a moment. She opened her eyes, and with a faint smile said, Ah! It was indeed sharp. But I can already begin to feel the pleasures of love. Go on now, dear boy. Our example will soon fire the others to imitate us. Heaving up her bottom as a challenge, and pressing him fondly to her bosom, they ran a delightful course, which filled us all with voluptuous excitement, and as they died away in a mutual spend, someone put out the lights. All was laughing confusion. Gentlemen trying to catch a prize. Kissing and sighing. I felt myself seized by a strong arm. A hand groped for my cunny, whilst a whisper in my ear said how delightful. It's you, dear little Beatrice. I can make a mistake, as yours is the only hairless thing in the company. Kiss me, dear. In bursting to be into your tight little affair. Lips met lips in a luscious kiss. We found ourselves close to Alice's bed. My companion put me back on it, and taking my legs under his arms, was soon pushing his way up my longing cunny. I nipped him as tightly as possible he was in ecstasies, and spent almost directly. But keeping his place, he put me, by his vigorous action, 
into a perfect frenzy of love. Spend seemed to follow spend, till we had each of us done it six times, and the last time I so forgot myself as to fairly bite his shoulder in delight. At length he withdrew, without telling his name. The room was still in darkness, and love engagements were going on all around. I had two more partners after that, but only one go with each. I shall never forget that night as long as a breath remains in my body. Next day I found out, through Fred, that Charlie Vavasour had been my first partner, and that he himself believed he had had his sister in the Malay. What she afterwards admitted to me was a fact, although she thought he did not know it, and the temptation to enjoy her brother was too much for her. This orgy has been the means of establishing a kind of secret society amongst the circle of our friends. Anyone who gives a pressure of the hand and asks, do you remember? Fred's birthday is free to indulge in love with those who understand it, and I have since been present at many repetitions of that birthday fun. Part 3 Dight We returned to school, and I kept up a regular correspondence with Frederick, the letters to and fro being enclosed in those of Alice. Time crept on, but as you can imagine as well or better than I can relate all the kinds of salacious amusements we girls used to indulge in, I shall skip over the next few years till... I arrived at the age of seventeen. My guardians were in a hurry to present me at court, and have me brought out in hopes that I might soon marry and relieve them of their trust. Alice was so attached to me that since my first visit to her home, she had solicited her aunt to arrange with my guardians for my permanent residence with her during my minority, which quite fell in with their views, as it enabled me to see more society and often meet gentlemen who might perhaps fall in love with my pretty face. Lady St. Jerome undertook to present both Alice and myself, she was an aunt, and mentioned in her letter that unfortunately a star of the first magnitude would also be presented at the same drawing room. But still, we might have a faint chance of picking up young Lothair, the great matrimonial prize of the season, if he did not immediately fall in love with the beautiful Lady Corazon and that we should meet them both at Creasy House, at the Duchess Ball, in celebration of the presentation of her favorite daughter, for which she had obtained invitations for us. For nearly three weeks, we were in a flutter of excitement, making the necessary preparations for our debut. My mother's jewels were reset to suit the fashion of the day, and every three or four days we went to town to see our court milliner. In company with Alice and her aunt, we arrived at Lord St. Jerome's town residence in St. James Square. The evening before the eventful day, her ladyship was a most charming person of about thirty. Without family, who introduced us before dinner to her niece, Miss Claire Arundel, Father Coleman, the family confessor, and Monsignor Berwick, the Chamberlain of Pio Nono. The dinner was exquisite, and we passed a delightful evening, amused by the quiet humor of the confessor and the sparkling wit of Monsignor, who seemed to studiously avoid religious subjects. Miss Arundel, with her beautiful, pensive, violet eyes and dark brown golden hair, seemed particularly fascinated by the sallies of the latter, whilst there was a something remarked by both Alice and myself— which led us to suspect the existence of some curious tie between the two ecclesiastics and the ladies of the household. Lord St. Jerome was not in town. At our special request, Alice and myself shared the same room, which opened into a spacious corridor, at one end of which was a small chapel or oratory. Our minds were so unsettled by the thoughts of the morrow, and also hopes of meeting some of our old friends in town, especially the Vavazors. That sleep was quite banished from our eyes. Suddenly Alice started up in bed with... There's someone moving about the corridor. She sprang out of bed and softly opened our door, whilst I followed and stood close behind her. They're gone into the oratory, she said. I saw a figure just in the act of passing in. I will know what is going on. We can easily slip into some of the empty rooms. If we hear anyone coming... So saying, she put on her slippers and threw a shawl over her shoulders, and I followed her example ready for any kind of adventure. We cautiously advanced along the corridor. Soon we arrived at the door of the oratory, and could hear several low voices inside. 
but were afraid to push the door ajar for fear of being observed. Kush, whispered Alice. I was here when quite a little girl. And now remember that old lady St. Jerome, who's been dead some time, used to use this room next to the chapel and had a private entrance made for herself direct from the room into the oratory. If we can get in there, she said, turning the handle, we shall be in a fine place to see everything, as the room is never used and said to be haunted by the old lady. The door yielded to her pressure, and we slipped into a gloomy room, just able to see a little by the light of the moon. To be continued. A taste for foreigners. Imitated. From Marshall. To the French. To the Germans and Swedes. Easy, Harriet. You give up your charms. Italians and Russians, besides. Have all had their turns in your arms. You despise not the Dutch, nor the Danes. Mulattoes or Negroes or Finns. In you they may all quench their flames. Whatever the tint of their skins, you reject the capless concerns, or the circumcised Turk or the Jew. In short, every nation by turns has had an in you. Your fancy is truly uncommon. The reason I wish I could find, while by birth you're a true Englishwoman, that no true English pricks to your mind. Adultery's the go, a song before the time of the new divorce court. When we were boys, the world was good. But that is long ago. Now, all the wisest folks are lewd. For adulteries, the go. The go, the go, the go. Adulteries, the go. Quite tired of leading virtuous lives. Though spotless as the snow. Among the chaste and pious wives. Adulteries, the go. The go, the go, the go. C. Long life then to the House of Lords. They know a thing or two. You see from all their grand awards. That adultery's the go. The go, the go, the go. See, and Lady Barlow, Mrs. Hare, Case Clark, and Boulders, Teed, Ashton, James, and all declare. Adultery's the go. The go, the go, the go. See, some husbands still are jealous, and guard the fur below. But spite such prudish fellows, adulteries the go. The go, the go, the go. See, horn cuckolds were mad raging balls, a century ago. Now, they're tame oxen, silly fools. For adulteries the go. The go, the go, the go. C. Then hey for doctor's commons, with horned beasts a row, for man's delight and woman's. Adultery's the go, her very soul. On Sundays, in a church like this, I joy to face the blushing miss. I with an eye, agog for bliss, through touching not, I only kiss. Her very soul, her very soul. She falls at once into my plan. I guess she prays behind her fan. Oh, for a man, a real man, to satiate as he only can. Her very soul, her very soul. Heavens, what a glance. See her suck and lick her lips on fire for call. I see her frisky bottom buck while with the prick of lust I fuck her very soul. Her very soul. First Rondo. Ten years ago, on Christmas Day. Fair Helen stole my heart away. I went to church, but not to pray. Ten years ago. To pray? Yes. Pray to Helen's eyes. Ah. Would that we had been more wise. Today, she would not recognize. Him whom she kissed in ecstasies. Ten years ago. Second Rondo. Again. We've met. And now I find her still more luscious to my mind. She was not to such pranks inclined ten years ago, though now a second time she's wed. Hers is a most lascivious bed. Though thirty years she now has sped, she f still better than she did ten years ago. Lines written under her portrait. Such Helen was, 
religious, young, and fair, a faithful spouse, and blessed with babies dear. But in the church, while week by week, she prayed, an amorous, noble, long, her charms surveyed, Sunday by Sunday, seated near her pew. He kept the goddess of his heart in view. And when the tenth command was duly read, I covet thee, his burning glances said. Her humble rank forbade acquaintance free, yet high enough it was to guard her modesty. Her husband was a gamester, fierce and rude. He fled the town, and other loves pursued. She on her jointure fair remained at home, close guarded by his mother and her own. Two months at church, she stood the siege of sighs. Silence, that spoke, and eloquence of eyes. Could virtue longer last? At length, she fell. No more, no more, can happy lovers tell. And mark the sequel. Rashly she had sworn. She near would to her faithless lord return. Her prudent lover urged a course more wise. His vigor had more force than his advice. She would not listen till her swelling zone proved his kind counsel wiser than her own. Just at that juncture, her good man returned. In time to adopt the babe, that proves him horned. The wedding ring upon her hand, you see, is not her wedding ring. T'was given by me. The one her husband gave her. Here, here, the hole. Around my finger wreathes its hallowed gold. Her diamond brooch and clasps all brightly shine. His gifts indeed, the locks they hold are mine. Far, far away. I now her absence mourn. Grant me, O Venus, grant a quick return. Keep Helen virtuous, till again we meet. And revel in the bliss so naughty and so sweet. Up the chimney. When Captain Jones of Halifax. Thus put in winter quarters. His landlady. A widow had. The prettiest of daughters. The captain sued her lovingly. The girl was gay and ready. To join her lot with his. And be. The noble captain's lady. Their wedding was deferred but soon. Impatient for the pleasure. He found his way into her room and swived her at his leisure. The chambermaid, who set to rights, the different pots and pans, warned mistress. It was near a drop, in that of this young man's. The mother asked him tenderly, As you're to wed my daughter, pray, tell me why, my dear young man, why, why you make no water? Ah, madam, cried he, cannot you, the real reason guess. The fact is that I go to bed, so full of tenderness. I get eager for the bliss. I feel so stiff and hot that really I'm obliged to piss. Right up the chimney pot. In the wars in India, in the year 1800, Major Torrance's party was pursuing some of the enemy. One day, while they were dining in very merry, a sergeant came and reported to the major that two prisoners were brought in, one old and one young. The sergeant requested orders regarding them. The major merrily answered, Oh, take them away and frig them. The sergeant retired. In an hour he returned and respectfully made this report, Please, your honor, we have frigged the young one. But we can't make the old man's stand. This story was related to me in 1818 by Torrens, who was then an old general at Madras. Nursery Rhymes there was a young lady of Harrow, who complained that her cut was too narrow. For times without number, chew you is a cucumber, but could not accomplish a marrow. There was a young lady of Glasgow, and fondly her lover did ask, Oh, pray allow me a fuck. But she said, No, my da, but you may, if you please, up my arse, go. There was a young man had the art of making a capital tart with a handful of shit, some snot and a spit, and head flavor the whole with a fart. There was an old man of Connaught, whose prick was remarkably short. When he got into bed, the old woman said, This isn't a prick, it's a wart. There was a gay countess of Bray, and you may think it odd when I say, that in spite of high station, rank and education, 
She always spelt c with a K. There was an old parson of Lundy. Fell asleep in his vestry on Sunday. He awoke with a scream. What? Another wet dream? This comes of not frigging since Monday. There was a strong man of drum rig, who one day did seven times frig. He buggered three sailors, four Jews and two tailors, and ended by f pig. There was an old man of the mountain, who frigged himself into a fountain. Fifteen times had he spent. Still he wasn't content. He simply got tired of the counting. There was a young man of Nantucket, who went down a well in a bucket. The last words he spoke, before the rope broke, where are so you bugger and suck it. A native of Havre de Grace, once tired of cunt, said Il Triars. He unfolded his plan to another young man, who said most decidedly my arse. At the parish church, South Hackney, by the Reverend C. A. White, John Henry Bottomfelt, of Hamburg, to Sarah Jane Greens, of South Hackney. VD Daily Telegraph, January 3rd, 1875. How lovely everything now seems, when joined in one by Hyman's belt. For now John Henry has his greens, and Sarah Jane her bottom felt. Table of contents. Subumbra, or sport among the shan noodles. Miss Coote's confession, or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. Young, beginners. An epistle to a lady. Lady Pokingham, or they all do it. Song. The reverie. A maiden's wish. The joys of coming together. Nursery rhymes. Table of contents. Subumbra, or sport among the shenoodles. Miss Coote's confession, or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. The spell of the rod. The state's new duty. Lady Pokingham, or they all do it. A black Joseph. Into the bargain. Origin of copulation. Taking a maidenhead. Epitaph. The triumph of science over physic. Song. Gone to caca. The patience of... Jaw. Latest sporting use. Nursery rhymes. Table of contents. Subumbra, or sport among the shenoodles. Miss Coote's confession. Or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. The budding rose, Mrs. Dots, Lady Pokingham, or they all do it. The other way, two extraordinary letters, fables and maxims, cunt on cooperative principles, characters of husbands, before, aster, conundrum, nursery rhymes, table of contents, subumbra, or a sport among the Shenhoodles. A copy of a letter. Aoi. Tell. The Swing. Miss Coote's Confession. Or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. Pleasures of memory. The trial of Captain Powell. Fowls and pickled pork. Lady Pokingham. Or they all do it. Progress. Expostulation with a fierce preacher. Hymn to the genius of woman. Table of contents. La Rose d'Amour. Strictly private, except to brothers by order the Lady Freemason. Fables and maxims. Miss Coote's confession, or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. Lady Pokingham, or they all do it. Subumbra, or sport among the Shen Oodles. The Ananda No. Temptation. A sensible woman. Table of contents. La Rose d'Amour. A fact. An adventure with a tribade related in a letter from a young lady to her sister. Ten little niggers. Miss Coote's confession, or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. The fruits of philosophy. The columbine. Lady Pokingham, are they all do it. An answer to a queer question. Song. Caution to ladies. Rouge et noir. Table of contents. La Rose d'Amour. Sally's mistake. Pleasures afar. Discovery of the longitude. Miss Coote's confession. Or the voluptuous experiences of an old maid. Lady Pokingham. Or they all do it. The arithmetician. A fact. Table of contents. 
La Rose d'Amour, Frank Fane, a ballad. My grandmother's tale or May's account of her introduction to the art of love. Lady Pokingham, or they all do it. It has been suggested that this work be split into multiple pages. If you'd like to help, please review the style guidelines and help pages. La Rose d'Amour, or The Adventures of a Gentleman in Search of Pleasure. Translated from the French. Continued. In the course of a few weeks, a vessel arrived in the creek, laden with furniture for the chateau, and the upholsterer presented himself to me. I took him through the building, showing him in what style I wished such and such rooms furnished. The room of fountains was simply furnished with cushions of rich satin and silk, and musical instruments, as I intended, it merely for smoking, singing, and dancing. The other long room opposite was furnished with bedsteads of finest rosewood, inlaid with gold, silver, pearl, and even precious stones. Each bed had springs placed in it, and was stuffed with the finest down. The sheets were cambric of the finest texture, coverlets of silks and satins, beautifully worked, while over all was a spread of brussels or point lace. The curtains were of crimson velvet, set off with white silk. In the alcove of each bed was placed a mirror, set in frames of silver. The floor was covered with the richest carpets, the walls were hung with silk, on which were worked the loves of Cupid and Psyche, Ray of Europa, Leda, ravished by Jupiter in the shape of a swan, Diana issuing from the bath, a procession of naked female bacchanalians carrying the jolly gods in triumph on their shoulders, and other devices. Instead of chairs and sofas there were cushions placed in the room, worked with pearls and precious stones, bordered with fringe of pure bullion. Each bed stood on a raised dais of mahogany. The carpets were of the richest texture, so soft and thick that the foot sank ankle deep in them. At one end of the chamber was a state bed. It was partitioned off from the other parts of the room by a curtain of blue velvet. This apartment was furnished as a Turkish tent. The drapery of green velvet depended from a centerpiece of gold stars and was drawn down to the sides so as to form a perfect tent. The bed stood in the center of the place. It was made of beautifully carved cedar from Lebanon the posts. Head and footboards were ornamented with designs of birds, fishes, men and women, sea, of pure gold and silver, set with precious stones. Curtains of richly wrought velvet, looped up with chains of gold, completed the coup de whale. I had placed no ornament in this apartment, so it was designed as an initiatory bed for all the beauties I could bring to the place. And although licentious pictures, statutes, see, may have an exhilarating effect upon men at times, they also, by their beauty, attract the attention from the dear creatures we might be enjoying. Adjoining this large bedchamber furnished one as a dressing room. The walls and ceiling were inlaid with large plate mirrors, making the room one complete looking glass. At the sides, overhead, no matter where they might look, whosoever entered it could see nothing but their reflection. Here were placed stands and toilette table, of chased gold and silver, ivory, and pearl all the perfumes of the East, all the cosmetics that could enhance the beauty and give youth and fullness to those who inhabited the place, were here in profusion. Adjoining the room of glasses was a drawing room which looked out on the garden. The doors and windows opened onto a balcony, running the full length of that side of the castle. To this room I paid more attention than to any other. The floor was covered with a carpet of purple velvet, stuffed with down. The rarest productions of the old masters adorned the walls, mirrors, Framed in gold, depending from the beaks of birds wrought in silver, hung between the paintings. In each corner of the room stood a statue of one of the graces, in the bodies of which were set music boxes, made to discourse the sweetest music. On stands of alabaster were large vases, chef's d'oeuvre of Dresden manufacture, containing sweet-smelling flowers, while the richest spices and perfumes of Araby, Burning in censers entirely concealed in niches in the wall, diffused through the room odors that enchanted the senses. Here it was that I received my mistresses after all the rooms were furnished. During the time the workmen were busy arranging the rooms and furniture, 
I had kept them in a distant wing of the chateau, refusing to see them till everything was finished. I had secured the services of a dozen or more lusty fellows and wenches, to serve as servants and guards to those I might wish to detain. One of the men I made the servant of the bedchamber, so called, as he was the only male I allowed in this part of the castle. Him I sent to bring to me a la Rose Damer, and the voluptuous Russian, with Rose, Manette, and Marie. When they entered I was reclining on a pile of cushions, dressed in a loose robe of rich cashmere, with a Turkish cap on my head, ready prepared for a bath, to which I intended to take them. So soon as the door was closed on them they ran up, and falling on me, devoured me with embraces and kisses. Oh, how they caught fire at the touch of me, and burned for that which I had kept them for more than a month. Whilst I could scarcely restrain myself from throwing them on the floor, and darting the liquid flame of love into them at once. But I restrained myself. I took them into the garden of flowers, and showed them all my improvements there. The beautiful little lake surrounded with shrubs and trees, over the whole surface of which was a net of fine wire, which confined a quantity of rare birds. Again we entered the chateau, and passed through to the bedchamber, where I showed them the fifty beds telling them I intended to travel till I had procured fifty of the handsomest women in the world to lay in them. From this we passed on to the bathing room, and throwing off all covering, plunged into the perfumed waters. After laying and wantoning in the bath for some time, I pulled the tassel of a bell, and four of the wenches I before mentioned entered to serve as waiting maids. We emerged from the water, and they dried our bodies and hair, and giving us loose gowns, we wrapped ourselves in them, and I led my beauties to the dressing room. I cannot depict their astonishment on entering this apartment of mirrors. Taking their gowns, I threw them out of the door and closed it. I told them to dress in the rich clothes which lay before them. How great was their astonishment to see themselves reflected a thousand times in the walls and ceiling. The toilet stand seemed to be in every part of the room, and it was some time ere they could get over the confusion they were in, but with the help of one another they got dressed. The dresses I had provided for them were those used by the Turks wide, loose pants and vests of satin, and short skirts, instead of the unhandy long shift. After having dressed ourselves, I took them to the room of fountains where we had a rich lunch. Here I opened to them my views, telling them that after one more trip to Paris, as soon as the yacht arrived which I had ordered, I intended to sail for Constantinople where I would buy some of the most beautiful girls I could find, and also that I intended to purchase some mutes and eunuchs for my own harem, as I could not trust the females I might buy, and bring with me the same as I could the ones that were now around me. I told them I intended to take one or two of them with me in the vessel when I went, and that, to be perfectly fair and impartial, they should draw two, see who should be the lucky ones, and also that I intended to have two of them sleep with me that night, and they must draw for that at the same time. I had determined beforehand that I would sleep with Celestine and Caroline, and also that I would take them with me on my voyage, so I arranged the drawing that it came out as I wished. At an early hour I, I led the way to the bedroom, followed by the five girls. It took us but a moment to put ourselves in a state of nakedness. Oh, with what joy, what transports! I hugged their warm naked bodies to mine. How delightfully the soft, smooth, white skin of their bellies felt as they twined about in my arms. With what fervor did they fasten their moist, pouting lips to mine, devouring me with kisses, while their lustrous eyes sparkled and flashed with lustful fires. I draw the voluptuous Celestine to the bed. My passions are raised to the highest pitch. My prick has swelled almost to bursting. Its vermilion head stands erect against my belly, not to be bent without danger of breaking. Celestine is on her back, her thighs apart, showing the lips of her luscious cut slightly open, anxiously awaiting the attack. I precipitate myself upon her. I pierce her to the very quick. She screams with mingled pain and pleasure. The enormous head of my prick distends the folds and lips of her cut to their utmost stretch. The storm increases, everything trembles, the lightnings flash, the rain pours, it comes in torrents. I spend, I die. My God, what pleasure! 
Oh, heavens, have mercy. We rolled. We screamed. We bit. We yelled like demons from the excess of our pleasure. Her cut is a small lake of sperm. My prick swims in it, lolling its length. I draw it out, and the pearly liquid gushes forth, flooding her thighs and the sheets with the rich, mingled essence of our bodies. Ah, my charming Celestine, what an excess of exquisite pleasure did I experience whilst in your arms that night. Thrice did I, goaded by my fierce lusts, bedew the cut of my two noble mistresses with a deluge of the precious liquid, bountifully supplied by the stream of pleasure from love's reservoir. I recovered myself a little and paid a visit to Rose, Manette, and Marie, to each of whom I did justice, always advancing to the attack with head erect and flying colors. Nor did I leave one of them without having well oiled their precious little maws with the dear liquid that women are ever looking for. On the following morning, I started for Paris, accompanied by Caroline, dressed as a page, to finish my preparation for starting to Constantinople. After stopping at my hotel, I sallied out with my female page to call on Rosalie de C., whom I was lucky enough to find alone. Having embraced her, I introduced Caroline to her, asking when she would be ready to go with me. To the chateau, she replied that she would be ready in two days. I then inquired after her friend, the lovely Laura B. I told Rosalie that I was determined to possess her friend Laura by some means or other, and that she must render me her assistance in securing her. And as I could think of no other plan, I proposed to Rosalie that she should go and get her friend to take an airing with her in the Bois de Boulogne, and that in a sequestrated place I would come up with them, alight from my carriage, and invite her and Laura to get out and take a walk, and that I would then throw a shawl over Laura's head, force her into my own carriage, take herself and Caroline, and set out with all possible speed for the castle. Everything happened as I had arranged. On coming up with Rosalie in the wood, she accepted my invitation to walk. I opened the door of the carriage, and as Laura passed out first, just as she reached the ground, Rosalie from behind threw a large shawl over her head and drew the corners close around her neck so that her voice could not be heard. I caught her up in my arms and carried her into my own carriage. Rosalie and Caroline entered immediately, and I dashed off with my fair prize at the top speed of four fine horses. On the road to the chateau, I stopped at no houses but those of persons whom I had brought over to my own interest. Arrived at the place we stopped at for the night, I hurried with my companions into a large room prepared for us by a courier that I had sent in advance. Immediately after my arrival, supper was served. Dismissing all the attendants, I turned the key in the door, and for the first time since I had forced her into my carriage, I spoke to Laura. I told her of my unconquerable love for her, of the feelings that were aroused in my heart towards her. The first time that I saw her at Rosalie's house, and that then formed the determination of carrying her off to the chateau, that I was determined no one else should be possessed of so much beauty, nor revel in such charms as she possessed. I laid open to Laura all my plans. I informed her how I had fitted up the old castle, and for what purpose, telling her that she would there find Celestine's seat. One of her old companions, and that Rosalie was another who willingly accompanied me. I introduced her to Caroline Z, telling her rank, how I made a conquest of her, and her having linked her fortune with mine, and followed me to France. I dwelt at some length on the life of luxurious ease and pleasure we should lead at the chateau, expatiating on the endless joys and ecstasies of her living with me, in all the unrestrained liberty of intercourse. Rosalie and Caroline also spoke to her of the life of pleasure they led with me, describing to her, as well as they could, the extreme luxury of lying in a man's arms and being well fucked and used, all their powers of persuasion to induce her to go with them and me peaceably to the chateau. Laura from being at first very sulky, neither eating nor speaking to any of us, became somewhat mollified, so that she partook of the supper and answered questions put to her by my two mistresses. After the supper was removed, I called for wine, and while we sat talking and drinking, I took care to make the discourse. 
run principally upon one subject alone, that of love, and its natural consequences, the intercourse of the two sexes. Caroline and Rosalie were very useful auxiliaries, talking with the utmost abandon, stripping and dancing about over the floor, as the wine began to fly to their heads, uncovering their breasts, showing their bubbies, occasionally flirting up their petticoats, exhibiting a fine calf or knee, with other tricks, all of which tended to confuse the senses of the charming little Laura, who watched their movements all the while. I constantly plied her with wine till she became somewhat excited, and a little free, making remarks on the two girls who were tussling on the floor. I rang the bell and ordered a bottle of white brandy, which, as soon as it was brought in, I uncorked, and pouring out glasses of it invited my Russian to drink. She took up the glass, as did Rosalie, both declaring that Laura must drink with them. After some hesitation she took up the glass, and placing it to her lips, sipped a little of the liquor, and put it down. Caroline and Rosalie, for the purpose of inducing the charming Laura to drink freely of the brandy, drank glass after glass of it, till Laura, from sipping, began to toss off her glass as well as either of us. When I gave them the sign to retire for the night, Laura had become so intoxicated that she required the assistance of the other two to enable her to retire without staggering in her gait. After they had got into their bedchamber, I stripped myself perfectly naked, and Caroline having left the door slightly ajar. I stepped into the room, hiding myself behind a bed curtain. I observed the maneuvers of my two lovely pimps. They first undressed themselves stark naked, then did the same for the inebriated Laura, and then she stood in all her naked beauty before me, exhibiting charms to my ardent gaze, more lovely, if possible, than any I had heretofore ever enjoyed. After my mistress had stripped Laura of her clothes, they viewed and admired her naked beauties, praising them above that of the Venus de Medicis, throwing her down on the floor, turning her over and over, squeezing her breasts, pinching her backside, opening her thighs, even the lips of the dear little niche between them. They praise its beauty, admire the lascivious plumpness of its lips, and even go so far as to lay their kisses upon it the conversation running in praise, the while, on the pleasure she would mutually enjoy with the men who all should be so lucky as to tear up the virgin defenses which guarded the entrance to so delicious a little cunt. I could now see Caroline insert the tip of her finger into the dear slit with which she was playing, and commence tickling her, while Rosalie threw her arms around her neck, and drawing her to a close embrace, kissed her, putting her tongue into Laura's mouth, which, with the frigging she was receiving from Caroline, caused her to experience the most delightful sensations, if I might judge from the exclamations and the wrigglings of her backside as she squirmed about on the floor, perceiving by the motions of Laura that she would soon, for the first time, slightly experience the ecstatic joys which women can only procure the full enjoyment of when in the arms of a man. Seeing this, I slipped out from my hiding place, and went and took the place of Caroline between her thighs unperceived, by Laura, whose face was hid in the bosom of Rosalie, and inserting my finger into her cream jug, I soon brought down a copious libation of the precious liquid, with which my hand was plentifully bedewed, so freely did the liquid jet out once the sluice was opened. Crossing her thighs over my body, she almost squeezed the breath from me, exclaiming in broken accent sets, Oh, now it comes. Again, oh God, I faint. I die. Loosening her holes, she stretched herself out with, as usual, a gentle shudder, as the ecstasy caused her to faint away. While Laura lay in her trance of pleasure, I laid myself down in her arms, placing my cheek on her bosom, my lips touching hers, my hand still covering that dear slit, and my fingers still retaining possession of its inner folds. As I perceived Laura beginning to recover from her ecstasy, I drew her to my bosom and recommenced my titillations.
I asked her if she was still angry with me for carrying her away, telling her that as soon as we arrived at the chateau, she should enjoy all the reality of the unreal mockery she had just tasted through the agency of my fingers. If her modesty and virtue were not entirely conquered, the motion of my finger reproduced in her the delicious sensations of pleasure from which she had just recovered, and which, for the second time, she was about to enjoy. She could make me no answer, but to throw her arms round my neck and glue her lips to mine. My desires were excited to the highest pitch. I depicted to her the pleasure she would experience when, after arriving at the chateau, I should deflower her of her virginity and triumphantly carry off her maidenhead on the head of this dear Laura, I said, as I took one of her hands and clasped it round my pri- Then, said I, you will know all the joys and pleasures of a real f- You will then, I continued, experience all the sweet confusion, far different from what you now feel, of stretching wide apart your thighs to receive man between them, to feel his warm naked body joined to yours, the delicious preparatory toying with your breasts, the hot kisses lavished on them and on your lips, his roving tongue to force its way between your rosy lips in search of yours, the delicious meeting of them, their rolling about and tickling each other as mine, now does yours, at the same time thrusting my tongue to meet hers, and then to feel him take his prick, and with the tips of his fingers part the lips of the flesh sheath into which he intends to shove it, putting the head of it between the lips, and gently shoving it in at first, stretching the poor little thing to its utmost extent, till not without some pain to you, the head is effectually lodged in it. Then, after laying a kiss on your lips, he commences the attack by gently, but firmly, and steadily shoving into you, increasing his shoves harder and harder, till he thrusts with all his force causing you to sigh and cry out, he thrusts hard. He gains a little at every move. He forces the barriers. He tears and roots up all your virginal defenses. You cry out for mercy but receive none. His passions are aroused into madness. Fire flashes from his eyes, concentrating all his energies for one tremendous thrust. He lunges forward, carries everything before him, and enters the fort by storm reeking with the blood of his fair enemy, who with a scream of agony yields up a her maiden head to the conqueror, who, having put his victim hors de combat, proceeds to reap the reward of his hard-fought and bloody battle. Now he draws himself out to the head and slowly enters again. Again he draws out and again enters, till the friction caused by the luscious tightness of the rich flesh which clasps tightly his foaming pago, causes such delicious sensations that he is no longer master of himself. He lunges with fierceness into her. The crisis of pleasure approaches he feels it coming. He drives it home to her deeper, deeper. At last it comes. He spends. My God, the pleasure! His exclamations of, Oh! Ah! The deep-drawn sighs, the short jerks of his backside, the quick motions of his rump, proclaim that the acme of pleasure has seized him, and that he is spurting into her, uh, the precious fluid, which oils and cools the burning itchings of the dear little cunt, which has undergone the one painful trial to which all your sex is liable. During my description, Caroline had taken my pago in her hands, and had been playing with and rubbing it all the time. I still kept my finger in Laura, and perceiving by the twitching of her rump that she was about to spend. I, oh dear, I now feel it. There, I come now, I spend. Ah, whoa, ha. And I died away on her bosom, to awake and find that Laura had wet my hand with a most plentiful effusion of nectar ravished from her by my fingers, while I had squirted over her belly and thighs a flood of sperm. Laura without any murmurings, gave herself up to me and the seductive friggings of my fingers without any reserve. And not till nature was perfectly exhausted did we fall asleep in each other's arms. In the morning, when Laura awoke and found herself lying in my arms, she sprang from my side and snatching a coverlet from the bed, 
wrapped herself in it, and sat down in one corner, sobbing and weeping, as though her heart would break. I attempted to console her, but she would not listen to me, and having dressed myself, I went into another room, while Caroline and Rosalie tried to bring her to herself again, and they succeeded so far as to bring her out to breakfast, which was shortly afterwards served. At the table, they rallied Laura for her coyness in the morning, after having spent so delightful a night with me, jesting her about my having procured for her with my finger the exquisite pleasure which had thrown her into such delicious swoons, telling her how, when the fit was coming on her, she would throw her arms round me, squeeze my hand between her thighs, wriggle her plump little buttocks, see, after having drank a few glasses of wine, she had completely recovered her spirits. I went out of the room to order the carriage, and on my return I found her tussling with the other girls. They trying to throw her down for the purpose of giving her a taste of the pleasure she had enjoyed so frequently through my agency during the night. When I entered the two called me to come and help them, while Laura begged me to rescue her from the hands of her tormentors. Whilst they were thus calling on me the landlord entered to announce the carriage. When taking Laura by the arm, I led her out followed by the others. We entered the carriage and drove off. It was late in the night when we arrived at the chateau, on the third day of our being on the road. I retired to bed and fell asleep, with all the girls sleeping around me, determined to touch none of them, reserving all the powers within me for the purpose of doing full justice to the maidenhead of the lovely Laura. To be continued, my grandmother's tale or May's account of her introduction to the art of love from an unsophisticated manuscript found amongst the old lady's papers, after her death, supposed to have been written about A.D. 1797. Chapter 2 When vacation came and the school broke up, I returned home to my father, who was a widower, and Susie went to keep house for her bachelor uncle in Scotland. We promised to keep up a regular correspondence and to write a full account to each other of everything interesting. I felt very lonely after Susie had gone and missed Mr. T more than I could tell. My cut demanded a large share of my attention. I did not know what to do with it. In vain I looked at it in the glass, combed it. I petted it. I frigged it with my finger. I poked it with a candle until I spent. But it was a poor substitute. I panted for that reality. About this time I noticed Tom, the gardener's son, a lad of eighteen. He was always eager to work in my garden and never seemed so happy as when I commended him. One morning, I was sitting in the summer house when he returned from his breakfast. Not seeing me, he came to a corner near the summer house, and taking out his prick, began to make water. I could see it through the leaves as he held it in his hand. It was a large, strong-looking prick, and I feasted my eyes on its fair proportions. He seemed in no hurry to put it up, but looked at it as he drew back the skin making its red head swell and bound in his hand. Then, with difficulty, he forced it into its usual hiding place and went to his work. The sight of this prick set my con fire, and I resolved to get possession of it if I could. I returned to my room, and taking off my drawers, carefully washed and dressed my con. Then, going back to the garden, I called Tom and told him to set up the ladder against the pear tree by the wall as I wanted to see if the fruit was ripe. He held the ladder as I climbed up. He was just below me, and as I moved my legs about, reaching to the pears, he must have had a full view of all I had between them. I glanced down to observe the effect. His face was flushed, and he was gazing up with all his eyes. Take care, miss, or your will fall. No fear, Tom, I replied stretching out to one side, when my foot slipped, and I came sliding down just over him, so that his head passed up between my thighs. He caught me in his arms, and as he held me for a moment, I felt him kiss my cunt. Oh, miss, are you hurt? Not much, only a little stunned. Carry me into the summer house. He took me in his arms, his hand still resting on my naked bottom, and laid me on a seat. Shall I call anyone, miss? You seem very faint. No, Tom. I shall be all right in a few minches. It is only my knee. I lay on my back with one leg up. He was kneeling on the ground at my side. I saw him peeping up under my dress. 
Is it here, miss? Putting his hand on my knee, may I rub it? Yes, Tom, thank you. That makes it better. He rubbed my knee. He touched my thigh above the stocking. He moved his hand gradually higher and higher, until at last he slightly touched the hair on my cunt. He looked up at my face. I lay with my eyes closed. He grew bolder. He pressed the lips. He felt the chink between. He rubbed the clitoris. Tom, where are you putting your hand? I said in a languid tone. Oh, miss, I can't help it. You are so beautiful. He convulsively grasped my c and pushed his fingers into its glowing slit. Tom, I cannot allow this. Let me up. Darling Miss May, don't be angry. He forced his head under my clothes and rapturously kissed my cunt. I trembled with delight as I felt the touch of his lips and the soft probing of his tongue. If for appearance sake, I cried, For shame, Tom, let me up. You are making me very angry. I raised myself on my elbow and saw that his prick was out and standing in fine condition. Tom, how dare you expose yourself in that manner? Go away. Miss May, I can't help it. Indeed, I can't. He still kept his hand on my cunt, opening and closing the lips and pinching the clitoris. He drew me across the wide seat and getting in between my thighs, pushed the head of his prick against the lips of my cunt. Sweet Miss May, do let me put it in. Oh, do. No, Tom, I won't allow it. Let me up now. Perhaps I may some other time. He pushed again. The head entered. It passed up. The whole prick was in. It filled my cunt, my hungry cunt, with what eagerness it sucked in a morsel so delicious. Oh, um, there is nothing to be compared to a standing prick for gratifying a girl who knows and understands the supreme delights of fun. So I lay back and let him work away. Tom, what are you doing? I am only f, f your cunt, Miss May. Oh, how good you are, ain't that nice? he said, as he drove up his prick with most thrilling effect. It is, dear Tom, press up to my heart. Do you like my f you, miss? Yes, Tom, you have a very nice prick. But take care or you may do me harm. The dear fellow understood me, and just before he spent drew out his prick, I took it in my hand and held it while it poured forth a torrent of love's juice. I need not say that after this many happy love scenes were enacted in the summer house. Tom proved very docile and prudent. He had a wonderful prick, always ready for its work, and eager for a fuck. He knew well how to use it with effect, and I soon found that he was no tyro in the art of love. He told me many curious things among others, that Papa was in the habit of far milkmaid Sarah in the hayloft. It was she herself told him, for he had been the first to open her maiden channel. He offered to place me in a position where I could safely witness all that passed between them. Meet me early tomorrow morning, for it is after Sarah brings in the milk, and while Robert the groom is at his breakfast, that the master comes out. So the next morning Tom conducted me to the hayloft. He covered himself and me lightly with the hay. We had not long to wait, for we soon heard Papa talking in a low voice to Sarah as they came up the ladder. They came down near us. Papa then said, Take him out, Sarah. I have been longing for a f all night. She unbuttoned his trousers and drew out his prick. It was in good order, with a fine large ruby head. The sight of my father's prick had a curious effect on me. At first I did not like to look at it. But at length the amorous feeling overpowered every other. And I almost do. Envied Sarah as she held it admiringly in her hand, slowly moving it up and down. Then she took out his balls, and putting her hand underneath, pushed it on to his bottom. He had meanwhile pulled up her coats and uncovered a fine, thick-lipped cut, which pouted in fleshy luxuriance. What a splendid affair you have, Sarah. It is the most lascivious cut I ever looked at. Now tell me, who f you last? La, sir. Why do you ask me that? Just because it excites me more to hear you tell. You know I don't care who f you provided you hide nothing from me, and keep yourself from harm. Did not Robert f*** you last evening? Your face was so red when I met you after leaving him. Well, to tell the truth, sir, he did. 
tell me how it happened. I went into the stable to borrow a lantern. He caught me in his arms and kissed me. Then he forced me back on a heap of straw, pushed his hand under my petticoats and got hold of my cunt. I scolded him and boxed his ears. He did not mind, but squeezing in between my thighs, he thrust his big tool into my cunt and f me like mad. Has he a big tool, Sarah? Yes, it is very big and strong, but he does not use it as nicely as you do. He's always in too great a hurry. Papa now got over her. She held his prick, and with his hand directed it into her cunt. He pushed it slowly up until his balls pressed her bottom. She grasped his buttocks, and vigorously heaved up to meet every thrust he gave, saying at every he, Dear sir, oh how nice push it and drive it home. That's the way how your prick fills my cunt. Fuck me fast. F me hard. I was leaning forward on the hay, and Tom over me his prick and balls resting on my naked bottom. But as soon as Papa commenced f Sarah, he lodged his prick in my cunt. He then timed his strokes, so that each time Papa pushed I felt Tom's prick driving up my cunt and his hair tickling my bum. I spread my thighs and raised my bottom. Tom suddenly drew out his prick and holding open the cheeks of my bottom, popped it in there. As it was well moistened with the juice of my cunt, it slipped in easily. I dared not speak, so had to let him have his own way. He pushed it home, and bending his arms round my hip, he frigged my cunt. After a few strokes which were far from disagreeable, he administered a warm and soothing enema, just as Papa, with a grunt of satisfaction, poured his libation at the shrine of Sarah's cunt. He then got up and went away, after telling her to remain, until he was out of the yard. He had not gone many minutes when Robert popped up his head. Hello, Sarah. So Master has been just oiling your notch. I heard him f you, and all you said too. And now ill have my revenge. He seized her in his arms, threw her on the hay, and pitched her clothes over her head. She struggled and kicked her legs about in the air. But Robert held her down, while he gloated over her wriggling bum, an inflamed cunt. It looked very red and open, while the rich juices of her previous f trickled down her bottom. So you say Master Fox better than I do, and that I'm always in too great a hurry. Well, I will be slow enough now. He took out his prick and held it in his hand, while he opened the lips of her cunt. It was the largest prick I ever saw, and had a tremendous head. I was curious to see how she could take it in. He pushed it against her cunt. She plunged about. Be quiet, he shouted, giving her a slap on the bottom. Keep your arse quiet, I say, and mind your f- He forced the head in, and, to my surprise, it passed easily in. The huge prick must have filled her belly. He grasped the cheeks of her bottom on each side, and held her up, as he plunged his great prick with wonderful force in and out of her smoking gap. I had seen many a f- but never a f like this. I admired the wonderful size and strength of Robert's prick, and could not repress a longing for a taste of its prowess. Tom, too, was greatly excited by the scene and for me in his best style. But it was the idea of Robert's prick that filled my mind. The next afternoon, drawn by an irresistible attraction, I went into the stable. Robert, I have come to look after my mare. I think she wants to be clipped. And I stepped up. Take care, miss he said, putting his hand on my shoulder. She is very restive just now. Oh, I am not afraid. And I began to pat her. He made some kind of noise that caused her, I think, to plunge and kick. I told you so, miss, he said, passing his hand down over my bosom and drawing me towards him. It is a mercy you were not killed. And he pressed me in his arms. Robert, let me go. Where are you drawing me? You will make me fall. Oh, uh, what do you mean, don't push your knees there, don't attempt to raise my dress? Robert, what are you about? I won't let you take it away, you must not do it. Oh, I mean, you are hurting me, oh my. What are you pushing in, yes, I do feel it, hold me in your arms, yes. I like that, you may f me, Robert, as hard as you like. The monstrous prick was in my cunt. I felt it everywhere. He grasped my buttocks. He lifted me up. As he arose, I clasped my arms around his neck, 
and crossed my legs over his back. He carried me around the stable, with his prick still embedded in my cunt. It seemed to penetrate to my very heart. Every nerve within me thrilled with rapture as he shot into my vitals a stream of gushing sperm. It was the first time I had ever received into my cut the seed of man, and the feeling was intensely delicious. What have you done, Robert? Perhaps you have ruined me for life. Not at all, miss. Look here. And he showed me a large syringe, and there happens to be warm water in this bucket. Let me syringe your cut once. It will remove all danger. I lay back with my thighs widely extended, while he poured such a flood of water into my cut as must have washed out every trace. Robert then wiped and kissed it. After which he knelt by my side, and presented before me his prick once more in splendid condition. What a great fellow you have, Robert, I said as I chafed it in my hand and uncovered its rosy head. I kissed it and with difficulty took part of it in my mouth. Oh, Miss May, you are very good, and you have the sweetest kai ever f May I put it in again? Not this time, Robert. I would rather pet this fine fellow while you are tickling my cunt. So keeping its glowing head in my mouth with one hand, I frigged the shaft, and with the other stirred his balls and touched his bottom. While he was equally busy about my seat of pleasure, deliciously frigging with his fingers each sensitive orifice. And just as I felt my c flooded with love's effusion, he shot into my mouth such a torrent of seed that I could not swallow it fast enough, and it squirted out on each side of my mouth. It was pungent and pleasant to the taste. Before I left him, he swore on his oath never to speak of what had just happened, and he proved loyal and true. I had now two esquires both able and willing to gratify me at any time, or in any way. And although I soon found out more of Papa's secret amours, yet I myself exercised the greatest care and circumspection. A few days after this adventure, Papa told me that as he considered I must be very lonely so much by myself, he had asked a young lady named Kate L. to come and stay with us for some time. In due course, she arrived. She was a nice, pleasing girl with dark hair and eyes, and three years older than I was. I found her amiable and obliging, and ready to enter into my plans and share in my amusements. Papa paid her particular attention, and I observed she did not seem at all averse. They were often alone together, and I guessed something was going on, but she never told me anything. Her bedroom was separated from mine by a bathroom, into which both our rooms opened. One night, when we went upstairs, I sat for some time with her, and after bidding her good night, I passed through the bathroom, leaving the doors slightly open. When I had undressed, I put out my candle and sat by the fire to warm my feet before going to bed. I had not sat long when my curiosity was excited by hearing whispering in Kate's room. I crept softly to the open door and listened. Oh, sir, why have you come into my bed? Because I am so fond of you, my darling. If you were really fond of me, you would not come to me in this way. Don't I pray you leave me? Oh, my. How can you be so nasty? Take your hand off me. I don't like it, no. It is not nice. Let my hands go. I won't hold. It I want move it up and down. Don't separate my thighs with your knee. What are you getting over me for? What are you pushing into me? My prick, darling Kate. There, don't struggle, my pet. Let it in. Don't be frightened. I won't harm you in any way. Open your thighs. That's the sweet girl. Now, I'll push it in as gently as possible. There, it is in. It is all the way out. Then the bed began to creak, and the clothes to rustle. Put your arms around me, my love. Heave up your dainty little bottom. That's right. Do you know what doing this is called? No, sir. It is called... F isn't f very pleasant? Yes, it is now. Do I heave up right? My darling, you heave as if you had been f all your life. Pinch my bottom. May I pinch yours? Yes, as hard as you like. Now place your hand here. Hold my prick. Hold it tight. Oh, there it comes. And rolling off her, he lay panting at her side. I felt greatly excited and crept into the room, close up to the bed. I heard them kissing. Did I hurt you, my love? 
You did a little at first. But when your prick was well in, and you commenced fu- There was no feeling but pleasure. Would you like me to pet your prick now? I would, darling, rub it up and down, this way. Put your other hand on the balls. Move your fingers further back, still further there. Have you much feeling there? Yes. There is great feeling behind the balls, don't you feel the root of the prick extending back to the little hole? That's a dear girl. The touch of your finger there is delicious. Push it in a little, my sweet pet. Kate, did you ever look at May's cunt? Yes. I have seen it when she was in the bath. It looks well covered with hair. I am sure if you made free with her, you would have great fun together. For, unless I am greatly mistaken, she has a very randy disposition. Promise to try tomorrow night. And tell me next day all that you have succeeded in finding out. She promised to carry out his wishes. But now that you have worked out my prick, we must have another fu- Lee over me this time. I heard her getting over him. Now it's in. Heave away, my love. You must do all the fu- yourself. She panted as she worked her nimble bottom up and down over him. Do you like it this way, my love? Yes, as a variety. But I like better to have you lying over me and pushing in your prick. He now prepared to leave, and I started for my own room and was soon fast asleep. I had several amorous dreams that night. I thought that Robert was flicking me in the loft when Papa came behind, pulled him off, and thrust his own prick into my cut and f me most delightfully. In my dream I felt no surprise at Papa's f me on the contrary. The idea seemed to add greatly to my enjoyment. The next evening, Kate offered to sleep with me. I could not repress a smile as I consented. When we were undressing, Kate said I would like to see you quite naked, May. You know we girls need not be ashamed of one another, and I will set the example. She threw off her shift and stood before me, then pointing to my cunt, she remarked that I had a great deal of hair there. I replied that her dark hair was prettier, for it set off the whiteness of her skin. She put her hand on my cunt and asked me to let her feel it, and you may feel mine if you like. She touched the clitoris, and passing her finger down the slit, pushed it up the passage and said, Dear May, you are very open. Were you always as open as you are now? No, I was not, but are not you very open too? She smiled as she said, May, if you will give me your full confidence, I will promise you mine. Agreed, said I. Did you ever see what a man has here? I did, did you? Yes, do you know what it is called? I have heard it called a prick, is that it? It is. Had you ever a prick in here? I have Kate, haven't you? Yes, dear. No, tell me how it happened. And I'll tell you about myself afterward. I related my adventure with Mr. T, and how he was, so fond of kissing and sucking my cunt. Would you like me to kiss it? I would, dear Kate. And I'll kiss yours, too. Well, lean back. Lift your legs, open your thighs as widely as you can. There? Do you like that? Holding my buttocks with her hands, she sucked my cut with great ardor, rolling her tongue round and round, and thrusting it up the passage. After enjoying it for a while, I said, It is my turn now, dear Kate. Let me pet and kiss your sweet cut, while you are giving me the account you promised. I sat on a stool between her thighs, and with my mouth buried in her open cunt, listened to her narrative. To be continued. A secret revealed. Or, down. The true reason why Queen Esther pleased the king more than all the other virgins. From an original essay by Ivan Mayan. Amsterdam. A.D. 1629. Text. Esther. Chap. Paron. Pow. Do. V. 2 to 17, inclusive. The Jewish rabbis have a tradition that it was entirely owing to the training Mordecai gave to his cousin, Hadassah or Esther, in order to prepare the young girl to be his own wife, that she was enabled to bear off the palm from all the competing virgins. When the whim of the court suddenly causes her to be impressed for the royal pleasures, as well as hundreds of other beautiful girls throughout the kingdom, which, of course, at once quashes all her cousin's plans for his own future enjoyment. Robbed of his prospective bride, Mordecai had the brilliant idea of making Esther's advancement the stepping stone of his own fortunes. 
He knew the kings regarded their numerous concubines as so many toys only to be cast aside, and perhaps never even looked upon again. When they had once submitted to the royal ravisher, and his natural shrewdness and great knowledge of human nature made him reflect how cloyed and disgusted even a king must get with the sameness of the pleasure which the taking of hundreds of maidenheads from unresisting virgins could only afford him. Accordingly, as the tradition has it, he secretly sent her instructions to rehearse with the seven virgins, her companion C.V. 9, all the salacious ideas which he had himself instilled in her mind in view of his own future gratification, and also especially enjoined upon her the wisdom of putting aside all modesty when her turn came to enter the royal presence, to submit to his embraces most joyfully, also to put on the greatest possible semblance of erotic desire and abandon, and finally, when she found her sovereign completely used up, she was to entreat his majesty to allow her maidens to enter his presence, and enact with her such scenes as would restore his prostrated energies in a very short time. The old tradition is silent as to what took place when Ahasuerus was so delighted that he placed the crown upon Esther's head and made her queen in the room of Vashti, divorced. But from many allusions contained in the writings of ancient Talmudists, who enlarged upon such an interesting subject, I have made out something as follows. Mordecai had managed to convey to his cousin a small box of magic ointment, which he had procured from one of the Magi, a forbidden sect in Persia in those days. The effect of which he assured her was most marvelous, when applied to the parts of generation in either sex. Thus provided, she was conducted by the Chamberlain to the King's house, and ushered into his august presence, whilst the seven virgins, her companions, were left in an antechamber. Esther being simply naked, with an azure girdle ornamented with stars of gold round her loins, sandals of gold on her feet, a wide coral necklace around her splendid throat, whilst the raven tresses of her silken hair were ornamented by a profusion of splendid pearls. Thus she stood as she bowed her head before Ahasuerus, a thin veil of gauzy texture covering her from head to foot in such a way as to set off the splendor of her charms rather than hide them from the eye. Her virgins had no such pearls or necklets, but simple azure girdles, with silver stars and silver sandals. The king was reclining upon a magnificent couch, as she knelt down to pay her homage to her sovereign lord and master. He was a handsome man of about forty, with a used-up blaze expression of countenance. Come, pretty girl, and kiss my royal prick. Perchance thy luscious lips may raise some slight desire, which I may gratify. But alas, all virgin beauties cease to inflame my once amorous disposition. Dost know aught, fair child, thou thinkest would please me. Most royal prince, whom all the earth obeys, let not thine heart be sad, because the fires of love have paled within thy bosom. I have a box of magic unguent will restore thy youthful vigor, and if my maiden companions may be permitted to attend me in your royal presence, we will play such games the sight of which shall rouse a perfect storm of passionate desire. Good God, do I hear a right? Haste, fair maiden, to begin. Call thy virgins, and if thou pleaseth me, thou art queen. Esther, kneeling down, ventured to open the front of the royal robe, and taking his limp priapus reverently in her hand, drew back the foreskin, and imprinted a kiss upon its ruby head, at the same time using her tongue so skillfully that he experienced quite a pleasurable sensation from its touches round the entrance to the urethra. Rise, maiden, and call thy fellows. Most royal prince, ere I rise from my knees, give thy word of honor that whatever we do shall be pardoned in advance, or we may not feel free to touch thy royal person. Thou shalt be queen, and I thy subject till break of day. Do what thou wilt, sweet maid. The other seven virgins being summoned, Esther first ordered them to strip the king perfectly naked. Then she anointed the royal priapus and fundus with the magic ointment, working her fingers so deftly, especially in the tight hole of the latter, that she soon perceived some signs of virility, as the lordly member began to throb and swell. Enough, cried Esther, 
Now the king shall see me ravish my seven virgins before he takes my own virginity, producing as she said this an imitation mandrake of tremendous size, quite ten inches long, and thick in proportion, provided with straps, so that she could adjust it upon herself thus furnished. She ordered four of her companions to seize one of their number, and hold the victim down upon a couch, with legs and arms well stretched out, then throwing herself upon the trembling girl, ruthlessly plunged her great machine through all the virgin obstacles. The screams of pain, struggles and sighs of the different victims, as they were deflowered in turn so affected the king that he was almost mad with lust, and ready to throw himself upon the lascivious Esther, had not the girls, two at a time, taken in turn the trouble to play with and excite him more and more, at the same time restraining him as long as possible, till as Esther was in the act of sacrificing the seventh victim. He felt the crisis approaching, and springing away from their restraint, threw himself upon her bottom, clasping her tightly round her waist, as his bursting pigo plunged at the door of her maidenhead from behind. This had been expected, and his two attendants, acting upon previous instructions, at once went to his assistance, the fingers of one opening the moist lips of the haven of love, whilst her companion's hand guided the head of the restive courser, till it was fairly lodged just within that tight but luscious mouth. Esther was now screaming in pain as well as her victim, but she was so excited and longing to be made a woman herself that her bottom pushed out to meet his thrust and achieved her fate almost in a moment. The king, finding himself buried to the hilt of his weapon, paused to enjoy the voluptuous pressures and delicious warmth of ah, the tight-fitting sheath he had penetrated, wishing to prolong the exquisite sensations which thrilled through his frame. The two girls who had guided him into the seat of bliss now kissed and played with the royal appendages, handling his affair, drawing back the skin as far as possible, and working their fingers in his bottom hole, till he could retain himself no longer, and again pushing furiously into Esther, deluged her longing gap with a profusion of a seed royal, almost screaming, Oh heavens! What pleasure! I knelt! I die! And then fell prone upon her back from excess of emotion. Esther, thou art my queen, were the first words he uttered as soon as he could speak. The seven no longer virgins now washed the king and queen, and then themselves, after which all were refreshed and reinvigorated by stimulating wines and viands. Esther again excited her royal spouse, till his pago was as a bar of iron, she made him enter the bottoms of all her maids, but without spending his royal sea, till at last presenting her own lovely buttocks, she received the weapon of love in her anus and kept him there till he rewarded her devotion by another copious emission. Thus she became queen. And as the king said when he presented her to the nobles of the court, she surpassed in virtue and loveliness all the women of his realm. The marriage morn. Tune the merry dance. The marriage morn I can't forget. My senses teemed with new delight. Time, cried I. Haste the coming night. And Hymen. Give me sweet Lizette, I whispered softly in her ear, and said, The god of night draws near. Oh, how she looked! Oh, how, how she smiled! Oh, how she sighed! She sighed, then spent a joyful tear. Now nuptial night her curtain drew, and Cupid's mandate was, Commence, with ardor, break the virgin fence. Then to bed, Sweet Lizette flew. Twas heaven to view her when she lay, and hear her cry, Come to me, pray. Oh, how I feel. Oh, how I pant. Oh, I shall die. Shall die before the break of day. Soon Nanhood rose with furious gust, and Mars, when he lewd Venus viewed, near felt his power so closely screwed, up to the standing post of lust. But when the stranger to her sight, sweet Lisette saw in rampant plight, oh, how she screamed, oh, how she screamed, oh, how she screamed. She screamed, then grasped the dear delight. Now lustful nature eager grew, 
and longer could not wanton toy. So rushing up the path of joy, quick from the fount love's liquor flew. At morn, she cried, full three times three. The vivid stream I felt from thee. Oh, how amazed! Oh, how impleased! Oh, how im charmed! Im charmed with rapturous three times three. Lady Palkingham, or they all do it, giving an account of her luxurious adventures both before and after her marriage with Lord Crincom. Heart fish, continued. The Earl was as good as his promise. My Robert, as I called him in our loving intercourse, was so well schooled that he was quite equal to the assertion of all his rights as a husband by the time Lady Cecilia returned home. After dinner, on the evening of her arrival from the country, he found me sitting alone in the conservatory and sitting down by my side, whispered in my ear how delighted he was at being able to have a last word of advice with me before retiring to rest with his, no doubt, rather expectant spouse. You have so drained me last night, and early this morning, dear Beatrice, he said, putting his arm round my waist and meeting my ready lips in a long, breathless kiss, and then continued, Nothing but some extraordinary excitement will enable me to do justice to her expectations. I must f her at least three or four times after such a long absence. How shall I be equal to the occasion? Have me first, I replied, while she is seeing the children put to bed. There is plenty of time that will give you zest for the fun to come. The idea of taking the virginity of her maiden bottom hole will excite you enough, and the more she resists and gets indignant, the more you will enjoy it. I had been gently stroking his prick outside his trousers. My touch was magical. It stiffened immediately. And when I let the impatient prisoner out of his confinement, I thought I had never before seen his priapus so distended and inflamed with lust as at that moment. Rising up, I first stooped to give the engine of love a warm kiss, and keeping it in my hand, raised my clothes and turning my bottom to his belly, spitted myself on the loving object, opening my legs and straddling over his lap, so as to get the very last fraction of its length into my heated cunt. We sat still for a moment or two, enjoying the mutual sensations of repletion and possession, so delightful to each of the participators in a loving f before commencing those soul-stirring movements, which gradually work our heated desires to that state of frenzied madness which can only be allayed by the divinely beneficent ecstasy of spending, and mingling the very essences of our nature. The idea that I was robbing his hated wife of her just expectations added such piquancy to our loving conjunction that I literally moaned or whined with delight as I twisted my head round in the act of emission, so as not to lose the luscious kiss which is such an extra pleasure in those supreme moments of our happiness. He did not come at the same time, but stopped and rested a moment or two, then rising and keeping me still impaled on his dear prick. Without losing place even for a single second, he laid my body face downwards on a little table which stood handy, and then recommenced his delicious moves. With his hands under me in front, frigging and tickling my cunt, till I almost wrenched myself away from him by the violence of my convulsive contortions. Suddenly drawing quite out with another plunge, he drove the head of his tool into the smaller orifice, which is so delightfully near and convenient, when in the position in which he had me. Ah! Oh, how, how, fool! I screamed swimming in lubricity as I felt him so gorging my bottom, whilst his busy fingers were adding to my erotic madness by the artistic way in which they groped within my spending cunt. Oh, heavens, Robert, Robert, do, do come, darling. There, ah, I feel it. How deliciously warm, I murmured excitedly as his flood of boiling seed inundated the gratified and sensitive sheath which enclosed him so tightly. After recovering from our transports, we conversed about how he should proceed with his wife, his prick all the while as stiff as a policeman's truncheon. Till at last, fearing Lady Cecilia might surprise us, I went into the drawing room and played the piano whilst he smoked his cigarette amongst the flowers in the conservatory outside the window. Her ladyship pretending fatigue we knew what she was in a hurry for, 
The family retired rather earlier than usual to rest. But I took care to be at my peephole before Cecilia and Robert entered their bedroom. As it was a habit of his to go over the lower part of the house and see everything safe for himself before going to bed, his lady came first and at once commenced to undress. She was about the same age as her husband, a vastly fine, fair woman, rather above the medium height. Light auburn hair, slightly golden in tint. Deep blue eyes, set off by dark eyebrows and long dark lashes. A full mouth, richly pouting cherry lips, and a brilliant set of pearly teeth, then a sow. She gradually unrobed herself. Her various and luscious charms quite fired my lascivious blood, as one by one they stood revealed to my earnest gaze. What magnificent swelling breasts still round and firm. And then as she lifted her chemise over her head and exposed the lovely whiteness of her belly still without a wrinkle, as she had easy confinements and never suckled her children for fear of spoiling her figure, set off below by a bushy mons veneris, covered with light curly silken red hair, to which I could just perceive the outline of her slit. Now she stood before Cheval Glass, surveying herself at full length. I could see a blush cross her beautiful face, as she seemed almost ashamed to look at her own nakedness. Then a self-satisfied smile parted those cherry lips and displayed the sparkling pearls of teeth as she patted the shiny marble skin of her belly and bottom evidently. Thinking of the effect of the sight upon Robert when he should enter the room, then she playfully parted the lips of her cup and examined it closely in the glass. The titillation of her fingers brought another blush, and she seemed as if she could not resist the temptation to freak herself a little, moving a couple of digits in a restless kind of way backwards and forwards between the vermilion lips of love. My blood was on fire, and much as I hated her, I would have liked to go mahoosh her there and then. But suddenly the door opened, and Robert stood transfixed. As he exclaimed in surprise, Surely, Cecilia, you have lost all modesty. Why have you never exposed yourself to me like that before? Oh, Robert, dear, how you startle me. You came up so soon, and I was only just looking at the love. I know you are longing to caress as soon as the light is out. I really did not know you were such a charming figure, Cecilia. But now you are naked. I will feast on the sight. But we won't put out the lights, my dear. I must now examine in detail every charm. By the way, I may tell you that during your absence, I found some bad books of my late brothers, and they so fired my imagination by the extraordinary descriptions of various modes of enjoyments that I quite blushed to think of our innocent ignorance and longed to try some of them with you. He'd almost torn his clothes off while speaking, and I could see his prick as rampant as possible. In fact, I believe it had never lost its stiffness since our excitable bout a short time before. Throwing himself into her arms, they hugged and kissed, whilst she, taking hold of his pego, slowly backed towards the bed as she tried to bring its head to the mark. Not there, Cecilia, love. You have another maidenhead I mean to take tonight, our plain, silly way of doing it. Only leads to getting a lot of children, and surely my quiver is full enough of them. He'll have no more. It's positive ruination, however rich a father may be. No. No. The French style in future. Do you understand? I mean to get into your bottom, he said, as seriously as possible, yet with evident excitement. What a nasty idea. You shall never do that, Robert, to me. She exclaimed, crimsoning with shame to the roots of her hair. But I must and will, Cecilia. Look at this book. Here are all the different ways of doing it. Why they suck each other. Fuck a you start at the vulgar word. But it's fu fu that's the name for it. They fu bottoms, under armpits. Between the bubbies, another nasty name for titties anywhere, everywhere, it's all the same to a man. All what they call C-U-N-T. A word I am sure you have seen somewhere in your lifetime written on shutters, doors, or even on the pavement. A deliciously vulgar word. Cecilia, but the universal toast of men when they meet in company. I could see he was trying to make her look at a little French book called La Science Pratique. 
with its 40 pretty little plates. How my blood has been fired by fancying all these delightful ideas remain to be enjoyed when you came home. Why, Robert, you are mad. Ill burn that horrible book. I won't learn their filthy ways. Snatching at the book. You're my wife. Every bit of your body is mine to do as I please with it. Don't drive me to extremities, Cecilia. Or I may be rough, for I'm determined to put my prick in your arse. Now at once, trying to turn her over. Robert, Robert, for shame. Beatrice will hear your disgusting language. You shall never abuse me that way, hiding her face in her hands and beginning to sob. But I will, and you may blubber like a child. Your tears only urge me on. If you resist ill smack and beat you, till you are obedient. She struggled, but a woman's strength is soon exhausted, and at last he got her face down on the bed, with her bottom on the edge and her feet on the floor. Then giving her a tremendously painful smack on her bum, he spread her legs wide apart, opened the cheeks of that glorious bottom, anointed the head of his bursting prick with spittle, also the tight-looking brown hole he was about to attack, and then pushed on to the assault of the virgin fortress. I could hear her moan with pain as the head gradually forced its way within the sphincter muscle. Ah, it's pricking. Oh, oh, you will rend me. Robert, oh, pray, ah, oh, oh. At last he was in, and rested a moment or two, then slowly began his f motions. Presently I could tell by the wriggling of her bottom that she enjoyed it. His hands were busy frigging her cut in front. How excited they got, each seeming to spend at the same moment. But he kept his place, and the second finish was so excitable that they screamed quite loudly in the frenzy of a mission, while Cecilia actually fainted away with Robert fallen exhausted on her senseless body. Presently he recovered sufficiently to be able to apply restoratives to his fainting wife, and as soon as he had brought her round, so that she could understand what he said, proceeded to tell her that in future they would enjoy all the novel ideas he had found in that nice French book. No more big bellies for you, Cecilia, or the anxiety of children for either of us. You must now suck my prick till it is stiff enough again, he said, presenting it to her mouth. No, no, I never can do such a dirty trick besides. It's doubly disgusting. You have not even washed since you outraged my bottom, she sobbed, as her eyes filled with tears, seeing no signs of compassion in his face. What's that to me? You've got to suck it. So go on, my dear, without all those wry faces, which only add to my fun. It's rare sport to make you submit to my fancies. I find I've been a fool ever since I was married, not to have asserted my right to do as I please with every bit of your person. Cunt, arse, mouth, or bubbies, they can all afford me intense pleasure without getting in the family way. Now go on, and I will fuck you with a fine large dildo. Mind you must swallow every drop of my spendings when it comes. He forced his prick between her reluctant lips, all slimy, and soiled as it was from the previous enclade, then producing an enormous dildo. Nearly twelve inches long, and big in proportion, he put a little cold cream on it, and presented the head to her notch, trying to force it in. Ah! No! No! That's so awfully large! She almost screamed, but the head was partly in, and despite her sobs and moans of pains, he soon succeeded in passing at least ten inches of it into her distended vagina. Her c was exposed towards me, so that I could see how gorged it was with that big indu Robert tool. And the sight of her slit so stretched to its utmost capacity caused quite a thrill of desire to shoot through my veins. It was almost impossible for me to prevent myself making some kind of demonstration. How I longed to be with them! and join in the orgy of lust. Each shove of that tremendous affair now seemed to afford her the most intense delight. She sucked his prick in a kind of delirium, her highly wrought feelings banishing every sense of delicacy, shame, or disgust that might have previously deterred her from doing so. I frigged myself furiously, they screamed and spent, till at last both spectatrix and actors were thoroughly exhausted. When I awoke next morning, and applied my eye to the peephole. It was just in time to see her ladyship awake. First she felt her cut to see if it was all right, and not ruined by the giant dildo she had taken in the previous night. 
Her eyes sparkled with desire, and she repeatedly blushed as I suppose the recollection flashed through her mind. Presently throwing the sheet entirely off her husband's body, she handled his limp affair for a few moments. Then putting her face down, took the head of his prick in between her lovely lips and sucked away with evident relish till she had him in a glorious state of fitness and was about to treat herself to a proper St. George. When Robert, who had only been feigning sleep to see what his randy wife would do, suddenly woke up and insisted upon her applying it to her arsehole instead of her cunt, wetting it with spittle. Slowly, but surely she achieved its insertion, although to judge by her face it was evidently a painful operation. But when once in how they enjoyed that glorious bottom f even after he had spent she rode on till he met her again, and both seemed to come at the same time, kissing each other in a frenzy of erotic madness. To be continued. The new patent f machine. Dear Mary, I promised to write directly when to school I returned. But I think when this letter is finished toward better by far, it were burned. For a girl has just now returned to us, and bought while in town she has been docked. The last improvement in dildos. The new patent f machine. At night, when we go to our bedrooms, we go in for a jolly good spree. And first I perform upon Fanny, and then she performs upon me. It beats the old flat cocks a long way, you know, the old game that I mean. Oh! Mustn't a man be galoptious if he beats the new f-machine? It beats fingers by far too a long way. Its shape is just like a tool. The girl who owns it is good-natured. She has f I believe, the whole school. She has it herself much too often, and is getting most awfully lean. And her pussy's quite tender with using the patent new f-machine. It gives a delightful sensation. Your breath comes too quickly to speak. Whilst Fanny was doing it for me, I bit a piece out of her cheek. And when you feel yourself spending and clasp it, your legs in between. Oh, I should die if it ever got broken. God preserve the new f machine. A new girl arrived, dearest Mary, and slept during last night with me. When I put the machine to her cunny, she said, none of that sort for me. She turned up her nose at our patent and said we were awfully green. To injure ourselves with such habits and not have the real f-machine, that the men are all dying to have us. If only well give them the chance. She was herself, had in the carriage, coming home from the Lord Mayor's dance. Now directly I get home next ex Maisie, ill spoon my young cousin Jack Green, and I swear Hal be only too ready to lend me his f-machine. Anecdote of Kate Santley. One night at the Alhambra, Amongst a shower of bouquets from the boxes, a carrot was thrown from the gallery. She coolly gathered an armful of trophies, and after bowing again and again to the boxes, looked up with a smile at the gods. As she said, Excuse me taking your carrot, now I have the flowers, and tripped off the stage amidst a storm of applause. It has been suggested that this work be split into multiple pages. If you'd like to help... Please review the style guidelines and help pages. La Rose d'Amour, or The Adventures of a Gentleman in Search of Pleasure. Translated from the French. Heart Tour. The morning after our arrival, on awakening, I roused up the sleeping beauties who lay around me, and led them to the bathing department. We all entered the water, and after sporting for an hour or more, we issued from it, and entering the dressing room, made our morning toilets, the girls dressed in Saimar, pants and vest, such as those worn by the odalisks in the East. This day was made all preparations on a splendid scale for the great sacrifice of the night, the taking of Loras Maidenhead. We spent the time in roving about the park until noon running, jumping and tussling, so as to keep up an excited circulation of the blood. The dinner, which I had ordered three hours later than usual, consisted of all the most highly seasoned dishes, and of the richest and most exhilarating wines, of which we partook to a slight excess, and at last rose from the table with our amorous propensities, aroused to the highest pitch. We retired to the bedchamber, and stripping ourselves we again sought the bath, which was highly scented with the most costly perfumes. Remaining but a short time in the bath, we went to the bedchamber, 
and Rose and Marie having drawn aside the heavy hangings, we entered the state apartment. Here Celestine and Manette, with towels of the finest linen, absorbed the water from the body and hair of Laura, while Rosalie and Caroline did the same for me. While they were combing out the rich auburn tresses which floated in wavy masses over her neck and shoulders, I was on my knees before her, combing out the black silken hair which grew, with a luxuriance seldom seen in girls of seventeen, out of the fattest little hillock I ever saw, and almost hid the entrance to the beautiful grotto beneath. Having combed out her precious locks come in full, and parted them from around the mouth of the greedly little maw, which was shortly and for the first time to partake and eat of the flesh. With the tips of my fingers I opened the pouting lips, and feast my eyes with gazing on the deep carnation of the luscious love in each, in which I was soon to put the idol. I peep, gaze, look, and try to get a further insight into the hidden mysteries of the deep, dark, cavernous recess but my sight could it penetrate no further than a most tempting bit of flesh, somewhat in the shape of a heart, which appeared to be pendant, like a dazzling light from the ceiling of a room, in the center of the passage to the unexplored cavern, through the folding doors of which I was peeping. My enraptured eyes still gaze on the tempting tidbit before me, till, recalled to my senses by feeling something moving between my thighs, and looking down, I perceive the hand of Celestine, clasped around my noble shaft, and slowly drawing her hand up and down it, covering and uncovering its beautiful red head with the fine white skin which lay around the neck in fold. This at once gave an impetus to my desires, which could not be restrained. I raised up and catching Laura in my arms, I carried her to the bed and placed her on it, the firm semiglobes of her backside, resting on the edge of the bed, supported by a cushion of white satin, covered with an embroidered cloth of fine linen. Celestine and Caroline support each a leg, while Rose and Marie jump onto the bed, and Manette and Rosalie stand on either side to support me, in case my feelings should overpower me at the close of the performance, and also to serve as pilots for me, the one to open the gate of love the other to guide the fiery dart aright into the entrance. Fearing somewhat for the little maid, who was to undergo the process of defloration, and knowing that the rose was not without its thorn, and that the sting would at first be pretty severe, I anointed my impatient virgin destroyer with perfumed oil and marched to the battlefield, determined to conquer or to die. Her legs were held apart. I entered between and planned a soft kiss on the lips which I was about cruelly to tear open, which seemed to send a thrill of joy through her. I slightly inclined forward the tips of Manette's fingers part the rosy lips. Rosalie grasps hold of my pego and lodges the head in the entrance. The two girls, who support her legs, rest them on my hips, and standing behind me, cross their arms with joined hands, so that the ankles rest on them as on a cushion. Gathering myself up, I make one fierce lunge forward and gain full an inch. The sudden distension of the parts cause her to scream with pain and to wriggle her rump in such manner that, instead of in any way ridding herself of me, it was a help to me in my endeavors to penetrate still further. I thrust harder. I penetrate. I pierce her. The blood begins to flow. I feel it on my thighs. Her buttocks are convulsively twitching and wriggling in endeavors to throw me off. In her agony, she utters scream after scream. Poor little maid. It is a rough and thorny way to travel. But once gone over, the road is ever after smooth. Again I thrust forward. Ah, my God, she exclaims. I shall die. Have mercy on me. I have no pity on her and shove harder than ever to put her out of her pain and agony. I tear her open, carrying everything before me, and one last shove sends me crowned with victory into the thick, very sanctum of love amidst the clapping of hands and the shouts of triumph by those who surround us. No sooner was I buried in her to the extremest point than I lay quivering and gasping on her belly, 
spending into her womb a flood of boiling sperm. I soon regained new life and vigor, and drawing myself out to the head, commenced a to and fro friction that caused no more than a few ahs and deep-drawn sighs. As the sperm I had injected into her had oiled the parts and made the way comparatively easy for the dear creature who lay under me. She now received my thrusts and shoves with a slight quivering of her rump. She clasps me in her arms. She closes her eyes. A few energetic heaves, and the dear girl feels pleasure, despite that pain that a woman experiences in having drawn from her, for the first time by a man, the milk of human kindness. I too meet her and again melt away in her, fairly drenching her with the copious draughts of the liquid I spurted into her. At last I rise up from off my lovely victim, leaving her a bleeding sacrifice on the altar of love. The girls gathered around Laura, congratulating her on being transformed from a maid into a woman. The entrance being forced, she could henceforth drive into the boundless pleasures and joys of love without feeling pain. They raised her up whilst cleaning her of the blood that dyed her thighs and buttocks. I took up the consecrated cushion and its bloody covering and directed one of them prepare the bed for us. I but no. I determined to give her a little rest, and ordering the girls to prepare a cold supper, told them to awake me in two hours, and we fell asleep in each other's arms. After sleeping for some time, Laura awoke much refreshed, but still feeling sore from the severe battering she had received. The table being laid alongside the bed, we reclined on it, the others sitting around the table on cushions. Not feeling much inclined to eat, I commenced dallying with my bedfellow, railing her on the feeling she experienced while I was taking her maidenhead, till the spirit began to wax powerful within me, whereupon I laid her down flat on her back and fell with my face downward upon her and thence followed what the spirit moveth. Yes, verily, we did mighty deeds of fun that night, and it was not until after the sixth operation, or moving of the spirit, that we lay exhausted in each other's arms, and fell asleep. In a few days after there arrived at the mouth of the creek, a fine large steam brig, which dropped anchor, and sent a boat ashore with the captain, who delivered me a letter from my banker, stating who and what the officers and crew were, and upon what terms they had been engaged. I immediately walked down to the creek, and going into the boat with the captain, we pulled on board. I examined her decks, masts, etc., and then descended to the cabin, which extended my most sanguine expectations. So magnificently was it fitted up. The cabin contained six staterooms, very large and splendidly fitted up, equaling in style and ornament the most elegant boudoir I had ever seen in Paris. I questioned the captain, who was English, as well as the whole crew, in regard to the men on board. He said that he and his men had been employed to serve me in any way I might think proper, so long as I did not command him to commit piracy, that he and the crew were paid enormous wages and that they were bound and felt ready and willing to follow me to heaven or hell, if I but showed them the way. On questioning the stewards, I found the brig to be well stored with all the luxuries that could be procured. I ascended to the deck with the captain, and passing the word forward for all hands to come aft, I had a crew of most hardy and devil-may-care-looking fellows around me in a trice, standing respectfully hats in hand. I made them a short address laying open to them my intentions, and stating the service I required of them. I gave the captain his orders to be in readiness to sail in two days and I returned to the chateau. Summoning the steward, I directed him to prepare everything for our voyage, as I determined to start in two days for Constantinople. I then directed a page to send the women to me. On their entering, I made them all strip to the skin, and examined the cuts and several charms of each of them with a critical eye endeavoring when all were most lusciously beautiful to select one as my companion de voyage, but not being able to choose among so many loves, I left it to chance. Taking up a dice box, I made each throw in her turn. La Rose d'Amour and my fair Russian, Caroline, made the highest throws, and I determined to take both. After they had cast their dies, I informed them what my object was. Whereupon Laura, my last love, 
who by Thabai was a great libertine, fell on her knees before me weeping, and begged me to take her with me. It was impossible for me to take more than two. I told her it was no use to grieve about the matter as she could not go, but that I would pass all my remaining time with her. Leaving the chateau in the care of my trusty stewards and followers, I embarked, taking with me over one million in francs in gold, for the purpose of purchasing slaves in Constantinople. Chapter 5 After a pleasant voyage of about two weeks, I arrived at the capital of the Turkish Empire. At the earliest opportunity, I presented my letters to some of the most wealthy and influential foreigners, under a fictitious name. I soon became acquainted with many wealthy Turks, and among them three or four slave merchants. I then hired an interpreter, and paying a visit to one of the merchants, engaged him as an agent to find out and procure me a lot of the handsomest females to be found in the market. And knowing that the poor class of the inhabitants were in the daily habit of selling their daughters, such as were handsome enough to grace the harems of the rich and lustful Turks, I directed him to send out some of his emissaries to search out all the families among the poor quarters who had beautiful girls and who would be apt to exchange them for gold. In the course of a few days, my agent called on me, stating that he was about to go on a three days trip from the city to the house of an old broker merchant of his, who was continually in receipt of girls from the interior of the kingdom, and occasionally of a few from Circassia, that for certain reasons he never came to the city, but on receipt of any new beauties he always wrote. And he, my agent, went to his place of residence and either bargained for or took the females to Constantinople and sold them on commission. He said that when I first called on him he wrote to his correspondent in the country who replied that he had several very fine girls, one in particular whom he named Ibzaidu, who, he said, was fit to adorn the harem of the Grand Sultan. I told my agent, Ali Hassan, to start immediately and to bring the lot, if they were beautiful, to the city. In the interim of his absence, attended by my interpreter, I sauntered day and night through the streets and bazaars, endeavoring to spy out some of the beauties of the place, but all in vain. I could not catch even a glimpse of a female face. On the evening of the ninth day from his leaving me, Ali called on me, saying that he had brought with him seven slaves, who were safe in his harem, and invited me to call at his house in the morning and examine them. He ran perfectly wild in his praises of Ibzaido, whom he pronounced to be more beautiful than Auri, the knee plus ultra, of Circassian beauty. About eleven o'clock the following day, I went to Alice's house and immediately entered on business. He retired for a few minutes to give orders for the slaves to prepare for my visit. In the course of half an hour, a eunuch entered, made a salam to his master, and retired. Ali arose and, inviting me to follow, led the way into a large and elegantly furnished apartment in his harem. On entering, I beheld six girls seated on the cushions at one side of the room, dressed in loose Turkish pants of white satin, and vested of rich embroidered stuff. In the center of the room was a couch, and at one end of it stood two eunuchs. After surveying them as they sat, and noting their different styles of beauty knowing it to be customary, I told Ali that I wished to examine them in a perfectly naked state, to ascertain if they were still virgins as he represented them to be, and also that I wished to see if the several parts of their bodies corresponded in beauty with their faces. He immediately led one of them out on the floor beside me, and spoke a few words to her and the others in Turkish. I then made a sign for him and the eunuchs to go out and leave me alone with the females. They retired, and taking hold of the girl's hand, I signed her to strip, which she refused to do. I entreated and urged her as well as I could by signs to do so. But she crossed her hands over her breast. Refusing to do it, I clapped my hands and Ali and his eunuchs entered. I merely nodded my head to him when he pointed his finger at the girl. And the eunuchs caught hold of her, and in a trice stripped her naked. I then went up to her, laid my hand on her firm round bubbies, pressed and molded them, felt her waist, rubbed my hand lower down. Onto the mossy covering of her cunt, she sprang from me, and catching up some of her clothes, wrapped them round her body, and sat down in one corner. Ali stamped his foot on the floor. 
and the eunuchs took her and carrying her threw her on her back on the couch. One held her down by the shoulders, while the other caught hold of one leg and Ali of the other. Stretching them wide apart, I fell on my knees between them, and with my fingers opened the lips of her cunt. On attempting to insert one of them into it, and finding that I could barely force the tips in, which caused her to wince and cry out, and to twist her backside about, I desisted, firmly persuaded that she had her maidenhead inviolate. Whilst they held her on the couch, I examined, felt, and kissed every part of her, and having provided myself with such things on purpose, I placed on her wrist, neck, and finger a bracelet, necklace, and ring. Making a sign, they let her rise, and giving her her clothes. She dressed and sat down much pleased with, and examining her jewels. I now let out another girl, and made a sign for her to undress which she took no notice of, standing with her arms crossed, and her head hanging down. I took her hands and, removing them from her breasts, proceeded to take her vest, and as she did not resist, I told Ali and his slaves to go and wait outside the room. I then stripped her of her pants and Simer, and was much pleased with her beauty. I led her up to the couch, and sitting down drew her to my side, handling her breasts, feeling her arms, belly, thighs, twining my fingers about in the luxurious growth of hair that overgrew the grotto underneath, to all of which she made no resistance. At last I laid her down on her back, and spreading her thighs apart, inspected her cunt, and found she was still possessed of all the signs of virginity. I also gave her jewels, such as I gave the first one, and inspected the balance in the same manner, picking out one after one. Two, I found not to be virgins, and one was bandy-legged although handsome in every other respect. I called in Ali and inquired where the beautiful Ibzaidu was, desiring him to bring her to me. Ali clapped his hands and two female slaves entered leading her in. Then they retired leaving her standing before me. She was enveloped in a piece of fine Indian muslin and had a veil over her face. I raised the veil and started back in amazement at the dazzling beauty of her face. I then caught hold of the drapery in which she was enveloped, and gently drawing it from her clasp, I threw it on one side and gazed with admiration on the most ravishingly beautiful form and figure I ever beheld. Hers was one of those oval majestic figures, such as poets and mythologists attribute to Juno. I much admired her rich jet black hair which clustered in ringlets over her neck and shoulders contrasting singularly with the dazzling whiteness of her skin. Her shoulders were finely formed, her arms, plump, beautifully rounded, would cause a sigh of desire to arise in any breast, to be clasped in their embrace. Her breasts, luxuriously large, hard and firm, white as snowflakes, tipped with deliciously small nipples, of that fine pink color which so strongly denotes virginity in the possessor. Her waist was gracefully elegant and tapering her belly fine, round, and with the whiteness of alabaster, soft as the finest velvet down. Her hips were very large and wide, whilst her buttocks swelling out behind into two hillocks of snowy white flesh, firm and springy to the touch, gave token of the vivacity and liveliness, with which their owner would enter into the delicious combats of love. Her thighs were of a largeness and fleshy plumpness seldom seen in a female, with the knees small, while the calf was large in proportion to the thigh. The ankle tapering and a foot delicately small spoke plainly to the looker-on that the seat and center of love, that dear part of woman which takes away the senses of all men, was an equally small and elegant pattern. Her chin was most charmingly dimpled, her lips, full and pouting, slightly open, gave just a glimpse of two rows of ivory, which appeared set in the deep rosy flesh of her small and elegant mouth. Her nose was of the Grecian cast, her eyes of a sparkling lustrous black, and the forehead was middling high. She was, in fact, the very beau ideal of female beauty. What ease and grace reigned in every part. With what a sylph-like springy motion she moved, as I led her towards the couch on which I stretched her out. There I examined minutely all her secret charms. 
I felt and handled every part. Her cut was ravishing, beyond all description. The mossy mount of Venus swelled up into a hillock of firm flesh, surmounted and covered with rich, mossy, coal black hair, straight and fine as silk. The lips were most luscious, fat, rosy, pouting beauties. On opening them, I felt for her and found it to be extremely large, while the orifice was narrow and small indeed, apparently not larger than a girl's of eleven or twelve years of age. God of love! I exclaimed on viewing it. Here is a maidenhead that might have tempted Jupiter from Olympus, a prophet from the arms of the Auris in paradise, or an anchorite from his cell. Handling and examining so many lovely things had set me on fire, and I could hardly restrain myself from immolating her on the altar as a sacrificial offering to the god of voluptuous love. I drew myself away from her and signed her to rise up and resume her drapery. I then concluded the bargain for the purchase of Ibzaidu, and for the first three, I had chosen. After settling with Ali, I told him that he must let me have the use of a part of his house, including the harem during my stay, so that I should be able to guard safely my slaves and to have for them proper attendance. Also that he must instantly purchase for me six or eight mutes and eunuchs, which he immediately set about, whilst I returned to my house to get my money, jewels, etc., and also to bring away Caroline and her companion. To be continued, Dr. Tanner's fast of forty days. A correspondent in New York writes to the editor of The Pearl to say that, for the last three weeks of the terrible experiment, the doctor's penis, which in its normal condition would be eight and a half inches when in a state of erection, was shriveled up to less than an inch in length, and no handling or frigging could induce either stiffness or emission. Julian's concert in. Now music being the food of love, I thought that I would go to Julian's concert, for I heard the price was very low. It being nearly eight o'clock, so in I toddled quick, to hear the quadrille and see great Julian shake his PR. The little staff about, and I've been told by jokers, that the ladies they do all agree, that Hez, the prince of pokers. The ladles they were highly dressed naked, almost stark, their muslin being thin enough to see the watermark. I gazed on one, a beauteous maid. Her smile was bright and sunny. She had a nice small mouth and golden hair, and a fine, full open cunny. Being so, I introduced myself to her so gentle, she said. She'd come there for an hour with something instrumental. I gently sat down by her side while glowing like a fire. The smile she gave, I must admit, I really did admire, said she. The band is going to play, said I, twill shake the walls. Oh, no, said she. That's only when great Julian shakes his ball. My bunch of rosy locks... His staff so well displayed is. He knows full well a good long piece is sure to please the ladies. The names of all the instruments she then inquired about, especially of that long brass thing that kept sliding in and out. The fingering of the double bass she thought was rather slack, and wonder Julian should engage a man who'd got the clap. Hers. They were an awful bore. And still she would insist on me telling her who'd get the horn, and who the cornet a piston. She said she liked the clarinet. Likewise, the German flute. You know all well such instruments the ladies always suit. The forty parts, they were so off they almost made us start. And the ophoclide would come in just like a thundering fart. Or peal of thunder. But not so far as India. And the French horn would pop in to join those things so windy. The place got overpowering our ears. We're tired of drumming, said she. I feel him going. You'd better be a-coming. She took my arm. We left the place. I acted as conductor. I called a cab, and on the road I freely furnished her with my ideas of Julian's improvements, and so wound up with a grand duet with many pleasing movements. My grandmother's tale, or maze, account of her introduction to the art of love. From an unsophisticated manuscript found amongst the old lady's papers, after her death, Supposed to have been written about A.D. 1797. Chapter 2. Dot. Kate's Narrative. You know I am a native of the West Indies. I was born in Santa Cruz, where my father had a plantation, and lots of slaves. 
The little boys and girls were naked until they were eight or nine years old. I remember being greatly struck with the fine little cut of the boys and wondered why they differed so from girls. The son of our overseer was just my age, about ten. He was a smart, intelligent boy, and we used to play together. His name was Joe. One day I caught him piddling and looking at his cock. I laughed and told him he ought to cut it off. It was so ugly. He said he would be sorry, for he would much rather be a man than a woman. And when I grow to be a man, he said, this will grow big. How do you know? I said, putting my hand on it. Because I have often seen men naked. Do you know what a man calls it? No. What? He calls it a prick. Oh. And do you know what he does with it? He piddles with it, I suppose, like yourself. Ah, he said, looking very sly. He does more than that. What? He can put it into a woman between her legs, in that queer little slit you girls have. There's no room for it there, I said. Yes. There is it'll show you if you'll let me, may I? He said, lifting my frock. You may? Just for a minute. He put his fingers into my cut and felt about for the opening. At last he found it, and to my surprise, pushed his forefinger out. Stop, I cried. That hurts. I want to hurt you by and by, he said, with his sly look. How? What do you mean? He'll tell you. But mind, it's a great secret. You know Jim who has the cat and flogs the slaves when they misbehave. Well, when the women are sent... He flogs their backs, but when girls are sent, he flogs their bottoms. I was near the place when a fine plump girl came from your papa with a note, which I saw afterwards. It had only these words give this girl twelve lashes. E.L. Jim brought her in, shut the door, but I stole round to a window on the other side and peeped in. He had her kneel on a bench and tied her hands to the block. Then he threw up her petticoat, uncovering her shining black bum, and took out his cat. He said, be quiet, Nori. If you let me have my will of you, I won't hurt you. But if you want ill, give it you. He opened his pantaloons and out started. Oh, such a big one. It would have frightened you as he pushed it against her bottom. She cried more than ever. He brought down the cat with a smart stinging blow on her bottom. She jumped and yelled, be quiet now, or you'll get more. She stopped while he separated her legs as widely as he could. Then stooping, he looked up into her slit, which he kept open with his fingers. I could see that it was very red inside, had plenty of black woolly hair on it. Then he put in the head of his prick, and giving a great push, it went in every bit of it. Then he withdrew it out all wet and red-looking, and putting his arms round her hips, he went on pushing in and out with all his might. She did not mind, but only poked out her bottom as if to get more of it. Then he stopped suddenly, and pressed in hard against her, after which he untied her, and giving her a kiss, sent her away. That's very odd, Joe. It must have hurt her very much. Indeed, it didn't. She liked it beyond anything. I know it by the way she stuck out her bottom. Will you just try and you'll feel how pleasant it is? My amorous feelings were aroused so I did not object to his having a trial. I kneeled on the seat, as he told me, and jutted out my bottom. He tried to get his c*** into my slit, but failed. I put down my hand and kept the lips open, but whether from my immaturity or his inexperience, he could not succeed. A few days afterwards, he came running up to me in great glee, crying out, I can do it now, Katie. I can do it now. Stop your noise. What do you mean? Stay, Katie, and I will tell you. You know father and I live in the cottage. He has, however, generally one or two of the slave girls with him in the evening. They like to come to him, for they get plenty of rum, and are sure of a half-holiday next day. He sends me to bed and then produces the rum, sugar, and water. Last night he had three with him. He sent me off to bed as usual, but I hid behind the door. They soon became very merry over the drink and capered about in style. He threw up their petticoats, slapping their bottoms and tickled their cuss while they pulled out his prick and handled his balls. Then he made them undress and chased them naked around the room. Whenever he caught one he felt her cunt 
and making her kneel would stick his prick into it from behind, while the others tickled his balls and bottom. In the midst of the fun, one of them suddenly opened the door, and spying on me, seized me, and dragging me into the room, cried out, Oh, here's Massa Joe playing Bo Peep. What shall we do with him? Let's strip him, cried another, and we will make him f fanny. She is the youngest, and her c will fit his little prick best. My father only laughed and said, All right, hell be man enough for any of you some of these days. So I was stripped, nothing loath, and placed over Fanny, who was lying on the floor. She had her legs wide apart, and with her fingers kept the lips of her c open, while one of the others, after kissing and sucking my little cock, pushed it in. Then they clapped my bottom, and sat around to watch the performance. Oh, Katie, you can't think how easy my prick slipped into her cunt. And I felt it growing bigger when it got in, she was so hot inside. She then hugged me in her arms and jerked up her bottom, while I worked and pushed, as I had seen father do until the nice warm feeling came, and I nearly fainted with pleasure. I was then glad to get away and creep off to bed, for I was tired and sleepy. Look at it, Katie. Isn't it larger and stronger than before? He held it in his hand and drew back the skin until its head stood up round and red as a cherry. Put your hand, oh it, Katie. Feel how firm it is. I took it in my hand and rubbed it up and down. Yes, Joe, it is larger and stronger. You may put it in if you like. He laid me back, lifted my dress and looked at and felt my cunt. Yours is much prettier and nicer than Fanny's, Katie. These soft, round, white lips are beautiful. Hold them open, like a dear girl, while I push it in. I put my hands down in opening the lips with one, while with the other I directed the head of his prick to the right spot, and told him to push. He did so. It entered. He pushed harder. It got in more and more until it was all enclosed, and I felt its head far back. Oh, sweet sensation. Nothing can exceed the pleasure of feeling one's c for the first time, filled up with a throbbing, heaving prick. His eyes sparkled, and his breath came hard and fast as I hugged him in my arms and told him to push in his prick and f me very well. Having now ascertained for ourselves the wondrous power we each possessed of conferring pleasure on the other, our play always turned on the practice and enjoyment of love. We were never tired of examining and petting each other's privates. And our senses being now fully aroused, we were always the watch to enlarge our experience of the ways and means enjoyment. My father had several slaves almost white, and most of them good-looking. These were all retained in the house, and never sent into the fields. One pretty little girl named Nina was assigned to me as my waiting maid. She always attended me in my bath, and used to dry me when I came out. She was particularly attentive to my little slit, on which the hair was just beginning to grow. She used to perfume it, and comb it, and kiss it. You have a beautiful cunt, Missy. The sight of it would set any young fellow wild. I suppose it is much the same as other girls, your own for instance. Show it to me, Nina. She lifted her dress, and opening her thighs, gave me a full view of her cunt. It was a pretty little mouth, with a full rosebud clitoris, and the lips covered with brown silky hair. I put my hand on it, and pushing up my finger, said did this. Ever said any young fellow while? Oh, Missy, you must not ask me such questions, or I will have to tell you lies. Nina, if you want me to be your friend, you will tell everything. But this will do for the present. My father was in the habit of walking in the garden after sunset when it was nearly dark, to smoke his cigar, and I found out that he always had with him one or the other of the white slaves. One night I missed Nina. In guessing where she was, I threw on my shawl and went out softly into the garden. I heard voices in a sheltered walk, and as it was almost dark, I was able to get within range of hearing without being seen. Now, Nina, be kind and you will be my pet, and I will give you all sorts of pretty things there. Let me feel it. That's a sweet girl. Open your legs more, lean against this tree, hold up your dress, give me your hand, place it here, close your fingers round it. That's the way. You have a dear little cunt, very fat and plump, but I wonder you have much hair on it. 
How old are you, Mina? Just fifteen, sir. Now then, press out in front. Hold my prick while I push it there. It's in. Put your arms round me. Press my butt. How do you like the feel of my prick in your cunt? It feels very nice. Push it in more. I heard them kissing and panting as they shoved together, and then they rested in each other's arms. She soon left him after promising to go out at that same hour that day every week. I often followed him out now, and found he always had one of the slave girls with him. I then learned all the terms and ways of enjoyment, for he was fond of variety, and loved to make them talk, and say all manner of words while he f them. And I was astonished to hear how freely they spoke of pricks, cunts, arses, frigging, f pissing, etc. Joe had been sent to school, and my cunt, not having been entered for a long time, was in an aggravated state of longing and desire. So when Nina's turn came next, the thought flashed upon me. Why not personate her for one occasion? I was about her height and size, and my cunt was now pretty well furnished with hair. So when the hour came, I set her to a task which would occupy her for some time, and said I was in a hurry to have it done. Then, going out in the dark, I quietly strolled up the walk. Someone met me, put his arm round me, and pushed his knee in between my thighs. How was your sweet cut tonight? I said nothing but only pressed against him as he lifted my dress and felt my cunt. Moving his finger about, he said it's very hot and juicy tonight. I am sure it is longing for a f- Put your hand here, my love. I felt his firm upstanding prick. I moved the loose skin up and down as Joe had taught me. I put my other hand below and felt the two soft balls in their hairy bag. Take it in your mouth, dear, for a moment. I had gone too far to recede now, so I stooped and sucked its glowing head while I tickled him behind the balls. Oh, Nina, that's delicious. Now lie back on this moss bank. Raise your legs. Open your dress, that I may press your soft bubbies while my prick is in your cunt. He knelt between my uplifted thighs. He leaned over me. He opened the lips of my cunt. He introduced his prick. He molded my breasts. He kissed me and darted his tongue into my mouth. Say you like it, Nina, my love. Oh, yes, dearest sir. I whispered, heaving up my bottom. I feel your prick in my cunt. Fucking fu- Oh. So delicious. The rapturous feeling increased. He pushed and panted. I heaved and gasped. Oh, yes. Push for- Oh, oh. He lay over me, his face on my shoulder, and his prick buried in my cunt. After a while, he said, I don't know how it is, Nina, but I never enjoyed f you so much before. Your cunt closes on my prick with such a hot compression. And you nipped the head of my prick when I drove it home as you never did before. And which only a few women can do. Oh, there. I feel it now. Here I interrupted Kate by asking what do you mean by nipping the head of his prick? Well, my dear, it'll teach you. When you feel the entire prick driven in as far as it can go, draw up your bottom inside as hard as you can. If you do it right, you will squeeze the head of the prick as it rests on the mouth of your womb. Try it now while I have my finger in. Yes, that's the way. Well, go on. What did he say next? He asked me, Is Miss Kate kind to you? She is, I whispered in reply. Don't you attend her in the bar? Yes. Does she let you see her cunt? Yes. I dry it, and sometimes kiss it. Is it a nice little cunt? Very nice. Do you think she has any longing to have it f- I'm sure she has. It is always red and hot. I guessed as much. Indeed, I often think of it when I observe her swelling hips. How I would enjoy f her, if I could only do it without letting her know who it was. Perhaps I could manage it for you. Come to my bed tomorrow night, and ill prevail on her to take my place. Ill tell her I expect a young fellow who will take her for me, and give her the greatest pleasure but without doing her any harm. If you find the door of my room unlocked, you will know I succeeded. Next evening, Papa did not go out at all, and I saw he was regarding me with a peculiar look in his eyes. He was also more affectionate and made me sit on his knee when I was bidding him good night, and he pressed my bottom and thighs in the warmest way.
Nina readily agreed to my taking her place for the night when I told her I'd been restless of late and thought a change of my bed would do me good. About midnight, someone entered the room and felt his way to where he heard me breathing. He quietly put off his clothes and slipped into bed. He put his arm over me and felt my cunt. He opened the lips and rubbed about the clitoris, and then tried to push his finger up. I held his hand. Oh, you hurt me. Why, you are not my Nina at all. No, I am only Nina's friend. Well, whoever you are, you have a sweet cunt. Put your hand on this. It won't hurt you. But it will do me harm. No, trust me, my pet. I won't harm you. He then got over me and began to push his prick against my cunt. Oh no, I can't, I'm afraid. Oh, pray don't. It is too big. I held him by the hips and pushed him back. I can't bear it. It will kill me. Every time he pushed the head of his prick at the entrance, I shrank from him. He begged me. He prayed me just to let it in. And he would be so very gentle. He got it in a little way inside the entrance. Oh, push easily, or you'll kill me. Ow! Oh, there. Now it is quite in. My precious, I shall not hurt you anymore. He moved his prick very slowly in and out, in and out. I began to heave and twist. Darling, this is exquisite. Your cut is delightfully tight, and its soft pressure most delicious. Put your arms round me, my love. I only once before had such a fuck as this. I pressed him in my arms, thrust up my bottom to meet every thrust of his prick. I raised my thighs and crossed my legs on his back. He ran his prick with delightful friction in and out of my throbbing, heaving, panting cunt. I felt a soft hand on my bottom, and soft fingers playing about my cunt. I knew they were Ninus. I did not mind. I was intoxicated with pleasure. I squeezed in my bottom to nip his prick. Oh! said Da. That's grand who taught you that sweet trick, do it again. Oh, that's splendid. Nina got into the bed and pressed against his bottom. Oh, Nina, you are just in time. Let me get on you that I may spend in your cunt. He drew out his prick, saying to me, You know I promise not to harm you, but Nina does not mind the risk, for she knows she will be well taken care of. Let us get outside the clothes and take off everything. The night is so warm. He then got between her uplifted thighs, and resting on her breast, told me to put it in. I felt her cunt. It was very hot and flowing. I took his prick and rubbed its throbbing head between the soft lips, placed it at the entrance. He pushed. It passed in. I went behind him and holding him around the hips, rubbed my cunt against his bottom while he f He discharged immediately. And soon afterwards, he bid us goodnight and went away. Nina begged me to excuse her. She said she heard all that passed and got so excited that she could not help coming in to us. I asked, did Papa know who your friend was? She said she was not certain, but thought he did. There was something peculiar about Papa's manner the next morning. He put his arms around me several times, called me his sweet girl, his darling pet. He told me he was making arrangements to send me to England to have my education completed there. He told me that he had taken my passage in a sugar break which was to start in a few days, and which was commanded by a friend of his, a Captain Lemberg, who would take good care of me. I said I would like it very much, but would be sorry to leave him and put my arms around his neck kissing him. He enfolded me in his, he lifted me off the ground, carrying me to a sofa, and laid me down. He sat by me and slipping his hand under my dress, put it on my naked bottom. My darling, he said, let me pet you. I feel so fond of you and I want to have you long. Dearest Papa, you may do anything you please with me. I love to give you pleasure. He kissed me warmly, turned me on my back, lifted my dress, opened my thighs and looked at my cunt. You are beautifully made here. Tell me, my darling, was it you in Ninus' bed last night? It was I. Dearest Papa, was I very wicked? No, my darling, you gave me the sweetest pleasure I ever had in my life. Did you enjoy what I did to you then? I did, indeed. It was most delightful. Might I do it to you again? You may, dear Papa, if you like. He drew me to the end of the sofa, made me raise my legs and open them as widely as possible. 
Then kneeling on the floor, he kissed my cunt. He praised its shape and color. He opened the lips, put in his tongue, and licked the inside round and round. He introduced his prick, pushing it slowly up, and fucked me most delightfully. I tried all I could to increase and intensify his pleasure. I asked if he was enjoying it much. Do you like it, Papa? Yes, my sweet pet. Your cut is perfection itself. I envy the man who gets you for a wife. I now ventured on a request I had long in mind. Dear Papa, I have one thing to ask you for. What is it, my pet? I would do anything in the world to gratify you. Will you give Nina her freedom and send her to England with me? Surely, my pet, I will do more if she marries with your consent and approbation. I will allow you to present her with a fifty dowry. And besides, you may order whatever dress she may require for the voyage. Need I describe the response I made to these kind words? How I clung to him. How I tightened the pleasure girths within. What a glowing reception I gave to his prick as it darted into my quivering cunt, or how he grunted his satisfaction. Okay. Um. Katie, my pet. Nina was overjoyed when she heard that she was to have her freedom. She thanked me on her knees and promised to be the most faithful of servants. Now, dearest May, I have told you more than ever I told anyone else, because I find in you a kindred soul, and I want someone to sympathize with me. Don't judge me too harshly. I was little more than a child and alone. My father has been a widower ever since I could remember. Do you love me less? No, dearest Kate. I love you a hundred times more for your confidence and affection. But go on and tell me about the voyage and how you first met Papa. I will, dearest, but not tonight. I am tired and sleepy. Kiss me, my love. Good night. To be continued. That interesting old roadside public house, the cock, at Kennington, has lately been redecorated. The signpost was surmounted by an effigy of Chanticleer, who shone resplendent in new gold leaf. Enters Mr. Robinson, a neighboring pawnbroker who thus addresses the barmaid, Your house now looks charming, my dear. Will you tell the painter who gilt your governor's c to come and gild my balls? The barmaid broke a wine glass in her blushing confusion. Funkyania, or Belgravian morals. By Charles. Chapter 1. It is understood a useful, and it certainly is a commendable practice, that in bringing a book before the public, the author should say a few words by way of introduction, and of excuse, I presume, for his writing the book at all. But as I have very little to say about my antecedents, and even that not of a very exalted or interesting character, I shall plunge at once in medium res, and beg the reader to follow me into the study of the Earl of Pomeroy, who was in the act of investigating my character previously, to engaging me in the somewhat anomalous, not to say duplicate, role as his own confidential secretary valet and body footman to the Countess. This, I am aware, is unusual in high families but it is not without its special utility, as I very soon had occasion to find out, that I had plenty of opportunity offered me of playing the spy. My reader can easily imagine, when I tell him that almost oh, always during the forenoon, and generally late in the evening I was in attendance in plain clothes on his lordship, and in the middle of the day and afternoon dressed in handsome livery, upon the countess sometimes at home, sometimes with her ladyship's carriage. That I should give a preference to the service with the lady, perhaps was natural. For not only was her ladyship's personal attendant, Justine, very pretty, but she showed her admiration for your humble servant in the most distinguished manner. Bauver, my vanity led me to suppose that my handsome mistress, the Countess, was not altogether insensible to the gratification of being attentively and devotedly waited upon by a good-looking youth, though he might be twenty years old, and she thirty at least. I think we have heard of such things before in the pages of history, dear reader, and I rather fancy we have heard of such charming characters as Catherine of Russia and one or two queens of Spain. At any rate, I was not insensible to the advantage of my position, which I was determined to enjoy as long as I could, unless indeed anything occurred of so glaring a nature such as an elopement. For instance, that everybody must, as a matter of course, become aware of it, 
in which case it would become my duty to his lordship and myself to be beforehand of everybody else and disclose the plot. But in the meantime, I was pretty certain that my noble mistress was not quite so virtuous as she was beautiful. But when a woman is so charming as she was, a young man is apt to find excuses for her. And I reflect that if a Spanish or an Italian lady has her cavalier servante, or a French, Marchioness has her very particular friend, and nobody finds any fault with it, society need not be so very hard on the Countess, if she deviates slightly from the strict line of duty. But then you see, my friends, we are such a very moral people, and society is hard. One day, I particularly remember, I was on duty to attend her ladyship, who was going to take a short walk, not a very usual habit of hers. She was, for her, rather plainly dressed, and I noticed that the neighborhood she selected did not seem to me the most appropriate for a lady of title to take the air on foot. But as long as she was not insulted or otherwise inconvenienced, that was no business of mine, but presently, I considered it my duty to call the Countess' attention to the fact that it was beginning to rain. So it is. How provoking, was my lady's exclamation. But to my natural suggestion that I should call a cab, she replied in the negative, telling me that she was only a few doors from the house of a former servant in the family who lived at number so-and-so, that she would step in and rest, that I should remain at the public house at the corner for half an hour or so, and then, if the rain had not ceased, I should bring a cab for her, asking for her nurse. Mrs. Wilson. Now, the reader will do my intellectual powers injustice if he considers that I did not understand all this thoroughly well. But I only touched my hat respectfully and repaired to the public house, where, as the rain had not ceased and I thought it a pity to disturb, my lady in her interview with her nurse, I remained about an hour, and I am bound to say the Countess did not find fault with my delay. I suppose that she must have enjoyed her nurse's society so much indeed. Nor is it to be wondered at that my suspicions were correct, and that the said nurse took the shape of a handsome young man, and that, reversing the order of things, instead of he nursing her, she nursed her nurse. It is to be hoped the nursing did her good, but she certainly did not see much the better for it, as she was very quiet and pale, and on arrival home passed two or three hours on the sofa, and on another occasion, I was ordered to accompany her on a short drive, when, of course, as the brougham was put in requisition, I sat beside the coachman. We had not gone far, and were still in the neighborhood of the park, when I noticed a young lady standing on the footpath, as if in expectation of our arrival. No sooner did my Lady Pomeroy behold her than she pulled the check rein and ordered me to let in her young friend, Miss Courtney, whom she wished to take for a drive. Of course I did so with all speed, and a most outrageously affectionate reception at reception inside the carriage Miss Courtney met with. Such a desperate kissing and hugging compressed into the space of a half minute while I was putting in her skirts and shutting the door, I had never seen equal. During the transient glimpse I had of their embrace, I am almost sure I saw Miss Courtney thrust her tongue most amorously. Between the Countess' lips, and also take several indescribable liberties with the sacred person of my mistress. And yet, Justine knew something of the science of kissing and hugging, too, and had initiated me into, I supposed, every branch of the mystery. But on this occasion, there was something more or something almost indelicate, by which, taken in combination with other little matters, almost as trifling, my attention was excited most curiously. It will be easily understood by my judicious readers that I was naturally an adept where ladies were concerned, and had in my capacity as a young footman considerably brightened and improved any previous ideas I may have possessed. And, in this case, I was sharp enough to see that though Miss Courtney was well-dressed, she was not very well-dressed. That is to say, though her clothes were of rich, fashionable materials, they looked as if they had not been fitted by a first-class modest or put on by a lady's maid who was up to her business. Then she did not step into the carriage like a young lady. She grasped the side handle and sprang in without touching my arm in the first place. In the second place, I have noticed that young ladies in getting in and out a carriage, however modest, 
and even prudish they may be, are by no means averse to display their pretty ankles, and even, well, excelsior, up higher a little peep of legs besides. In fact, I've seen the mossy grotto itself when the drawers happen to favor me. Well, there is nothing improper in that, and decidedly, nothing unpleasant. But Miss Courtney exhibited her lower limbs up to the knee, making not the slightest attempt to conceal them. And very fine legs they were too only. Somehow, somehow, they did not appear to me like young ladies' legs. There is a marked difference in this respect I perfectly well know. For example, I may say without vanity that I have a very handsome pair of legs. Well, and so has Mademoiselle Justine. But then there is a great difference. Of course there is. I fancy I hear my reader suggesting. Come, none of that, sir, I reply. I meant as to legs simply as to legs. And to return to my subject. The decidedly manly look of the young lady's legs, taken in conjunction with her dress, her style altogether, and the peculiar nature of the caresses, exchanged. Between her and a countess, all these little incidents put together. I repeat produced strong suspicions in my mind as to the sex of our young passenger. But I need not have troubled myself to have entertained any suspicions at all. At any rate, they soon became certainties. For presently I took upon myself to ask Robert the coachman where he was driving. And why was he driving so horribly slow? To my first inquiry he replied that he was going to drive along St. John's Wood Road, and in the second place affirmed that he was too compassionate a disposition to two handsome creatures that had never done him harm. I stared at him, for I presumed he referred to the handsome pair of chestnut horses. But when he followed up his remark by gravely saying that it did not matter at what pace he drove for, there was nobody in the carriage. I thought at first he must be mad or drunk, but on turning my head round the whole truth flashed upon me at once. Sure enough, the carriage was supposed to be empty for all of the blinds were closed. Don't you know the peephole? said my friend John. Our coach builder made it on purpose to please me, or I ought to say, Lord Pomeroy. He put me up to it and sometimes rides on the box with me, and says it's far more pleasure to see his wife f by a fine young fellow than to have the trouble to do it himself. You don't mean that, I replied. Yes, no humbug between ourselves. Old Palm only cares for page boys, ladies' maids, or some other man's wife or daughters. Nothing like breaking the Ten Commandments is his favorite saying. You'll find that hole in the roof. A little bit slides back just behind you. Eager to see something of real life, the slide was noiselessly pushed back, till I could see every part of the interior of the brougham. There sat my lady billing and cooing with Miss Courtney. How flushed they looked as their impassioned kisses too plainly told the depth of their feelings. They were sitting side by side, and the first act of their little love drama was evidently just over. But the curtain had not yet fallen, for the countess dress was raised to her navel, and I could see the jeweled hand of Miss Courtney groping between her lovely thighs. But that was nothing to the sight of the manly root with which that young lady was furnished at the bottom of her belly which, although rather drooping, was still glistening with the cream of love, as the countess continued to caress it in her milk-white hand, gently uncovering the fire-looking red head of her delight, as the motion of her fingers seemed to make a mute appeal to its further gallantry. My curiosity was quite satisfied, and we let them enjoy themselves in peace for the rest of the drive. To be continued, Lady Polkingham, or they all do it giving an account of her luxurious adventures, both before and after her marriage with Lord Crimcon. Hart fee, continued. My peephole afforded me the sight of many more luscious scenes between Lady Cecilia and her husband, before I left town to take up my residence at Hastings for the benefit of my health. My agent had secured and furnished for me a pretty little detached residence of thirteen or fourteen rooms, surrounded by gardens and orchards so as to be delightfully free from the prime curiosity of my neighbors. The household consisted of a cook and housekeeper, both young persons not exceeding twenty-four or five years of age, the latter being the daughter of a decayed merchant, a most pleasant and intelligent companion. But up to the time I engaged her, strictly prudish, virtuous, 
Being naturally fond of young boys and girls, we had also two very pretty page boys of about the age of now, 15 or 16, and two beautiful young girls about the same age, instead of housemaid and lady's maid. At first I felt considerably enervated by the little excesses I had been a party to, or witnessed, while staying with the new earl, but the soft, bracing air of the southern coast soon made me feel more like myself again, and longed to indulge in the delicious dalliances of love, to which my warm temperament made me always so inclined. The result was that I determined to seduce every member of my virgin household, each one of whom I believed to be thoroughly virtuous, up to their entering my service. The two youngest girls, as my special attendants, slept in the next room to mine, and had a door of communication by which the two rooms entered into the other without the necessity of going into the corridor. I had quite a passion come over me to gamahoosh these two pretty young things, and make them thoroughly subservient to my purposes. You may be sure I was not long in putting my plans in operation, as soon as I had sketched them all out in my brain. That very same evening, after my two pretty demoiselles had put the finishing touches to my toilet, and left me sitting in my chemise de nuit, in front of a cozy fire with my feet resting on the fender, as I pretended to be reading a thrilling romance. Leave that door open, my dears, I said, as they respectfully bid me good night. I feel so dull, perhaps I shall call for you to keep me company, if I feel that I cannot go to sleep. In a few minutes I heard them tittering and laughing. Now, girls, I cried, come here this moment. I want to know what you are having such fun about. Come just as you are. No putting anything more on, or waiting to hide your blushes. Annie! Hattie! Do you hear? Right of making me angry. The two girls came blushing into my room just as they were, in their nightgowns. Well now, what is it that is amusing you so? Please, my lady, it was Patty, said Annie with a wicked look at her companion. Ah, no, you fibber. My lady, it was Annie began it, retorted the other, looking quite abashed. Nothing could be got out of them, each saying it was the other. At last I said I can guess pretty well what you two girls were amusing yourselves about now. Tell me truly, were you looking at each other's privates in the glass? This question hit the mark and seeing how shamefaced and blushing they both were, I went on no doubt, examining to see which one showed most signs of hair on her little pussy. Let me see Annie, as I suddenly caught the bottom of her nightdress, and in an instant had it reversed over her head, so as to cover up her face and expose all the rest of her beautiful little figure. Why, the impudent little thing hasn't a hair to boast of. Give her bottom a good slap in Patty. Patty was only too pleased to do it and the slaps fairly echoed through the room, mingling with Annie's piteous cries to let her go. My blood was up, the sight of her beautiful bum, all flushed and rosy under the sharply administered slaps, made me fairly lust to take further liberties. So I let the little victim go, whispering in her ear, and her tearful eyes were brightened in a moment. She darted at Patty and sooner than it takes to write was dragging her about the room fully exposed, with her head and arms secured in her reversed nightdress. I amused myself by slapping poor Patty's pretty posteriors till they were almost black and blue, regardless of her sobbing and crying for mercy. At last we let her go, and I took her on my lap to kiss away her tears. She soon smiled again and nestled herself to my body quite lovingly. This seemed to make her companion almost jealous as she appealed to me with a flushed face to kiss her also, which I readily did in the most loving manner, and I asked her to fetch a decanter of wine and some glasses from a cabinet, saying I felt so dull and sleepless I must have something to cheer me. Ah, my dear lady, exclaimed Patty, kissing me again and again, you don't know how we all love you and feel for you, being left alone and unhappy. There is nothing we wouldn't do to bring a smile to your pale face. Then, well, sleep together and have a romp on the bed. Only mind, you are good girls, and never tell your mistress doings, I replied, taking a glass of wine and ordering them to do the same. A second and a third glass seemed to open their eyes immensely. The least touch or joke sent them into fits of laughter. They blushed and seemed quite excited. In fact, Patty 
who had remained on my knee, was almost ready to faint with emotion as she caressed my face and bosom, the cause being a hand I had managed to slip under her nightdress, so that one finger had been tickling and playing with her almost hairless slit and gradually working her up to a state of excitement she was at a loss to comprehend. Let us all be naked. Throw off every rag, my dear ones. I want to feel your soft, warm flesh next to mine, to cuddle you, and feel you all over. Shall I read a pretty little piece of poetry about a potter who married your namesake, Patty? I said, and seeing they were ready for anything, told Annie to bring me a manuscript called The Haunted House from a drawer in the cabinet. Now listen to the tale of a potter and don't laugh till it is finished. You will find it rather free, but nothing more than big girls like you ought to know. Then I commenced. Young Hodge, he was a worthy wise. A potter he by trade. He fell in love with Martha Price. She was a parson's maid. This Hodge worked amongst his pans, his pots, his mugs, his delf. He said a sad fate is a man's, when he is by himself. Now soon ill marry Martha Price. A nice snug home I've got. The parson soon the knot shall splice. And well, both piss in one pot. Then Hodge he made a pretty pot, and took it to his love, said he. I've brought this pot to show. I mean your love to prove. Now, name the day, the happy day. Whose night shall bring me bliss, when your sweet cut and my stiff prick shall mingle in this their piss. They married were within a week, and Hodge he was in luck. He took sweet Patty's maidenhead with his first vigorous fuck. Then in her arms he fell asleep, but started with a fright, and in the middle of the bed he sat up bold and white. Oh, love, oh, love, I've... Had a dream, a dream to cause me fright. I dreamed we both were in my shop, and there I hugged you tight. I dreamed I went your cheek to kiss. We romped with hugs and squeezes. When down I knocked the pots and pans, and broke them all in pieces. Then Martha answered with a laugh. No pots you've broke, good man, but much I fear this very night. You've a cracked a patty pan, and from that night unto this day, Hodge in that crack would pop, a prick as thick as any brick, but the crack he cannot stop. So maids beware, heed well your pans. With this my tale is ended. If your pans cracked by a prick of man, it never can be mended. Throwing down the manuscript, I had a finger in each of their cracks sooner than it takes to write. What darling little pans each of you has. I long to throw you on the bed and kiss them. What do you think of mine with its soft, curly hair? Only it's a broken pan, you know, my dears, as I've of course had my husband. La. And was that really so nice, dear lady? Oh, I love you so. Do let me look, exclaimed Patty, slipping off my knee and kneeling between my legs to get a better sight of the object of her curiosity, which she first kissed most lovingly. And then... Parting the hair, put a couple of fingers light up my cunt. This so tickled and delighted me that I leant back in the chair and pulled Annie close to my bosom as I hugged and kissed her, whilst I still had a finger in her little slit, as far as it would go. My legs also mechanically opened to facilitate inspection, as Patty exclaimed. How deep my two fingers can go right up, and it is so warm and moist. It makes me feel I could eat it. In a few minutes, we were all tossing on my bed in a state of nature. They laughed, screamed, and blushed as I excitedly examined and kissed their respective cunnies. How my tongue reveled around their budding clitorises till they rewarded me with those first virgin emissions, which are always so deliciously thick and creamy. How lovingly they both repaid all my caresses, Patty paying the most ardent attentions to my cunt, which delighted her more and more every moment whilst Annie seemed to prefer sucking my bubbies as I gamashed her. What a treat it would be to see you both lose your maidenheads at once, I exclaimed. Ah, couldn't the pages do it for us, dear lady? I do love that Charlie so, appealed Patty without consideration in her excitement. 
I'll try and manage it. But we must be careful not to let them into our secrets before I can find out how they are disposed, I reply. Oh, I know Charlie is a rude, bold little fellow. Wicked enough for anything if he had the chance. What do you think I once actually caught him handling his affair in the pantry when he thought no one was looking and when I happened to enter suddenly, it was sticking out straight and red looking at the top. His face was quite red and he seemed rather short of breath, but the impudent fellow, like the daredevil he is, shook it fairly in my face as he asked me to give him a kiss. Saying, what do you think of this, Patty? That's how it gets. When, oh, mistress, I can't tell you all, he said. But I pressed her, and at last she told me it was when we had been waiting on his mistress. Oh, Patty, he said. Isn't she lovely? Such mouth and teeth and loving eyes. I feel as if I could jump at her. I do. Very well, Master Charlie. I laughed. Perhaps I shouldn't so much mind if you did. When we are alone some day, I will give him the chance and let you two dears know all about it. But I will first read you another psalm from the haunted house. And tomorrow I will give you a copy. And I expect both to be able to sing it soon. Live and learn. Two drops of brandy. When I was little and good, a long time ago, I'm afraid, Miss, a stiff prick was not understood. I was a quiet little, shy little maid, Miss. I knew but one use for my cunt. I knew not what joy it would afford me. The sight of a c would affront. And talk about fun have bored me. But now, oh, much wiser I've grown. I'll stretch my legs open for any. My modest shy feelings have flown. And f why I can't get too many. I like a stiff prick up my arse. Though too much of that makes you bandy. When I look at my quim in the glass... It always pouts red and looks randy. I like a f morn, noon and night, on every weekday and Sunday. If him f on the Sabbath, all right? But I want to be buggered on Monday. Oh, let it be hot or be cold. I'm always alive for a cock, missing. Men, fair, dark, young or old. Here is a hole that I'll take in their jock, miss. I can spend for an hour at a time. My cut is as hot as fire, sir. The man that says f*** is crime. I say to his face, Has a liar, sir? Then give me a prick in each hand. Turn my ass north. My cut to the south. And get in your jocks well to stand. One in each hole. And one in my mouth. Ill f*** and ill suck. And ill frig. Until you're all quite bloody well spent, sir. Then... Ill take in the lodgers again. And never once ask them for rent, sir. Hurrah. For my cunt, my best friend. Hurrah. For a cunt to kiss, sir. Ill f till this life comes to end. I hope, too, there's f and bliss, sir. When we awoke in the morning, it was too late for a repetition of our tribadism. So I made them get up quickly and bring him breakfast. Promising to look after Master Charlie during the day. To be continued. Overheard at the aquarium. Swell. Damn it! All the same flag-hopping faces. Not a fresh bit of c here. I'd eat give anything if I could f the princess of Muzalu and bugger the old man of the woods. Just as we were going to press an anonymous correspondent in board Admiral Seymour's ship at Ragusa, has favored the editor with the following. A propos of the naval demonstration. Ho bugger the tur. I, said Gladstone, as chief of the nation and Premier of England, to gain reputation. Il bugger the Turk, and near let him sure. My prick's grand demonstration. It has been suggested that this work be split into multiple pages. If you'd like to help, please review the style guidelines and help pages. La Rose d'Amour, or The Adventures of a Gentleman in Search of Pleasure, translated from the French. Part Vist. In the evening I had arranged everything, and was seated on a pile of rich cushions in one of the apartments of Alice Harem, my head reclining on the breast of the voluptuous Circassian, Ibzaidu, or Cluster of Pearls, as her name signified, surrounded by my other slaves, whom I gave to. Ibzaidu for servants in who, I was determined, should reign supreme until such time 
as I should find someone more beautiful than herself. I had opened my caskets of jewels and adorned her wrists, arms, neck, head and ankles with jewels of massy gold of western and oriental workmanship, and it seemed that she would never tire looking at and playing with them as a child would, with a painted bauble. Before night my host came in, bringing with him mutes and eunuchs, and he showed me through the suite of apartments devoted to my service, one of which I found to be a bedchamber, fitted up with the utmost elegance, containing twenty single beds. Here it was that I slept among my concubines, or rather I should say that I lay with them, for I deserted all the others with whom I ought to have had some connection to repose. In the arms of Ibzaidu, who, when she saw me advancing to her bedside, stretched out her arms to me, and kicking off the cover, moved to the further side of the bed to make room for me. I entered her bed, and lay with my cheek resting on her bosom the night long. And although my prick was in splendid condition, firm and erect as a rod of ivory, yet I never once thought of letting it force an entrance to the delicate and narrow passage into the inner court of the Temple of Love. I spent about three weeks before I met with any more prizes, partly in the city, part of the time at the Villa of Alice on the banks of the Bosphorus in the company of Ibzaidu alone, leaving the other females in the city under the care of the eunuchs. During one of my visits at the villa, I was surprised one evening, while walking along the terrace of the garden to see Ali dashing up the road at full speed, mounted on a full-blood Arabian. I descended to the gate and met him, to inquire the news, thinking that something might be wrong at the house I occupied in the city. On inquiring, he informed me that there was a large lot of females ordered to be sold in a few days, by order of the Grand Sultan. Ali said they were the females composing the harem of some officer of the state who had been dead about one year, whose only heirs... Two nephews had been quarreling about the possession of them ever since, and that the sultan had just ordered them to be sold, and the proceeds to be divided among the two heirs. And he said that from reports circulating in the city, there must be some beautiful slaves amongst them, and he advised me to start directly for my own house, and that he would by bribery manage to get me a private interview with them, so that I could examine them at my leisure, and choose such as I would like to have and on the day of sale, he would purchase them for me. On the succeeding day, I accompanied Ali to the house of the trader, in whose keeping were the slaves. The trader met us at the door, and took me at once into a room, in which were the females. They were all enveloped in large white drapery, which covered them from head to foot. Mustafa, the trader, spoke to them, and they arranged themselves in a row round the room. Then he retired, telling me that as soon as he left the room... They would all drop their mantles, and I could examine them at leisure. Leaving me, he went out, locking the door behind him. Stepping up to the female nearest me, she cast her covering behind her. So did the others, and I feasted my eyes with a picture of voluptuousness, greater than I had ever dreamt of. There stood before me about sixty females, perfectly naked, that I think could not be excelled in any harem in the East. There were the women of Circassia with their dark, flowing tresses, eyes of piercing black and skin of dazzling whiteness, mostly contrasted by the deep carnation of their lips, the nipple of their breasts, and the jet black, bushy hair that surmounted their cunts. Again, there were the languishing, mild, blue-eyed beauties ravished from the isles of Greece, and the voluptuous Georgians even. Africa had yielded up her sable beauties to the lusts of the sometime owner of all lovely slaves who stood about me. I minutely criticized each one separately, going over their respective claims to beauty with the eye of a connoisseur. Oh, how I feasted my sight on the row of lovely, luscious cups that ran around the room. I look at, feel, touch them all, and stroke down the bushy hair that surrounds their notches. I became so much excited from the handling of so many cuts that I put my arm around the waist of one charming little creature, who by her looks must have been a great libertine, and led her into a small side apartment where, presenting her with a fine gold chain which I wore, I laid her down on a pile of cushions, and twice gave her to experience the most ecstatic pleasures before I got off her.
I gave her some time to recover from the confusion I had thrown her into, ere we returned to the apartment in which the women were standing, who took no further notice of our absence than to raise their heads, and to look at the chain which I had hung around her neck. I marched the one I had just been f with to one side, and picked out ten others, among which number was one black, a young African about fifteen years of age, who still retained her virginal rose and who was, on the whole, the most voluptuously formed female I had ever seen, and apparently better fitted for enjoying the pleasure of love than any female in my possession. Her hair was quite straight and black, as a raven's wing her breasts were full and large, as though of ivory. Her waist was slender, while her herps were spread out to a width I had never before seen. Her thighs were of a largeness to put to shame anything I had ever lain with. Having stood on one side those whom I wished to purchase, I called in the merchant and Ali, and showed them to him. And as the sale was to take place the following day, I ordered him to be punctual in attendance to purchase them for me, and left. On the following day by noon, Ali had conveyed to my apartments all the slaves that I'd chosen that night. I put four of them to the test, giving them, for the first time, to know the difference between lying in an old goat of a Turk's arms too, that of being well flicked by a young and lively Frenchman, overflowing with the precious aquavitae, which all women are so greedy after. I now spent about two weeks in enjoying these new beauties that I had bought, with the exception of those who had not been deflowered of their virginal rose by the horny-headed old lecher, their late master, and those were but three out of the number. Whilst I was thus idling away my time in the arms of my handsome slaves, my interpreter called on me one morning, and on being admitted into my mouth, presence told me that he found one of the loveliest girls in Constantinople in the house of a poor mechanic, and that on inquiry he had refused to part with her on any account or for any amount of money, but he said it might be barely possible to steal her off if I was so inclined. I promised him a large sum if he would procure her for me, and calling on Ali, my agent consulted with him as to the best means of bringing her off. They agreed to go and stay about the house at night until they saw the old man go out, and then, with the assistance of a couple of eunuchs, rush into the house, gag her, carry her out, and put her into a litter, and bring her to me, all of which I approved promising them a rich reward if they succeeded. It was not until the third night that they were able to carry her off, and I was agreeably surprised one night while reclining in pay. The arms of one of my lovely slaves to see a couple of my mutes come into my room, bearing in their arms the beautiful stolen prize. I took her out of their arms, and seating her on a cushion, I uncovered her face and took the gag from her mouth. I found her to be a lovely creature as far back as I could see, and I began stripping her, so that I might have a full view of her naked, and view all her hidden charms. Oh, what charms, what beauty met my fiery glance. I had to call on several of the women to help me hold her while I was feeling and admiring her charms. I burned with desire to enjoy her. I lavished my eager kisses on every part of her body. I fastened my lips to hers. I sucked the rosy of her breasts. The lips of her cut received more than their share. I was about to throw myself on her. But reflecting that I had determined to reserve all that had their maiden heads till after my return to France, I sprang from her, threw myself in the arms of Celestine, and buried myself up to the hilt in her, just in time to prevent the liquor from spurting all over the floor. Shortly after, Ali got me two more females, both of whom had been taken from one of the isles of the Hellespont. I had now nearly run out of money and was preparing to start home, when, by accident, I found out that Ali was reputed to have a daughter, more beautiful than any female in Constantinople, and I determined to wait a while and get possession of her by some means or other. I had not money enough left to think of offering a sum large enough to tempt his cupidity, so I made all arrangements to steal her off for which purpose I dispatched him into the country. The same day I found out the part of the house in which Ali had shut up his daughter in the hopes of keeping her from my sight, and I made everything ready for stealing her off the same night 
as soon as it was dark. I sent all my baggage and the females with the eunuchs and the mutes on board the brig. I got a litter. And with the assistance of the interpreter whom I largely paid to aid me in the enterprise, I succeeded in gaining the apartment of Selina, whom I saw to be asleep. Without any noise, we gagged her, and putting her into the litter, soon had her on board the brig with my other treasures. When we instantly steered out of the harbor and made all haste, nor did I think myself in perfect safety until we floated once more in the Mediterranean. Selina, on being released, at first made a great outcry at being carried off, and I kept out of her sight until we had been underway a couple of days. When the seasickness had tamed her wondrously, and I could approach her without having torrents of abuse and Turkish execrations heaped on my head. In fact, the whole of my passengers were sick, with the exception of Caroline, Celestine, and the Nubian slave. These three attended the rest, till they got over their seasickness, which was not until the third or fourth day with some. Then all was mirth, jollity, luscious love. After all, we're perfectly recovered. We ran up to a small, verdant, but uninhabited island in the Mediterranean, and lay to for one day and night. In the evening, I had let down into the water a very large sheet of canvas, made on purpose, supported by the corners of the yardarms of the vessel, for the purpose of letting women have a bath, ordering them to change their rich dresses for pants and shirts of plain white cotton. I took them on deck, and having stationed the sailors in the boats a yard's distant from the canvas, I plunged them one after the other into the water in the belly of the sheep. Here they amused and enjoyed themselves amazingly for an hour or more. They were then twisted up in an armchair, rigged for the purpose, and after dressing themselves, I again brought them on deck, where they romped and played about like so many young kittens or monkeys. Calling on eunuch, I ordered him to bring up some musical instruments that I had procured in Constantinople. Ibzaidu and two others played on the guzla, and sang some plaintive songs of home, in a rich, mellow voice that cast a sadness, and gloom on the spirits of all, till Celestine seized the guitar and sang me some of the songs of our own dear France. Thus we amused ourselves until late at night, having supper brought up on the deck which we partook of by moonlight. Stopping and enjoying myself by the way as I listed, it was nearly five weeks after sailing before I anchored in the harbor. Of the little creek close to the chateau in Brittany, where... After safely stowing away in the old castle my goods, women, etc. I made preparation for that which you may know in next chapter. Chapter 6 The first thing I did after one day's rest was to assign the eunuchs and mutes I had brought with me to their separate duties, which consisted solely in guarding and attending the females, either when in their apartment or when roving about in the garden or shrubberies attached to the chateau, so that they were never from under the sight of some of the slaves. After having made these arrangements, I made preparations for giving a grand entertainment to the captain and the crew of the steamer, who had conducted themselves very much to my satisfaction during the voyage, never having once intruded or infringed their privileges, always acting with great delicacy. On the evening in the Mediterranean that I had the women on the deck to bathe, the sailors would have all retired below had I not called them out, back and sent them in the boats, and now I determined to repay them their good conduct by giving them an entertainment fit for princes. In the evening I sent word to the captain and the crew to come up to the castle. In half an hour they were admitted, and having shut up the women in an apartment out of the way, I showed them through the shrubberies and garden, all of which they viewed with amazement, wondering at the richness and taste displayed in the fitting up of the castle of beauties, as they termed it. About six o'clock a servant made his appearance saying that supper was ready. I had ordered the supper to be served in the hall of the fountains, and led my guests there. We entered and sat down at the tables, and directly came trooping in all the females of my harem, and seated themselves opposite to the men. After the supper was over, Ibzaidu and some of the other women I had brought from Turkey took their instruments and gave us a concert of oriental music, after which Caroline went to the piano and Celestine sat down to a harp and played some brilliant and lively pieces of French and Italian music, upon which those of my lovely slaves who belonged to the Grecian Isles got up and danced the Romaica, 
and other dances peculiar to the country. They were followed by Ibzaidu and two other Circassians, who were attired in the costumes of their native land and danced some of the native dances. These were in their turn followed by the Georgians, after which came my sable mistress, the Nubian, dressed in petticoats reaching the knees, with an overdress of fine blue gauze. Her dance was wild and pleasing, and in throwing herself about over the floor, as her legs were bare, would show her thighs, her bare buttocks, and sometimes her black bushy knot. Celestine and Caroline rose up and stepped out on the floor to dance, and Laura sat down at the piano. They were dressed in short petticoats and dress, the same as the Nubian, and performed some lascivious dances, showing every charm which nature had graced them with. The officers and crew of the brig applauded the dance very much. About twelve o'clock I sent off the common seamen, retaining only the officers, five in number. After the seamen left us the company became mixed, officers sitting in the midst of the women, some of whom I had not frigged for a long time, and who looked with a wistful and longing eye on the men about them. And it very clear to me that were I not present, they would soon be engaged in the soft pleasures of love. Clapping my hands, a couple of eunuchs entered and pointing out Rose, Marie and Manette, and two others they, them away to an apartment I had fitted up with beds. When they came back, I took leave of the officers, and the eunuchs left the room with them to where they had put the five girls. What a pleasant surprise to both parties. The men to find the beds occupied by the five girls and the girls to find same number of men enter to them. Oh, how they panted with the pleasure of the sight. Instantly did they know why I had sent them to that apartment. After the men were gone, I sent all the women to the chamber, except a lovely Georgian and repaired to an adjoining apartment, to where the five couples were. Here I had a place so constructed that I could see all was going on in the other room without being seen. After the men had got into the room, they ran up to the beds and would have clasped the women to their breasts. But they all jumped out of bed naked, and began to undress the men, who were speedily divested of all clothing. Then what a scene of love followed. The men threw the girls on the beds who opened wide their thighs as they fell on their necks, and then jumped on them with pricks stiff as iron rods, piercing through the tender folds of the cut under them, sending joy and pleasure to their very vitals. And I could judge from the exclamations and the writhing about, and the wriggling of backsides, the hot kisses and the amorous bites on the neck, that not one had but received a double or triple dose of the sacred liquor injected into them. I think I never saw men and women f with greater zest, or derive more pleasure and enjoyment from frigging than they did. Looking at them had such an effect on myself and companion that we were obliged to retire to the bedchamber for the purpose of enjoying ourselves in like manner. In ascending a flight of stairs, my slave tripped and falling hurt herself so that on entering the room I had to seek another in whom to pour the extra liquor from the magic spring and which was about to run over for the want of pumping. The first bed I cast my eye on contained the luxurious Nubian slave, and I determined to offer up her maidenhead as the sacrificial offering to the god of love. Approaching, I motioned her to rise and follow me to the state bed whither I went. We entered the bed together both stark naked, and placing her at once in a favorable position with a cushion under her large fat bottom. I lay my length on her, and guiding the head of my prick, tried to insert it between the lips of her slit, but could not succeed. I got up, and oiling it well with ointment, I again freed the entrance and succeeded in ripping, and tearing up the works and barriers that defended her virgin rose, and found her a dish fit for the gods. Heavens! With what transports of delight did I squeeze her in my arms as I drove the arrow of love, into the deepest recess of the luscious quivering flesh, through which I had forced a passage for it. Despite the pain which my forcible entrance into her must have caused, the moment I began working in her, Celeste, the name I had given her, began moving up to me with vigor, elasticity, and a sense of pleasure utterly impossible to be looked for in one in her situation. Though young, not quite fifteen, 
and then with a notch of such a lusciously tight smallness, that even after entering her to the full length, it was with the utmost difficulty that I could work in and out of her. But with the suction caused by the tightness with which the flesh worked around the piston rod, I soon drew open the sluice of love's reservoir, and thence gushed forth a stream of far, fiery fluid which completely drenched her inmost parts, causing a shudder of pleasure to run through her whole body, that at once proclaimed to me that she was about to give proof of the joy and end ecstasy with which she had received from me the terrible lance thrust which had given her such a wound and was causing her to pour down the essence of her very soul through the gaping orifice. The oiling which her parts had received from the mutual flow of our sperm made the entrance somewhat easy, but still very tight. Towards morning, she began to realize the full enjoyment of the luscious pleasure of being well frigged as the folds of her cut from the constant friction had stretched somewhat more, causing no more than a delicious tightness, perfectly agreeable to me and which greatly enhanced the pleasure. As the first three or four times that I entered her, I found it too tight for the full enjoyment of perfect bliss, as it almost tore the foreskin off my pigo when entering, thus causing pain which detracted from the pleasure. In the morning when I descended to the breakfast table, I found those whom I had sent to spend the night with the officers of the brig so sore that they could hardly walk from the tremendous battering they received from their companions during the night. I rode out through the surrounding country during the day, and on my return in the evening in passing one of the rooms I heard considerable whispering, and listening I overheard one of the women in conversation with some men. I slyly opened the door, and imagine my astonishment at beholding Caroline, Celestine, Rosalie, and Laura in company with the four lubbery country boars I had engaged at the chateau. They were all lying on the floor, the girls with their clothes tossed up to their waists, and the men with their pricks out of their breeches and the girls playing with them, trying to instill new life and vigor into the drooping instruments which had apparently just done good service. Not being seen by them, I retired, softly closing the door, to meditate on what I should do with the guilty ones. After thinking over the subject for some time, I came to the conclusion that I had no right to do or say anything on the subject, knowing that it was the instinct of nature which prompted them to act as they had done, and recollecting that I had promised to each of them that they should never want for that, to which they were then treating themselves, I decided to say nothing about the matter unless merely to give them all a severe fright. After supper, as I was sitting in the midst of my girls in the Hall of Fountains, watching some of the Grecian women as they be winded through the mazes of the voluptuous Romaica, to the music of the Guzla, I clapped my hands and four mutes entered. I pointed out the four I had caught frigging with the servants, and ordered the mutes to seize them. They bound their wrists with silken sashes and led them up to me. I put on a savage frown and accused them of having debased themselves to the embraces of menials. This they denied and persisted in denying. I ordered the mutes to strip them and taking a slender riding switch, I began tapping Celestine with it on her bare buttocks, very lightly, just so as to cause them to blush, till they became a beautiful carmine hue, mixed in with the clear alabaster, and they all four cast themselves on their knees before me and acknowledged their fault. I then told them that it demanded a more serious punishment and that they should receive it. Now. I had ordered up from the village four of the finest-looking stout peasants to be found, and making a sign to the mutes they went out and returned leading them in blindfolded. After they were in the room I conversed with them, and ordered some chocolate to be served which I prepared, with certain drugs that would cause their amorous propensities to rise every few minutes for four hours. They were stark naked, and shortly after drinking, their lances stood erect against their bellies. I then untied the wrists of the four girls and told them to lie down on cushions prepared for the purpose. I then led a man to each and put them in one another's arms, telling the men to go in. The men instantly mounted the women and for three hours kept them working in a dead heat. Fourteen times did those men frig the women under them, changing women every now and then. At first the women enjoyed it very much, but at last got tired to death perfectly worn out, 
battered and bruised to pieces. The lips of their slits gaping wide open, flabby and swollen, with a perfect little lake of sperm between their thighs. As soon as I saw the chocolate began to lose the effect on them, I had them taken out, and there lay the girls so beat that they could hardly move hand or foot. I myself was not idle during their performance, for I had three times dissolved myself in the Nubian slave. I spent the night in her arms, arising in the morning with the intention of husbanding myself for a couple of days, so as to be able to do justice to the maidenhead of Ibzaidu, which I intended sacrificing to my amorous and fierce desires. Chapter 7 On the evening of the second day after I made grand preparations for the event about to be celebrated, I had an elegant supper served such as would have tempted old Epicurus himself. All the inmates of the Seraglio were at the table, and I plied them so well with wine, that not one except Ibzaidu arose from it sober. When I gave the signal for retiring to the bedchamber, they reeled and staggered about like so many drunken sailors. Arrived at the bedchamber, we all stripped to the skin and catching Ibzaidu in my arms, I carried her to the state bed, and threw her down on it, and being somewhat fearful of my powers. As I had been sucked nearly dry by the Nubian, I called for and drank a cup of my magic chocolate, which I knew would enable me to go through the axe like a conqueror. I gave the word and all the girls came round the bed, with their instruments playing, and sang a beautiful psalm which I had composed for the occasion. I gave the word and getting on the bed fixed my victim in the best position, got between her thighs and gave him. A bunch of switches to one of the girls I directed her to lash my backside with them so as to smart much. I took hold of my battering ram and strove to force an entrance. The head is in. The soft flesh yields to my fierce thrusts. I drive in. She screams with pain, but I heed it not. It is music to my ears. It tells me that I am about to arrive at the seat of bliss. I shove and thrust harder. Everything gives way to me. The lashing on my buttocks gives me double force and one fierce lunge sends it into the furthest extremity of her grotto. And at the same moment, I oiled the mangled tender flesh of her dear little bleeding, slit with such a stream of burning sperm as never woman sucked from man before. I thought my very prick and stones were dissolving in pearly liquid. After resting myself on her bosom for a few moments, I found that my battering ram was prepared for another assault, and I fiercely drove him into the breach. Three times before I got off, did I spend the juice of my body into her, without calling from her any return. She lay and moaned in her agony and pain. And on looking, I saw that I had terribly battered, and bruised the entrance of the seat of pleasure. I raised her up and had her put into a warm bath, and after drying her, I again put her to bed. After giving her some wine and taking some myself, I found that again I was in trim for another bout. With a spring I placed myself between her thighs. I entered her, not without a good deal of hard work. God of voluptuous love, what a heat reigned through her body. How lusciously did the sweet flesh clasp around my rod. A few thrusts and a few moves in an hour awaken her to a sense of pleasure. She moves up to me. She catches the fever that runs through me. Quicker, quicker she heaves up to me to meet my fierce lunches as I drive my foaming steed through her gap into the rich pasturage. She clasps me in her arms and throws her snowy thighs around my back. The bounces of her bottom fairly spring me off her. I feel she is coming. Ah, my God, she comes, she spends. The sperm comes from her in a shower. I, too, I again, I spend. It runs for me. Pray, God. It's too much. I die. Ow. And then I breathe my spirit away in a sigh, soft and gentle as a zephyr. My God, how voluptuous, how luscious was the beautiful Circassian. What warmth. With what fire. What energy did she meet all my efforts at procuring and dispensing pleasure. How lusciously did she squeeze me when in her. How plentifully did she let down the milk when the agony of pleasure seized her. We swam in a perfect sea of voluptuousness totally indescribable. Man cannot imagine. Pen cannot describe it. It was an intoxication of delight pleasure 
wrought up to agony, bliss inexpressible, more exquisitely delicious than that enjoyed by the hours of paradise, when in the arms of true Mohammedans, or that enjoyed by the spirits of the Elysian fields. To be continued, my grandmother's tale or May's account of her introduction to the art of love. From an unsophisticated manuscript found amongst the old lady's papers after her death, supposed to have been written about A.D. 1797. Chapter 4. Kate's narrative, continued the voyage Captain Lemberg and his niece. Hilda, dotting I. On the next occasion that May and her friend, Kate, were snugly stretched in bed, their arms fondly circling one another, and their hands tenderly plucking, the hair of each other's cunt. They soon grew so excited that she, throwing off everything, and the May reversing her position, lay over her friend and Gama hoached her most lovingly. Kate's tongue returning those fiery kisses of love with such interest that in a few minutes both were dissolved in a balmy emission. As soon as they were recovered a little and more composed, May said softly now, Dear Katie, proceed with your most interesting and exciting narrative. Well, when the time came, Papa brought me word to board the board, and after taking a most affectionate leave, he left me in charge of Captain Lemberg and his niece, Hilda. I was delighted to have her as a companion, for she was a merry, sprightly girl, and had made the voyage before. I had a little cabin adjoining hers, and opening on the salon. Nina was accommodated in the forepart of the ship, and was with a soldier's wife, a Mrs. S., and her sister Jenny. The vessel sailed early the next morning, and soon began to pitch and roll. The motion made us all sick. Nina was not able to leave her berth, and Hilda was nearly as bad. As for me, I never felt so bad in my life. About noon, the captain came into my cabin. I was lying down, only half-dressed and so sick that I did not care what was done to me. He said he was so sorry to find me so bad, but that if I would allow him to prescribe for me, he knew what would be sure to give relief. I said I would take anything he gave for I could not be worse than I was. He went out and soon returned with a tumbler of hot brandy and water. When I tasted it I said I cannot take this. It is too strong. All the better, my dear. It will do you more good. Come. Trust an old sailor. He put his arm round me and supported me while I gulped it down. Then he laid me back. It relieved the sickness, but threw me into a stupor. Before he left, he arranged my dress, and was very particular in setting it over my breast. Seeing I did not move, he passed his hand down over my stomach and pressed the mound at the bottom of my belly. Then he lightly kissed my forehead and went away. After a short time he returned, and finding me tossing about, but still in a state of stupor, he softly rubbed my stomach over my chemise, bringing his hand lower and lower, until he reached my cunt. Finding I did not mind him, he passed his hands up under my chemise, and boldly grasped my cunt. Oh, oh, oh Captain, I muttered, but could say no more. He pushed his hand between my thighs so as to feel the lips. He separated my thighs more, and felt them round about. Indeed, I don't know what he did. I was so stupefied. But I think he kissed it. In the evening, the sea calmed down, and I felt much better. He brought me a cup of coffee, which roused me up. He supported me with his arm while I was drinking, and then stooped to kiss me. I could not refuse him my lips. He's so kind. In a few days, I recovered from the effects of my sickness, and I began to feel at home in the vessel. Hilda brought me about and showed me everything. At the opposite side of the salon, the captain and the mate, Mr. Carl, occupied cabins corresponding to ours. Mr. Carl was a young man, good-looking and very agreeable. He was most attentive to Hilda and did not mind me much. But the captain was unremitting in his attentions to me. He got into the way of kissing me every night and used to squeeze my bottom when I passed near him. With Hilda, he was still more free but then she was his niece. In arranging my cabin, I found there was a sliding panel between Hilda's cabin and mine, which, when open, gave a full view either way. The captain generally kept the first night watch and remained on deck until after twelve. Then he would come down, take grog, and turn in. One night I was awakened by talking in Hilda's cabin, and I heard her say now, 
Behave yourself. I won't have you coming this way into my cabin at night. Ah, stop. I will call out. If you don't, let me alone. Heal thee, my pet. Let me, just a moment. No, you mustn't put your hand there. You mustn't raise my shift. You mustn't open my thighs. Oh, uncle. Do take it away. You are a terrible man. Why don't you go and fuck him? What would Carl say if he knew you did this to me? I got up, opened the panel, and peeped in. Her lamp was burning. I could see that he had drawn her to the edge of her berth, over which her naked bottom projected. Her legs were raised up and resting on his arms, while his large prick was darting in and out of her open cunt. I could see that she was beginning to enjoy it, for she wriggled her bum and threw her arms around his neck. Fress it, dear uncle. You make me like it in spite of myself. At every thrust he banged against her rump, crying there, There, you have it all. Before he left, I heard him talking of me and telling her to show me some books and pictures. The next day, coming suddenly out of my cabin, I caught her sitting in Mr. Carl's lap. Dada. He had his arm round her and was kissing her. They started and blushed when they saw me, and he got up and went on deck. She then told me that they were engaged to be married at the end of the voyage. And do you know, Kate, though I am fond of Carl, I dread it. Why? I asked. Oh, don't you know what a man does to a woman when they are in bed together? No, I said, looking very innocent. What? Oh, he must know that he has something that he puts into her stomach. What is it like, Hilda? Tell me about it. Aang called a prick, eight or nine inches long with a purple head. It hangs between his legs, and when it stiffens, he can push it into our slits, which are called cunts, you know. Then, after working it in and out, something comes out and it makes the child. How queer. Did you ever see it, Hilda? I have often seen pictures of it. Uncle has curious books with pictures that tell all about it. Would you like to see it? I was looking over his books and I came upon a secret drawer which was open, and there I found them come. I'll show them to you. We went into his cabin, and on opening the drawer saw a number of books full of colored pictures of the most lascivious evolutions of love. There were naked men and naked women with their cuts and pricks and bottoms displayed in every kind of attitude and position. They were frigging, sucking, and f in all varied positions. There were some large French prints also. One depicted a beautiful girl with her bare shoulders and legs, seated on the lap of her lover. 